Triathlon is the top story in the Straits Times here in Singapore. And wherever you are, it is hard to deny that the headlines around the PTO are not getting bigger and bolder. And so here we go once again with a new weekend on a new continent, in a new country, with new rivalries to ignite and new champions to crown. And this is normally the point where we set out our stall and we hype all that is to come and we laud the contenders and we really do begin to stoke the competitive tensions. And then every so often you just have to stop. Take a breath and recognize that it is the pictures that need to do the talking. Have a look at this as we say welcome to the PTO's newest playground of the gods. And in the shadow of the fabulous Marina Bay Sands, I can tell you the stage is set, the athletes are ready. And of course, we've been talking about the playground of the gods and the goddesses. I can tell you the weather gods are out and about today. It's going to be fascinating to see what cards they play over the next few hours. And talking of those who operate at the rarefied heights, it's a very warm welcome to Craig Alexander, a three-time Ironman world champion. It's lovely to see you bring your supporters club here as well, your Singapore delegate. Welcome to you. We've got a cheer. We've got a cheer for our star uh, here in Singapore. Let's start with exactly that. We are here in sensational setting. What have you made of the way the PTO have stuck their flag in the sand with the Asian Open? Well, Alex, firstly, it's amazing to be here in this iconic city with this backdrop. And very soon we get front row seats to 20 of the best triathletes in the world battling it out on this spectacular course in Singapore. And I love what the PTO have done. We get to see the best athletes racing more often. And as a fan of the sport, what's not to love? Absolutely. You mentioned 20 of the best, but we've also got three of the top four and that perhaps is where the spotlight shines brightest and most interestingly today depending on what happens we have got the PTO world number one ranking up for grabs how do you call it yeah well we've got our European Open rematch with Anna Haug, Ashley Gentle and Lucy Charles Barclay I think deservedly they uh, are outright favorites for this race on paper but it's a different day different conditions different time of year and an interesting subplot, more skin in the game for those women because the number one world ranking is up for grabs and if Anna Haug is able to win here today, she will assume her spot at the top of the rankings. We shall see. Lots to look forward to. And of course, these are now high stakes races. Let's show you who has been busiest at the bank, cashing their PTO checks. <laughs> Well, big bucks up for grabs and big dollars to take home. Let's have a look at the women's start line. And as we mentioned, three of the top four, Ash Gentle, Anna Haug and Lucy Charles Barkley. Keep an eye on Chelsea Zadaro, Jocelyn McCauley and Sarah True, all flying the stars and stripes. And rounding out the top ten is Sara Pellas Sala, who will be hoping for a fast swim to force herself up into contention. A bit vulgar to talk about money, but let's do it anyway, because you have been there and you've done it. But when you see what is now up for grabs, how much would that make you reconsider your, your calendar as an athlete? Well, I think the money leads to the best fields and these athletes are all competitors. They want to race the best. And I think that's what the PTO has done so well in their short history. They bring the best together more often and what's not to love. I mean, the athletes are professional athletes and I think they're getting paid what they rightly deserve. This is one of the toughest sports in the world and I love to see it.
And the fact, I mean, it's 2023, women's sport is absolutely accelerating across the board. The fact that we've got Ashley Gentle as the top earner on the tour as well is just fantastic to see. It's amazing. You know, I think the PTO money rankings, they pull the men and women together. And not surprisingly, Ashley's sitting atop the rankings. She's probably been the most consistent over the last two years. And she'll be looking to add to her money tally today. She will indeed. Right, let's get out and about on the course. Jack Kelly is on the pontoon. We'll hear from him in just a moment. But first of all, Rachel Stringer is in transition and gave us this update a little bit earlier. So transition is open and I thought this would be the perfect time to try and grab a couple of words with some of the women, conscious though that the start of the race is getting very close. And there's one woman I want to speak to, it's Els Visser. It's because she has a brilliant story. She came to Singapore for the first time in 2016. It was her first time being in Singapore then. You didn't know anything about triathlon when you first visited this country. Tell me why you first came to Singapore. It wasn't for this very sport, was it? Yeah, it was for a medical congress. I was doing a PhD in surgery by then. Um, I studied medicine in the Netherlands and uh, we came here for a medical congress. And uh, yeah, I was here to present my research. Yeah, and at the end of the day, we... Uh I don't see the building over here, but we went to like the big ship to like uh, club and party. So completely different. Well, good luck today. It's now about triathlon. She's a doctor. She's very smart. Fast forward seven years and she now finds herself as one of a 20 elite women in this field. So they're all just getting themselves ready. Let's come up here and see who else we can find. I want to speak to Jocelyn McCauley, who's over here. I'm going to try. She's with the bike mechanics. Jocelyn, can I have a quick word? I want a quick word about the fact that it didn't go too well last time, but we're moving on swiftly. Moving on. Have you got anything written on your hand this time? Yes, you do. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. So I always write believe on my hand. So there's believe on this hand and then my awesome family that makes me tear up every time I think about them. Scott, Emmy and Sydney, who we call Squid. So, and then on this one, it's be brave. So love that. One of five mothers in the field as well, doing it for her children. Oh, Jocelyn, awesome. I really hope it goes well this time. Good luck. Thank you. Right, let's quickly come over here as well. See who else. Fenella as well. I'm rooting for the GB athletes. One in London just last week, so she's in form. Annie Haug, she could become PTO number one if she got on the top step. Annie, quick word, how are you feeling going into this one? Oh yeah, nervous like always before a race. I mean, you prepare as best as you can and then you hope to deliver. So it's always this kind of excitement and nervosity. And I mean, I think everyone feels the same. Everyone's feeling a little bit nervous and the, the run course is fast. She's a great runner, as is Ashley Gentle, current queen of the PTO. PTO number one, Ash, your last race of the season. Then you get to go home, see your family. You're going to go on a high? Oh, I hope so. Yeah, I guess I'm going to leave it all out there knowing I'm, yeah. A finish of the, I guess, international season for me. So, um, yeah, hope to end on a good one. The race is on with possibly that woman next year, and maybe Lucy Child Barkley as well. Ash said pre race, said there's one big effort and seven and a half hours between here, Singapore, her final race of the season, and getting home to see her family. But the question is, will she finish the season as PTO number one? The first really big important thing about this swim is that it's a non-wetsuit swim. So it does favour the stronger fit swimmers, which coincidentally, this is probably the strongest swim field we've had in a women's PTO race this year. It starts over here on the right hand side of the pontoon. We call this the favourite zone. So we've got Ash Gentle, Ani Haug, Lucy Charles Barclay, Fenella Langridge and Chelsea Sodaro. So the big favourites expected to sort of uh, contend at the pointy end of this race are all here on the right hand side of the pontoon. Lucy Charles Barclay standing in, in slot three known as the strongest swimmer in triathlon. We then come through to the middle, where it's sort of divided into two sections. We've got a right-hand section in the middle and a left-hand section in the middle. They've both also got really strong swimmers there. The right hand is Sarah perez Sala, and the left hand is Ali Salthouse. So both of those girls will be looking to swim straight line and then eventually duck right to see if they can get Lucy Charles' feet. So very important for Lucy to get out hard, to break Annie and Ash, and to make sure that those middle two can't get near her. Then we come down to the, the left-hand side, and. This is probably the most interesting. Lottie Wilms, the second strongest swimmer in the field, she starts on the far left. City, 
a financial hub, and it is likely to be one of the most prestigious stops on the PTO tour as it grows. And some of the same the Civic District, and of course, Marina Bay Sands. The official mascot of Singapore is Mer Lion, half fish, half lion. And here's John Gooden with the course map. Strike skyline. We will have two laps in the water, then we'll have eight laps, eight times 10 kilometers through Singapore. There's about 600 meters of elevation. They have a beautiful view of the water. And then it's on to the run course. By the way, we have sectors this time, two on the bike, three on the run, 18 kilometers for that run course, three laps of six kilometers through the gardens, past landmarks, and then a lot of age groups and sports fans are collecting around Marina Bay, so it's likely to get lively. Well done, John. I told you those weather gods were out and about. They're pouring water into our electrics. But Craig, a few final thoughts before we, before get, we get underway, underway here. Away. Just talk us through conditions, first of all. Hot but extremely humid. How's that going to change things? Yeah, the heat and humidity is definitely going to impact this race. I want to say the athlete or athletes who manage themselves the best in these conditions those athletes who are hyper vigilant with their pacing and their nutrition, they're the athletes we're going to see on the podium. Fantastic. We've got a bit of a crowd building around us as well as some of the first athletes make their way down onto the pontoon. These moments from your perspective, were you cool, calm and collected or were you getting a little angsty and just desperate to get on with it? I think you're in a little bit of turmoil, but the good news is the pain's almost over. They're about to fire the gun and set them all free. And it's almost over. Surely it's about yeah. to just begin. Uh, I think these athletes live for the racing. Um, these days before, there's a lot of talk. The talk is about to stop, and they're all racers, they're competitors, and of course, it's a different kind of pain, but the athletes, they just can't wait to get off this pontoon. And we love to bring in the mystery pro here who likes to stoke the fires and get everybody talking. The mystery pro has gone one, Ashley Gentle, two, Anna Haug, three, Lucy Charles Barkley. Your expression says it all. Would you roll that or stick? No, I'm going to stick. You're going to stick with that. Are we, we're in for an epic race, though. It's going to be a great race. We have a lot of the best triathletes in the world here. Amazing course, great conditions, and I can't wait to watch. You've set it up beautifully. Craig, thank you very much indeed. We are good to go, and let's hand you down to your starter. World number three, Pito ranked fourth from Great Britain, Lucy Charles Barclay. World number two, Pito ranked third from Germany, Anne Haag. Wearing number one, the PTO ranked number one from Australia, Ashley Gentle. Athletes, you are now in the hands of the starter. On your marks. We are racing in the Lion City, 100 kilometers of top swim bike run 
here in Singapore for the PTO Asia Open. $600,000 is the prize pool today, as well as the lucrative PTO points. On the course, we have three of the top five ranked women in the world, but history tells us a new star will likely be born today, joining the top names in the sport. We are underway in the swim, which is two kilometers in the gorgeous Marina Bay, consisting two loops and a short LZ exit, where the athletes will host, hoist themselves out of the water, dart across the mat for a few meters before diving back in. You will notice some colored swim caps which will help us identify various athletes. More about that in a moment. My name is John Good and I'm delighted to be in commentary by top podcaster Jack Kelly. Jack, how good is this? A second PTO Tour race twice within two weeks, inviting the very best to race. It's amazing, John, and this swim course is amazing. S Singapore in general is just an amazing town. This swim start has sort of gone exactly how we expected it to a degree. We started with those four groups that we talked about. We had the favourites out on the right, and then we had two groups in the middle and one out on the left. And you saw on that overhead picture, that was exactly what we could see. We could sort of see four points. But what's happened, and I think what we all expected to happen, is Lucy Charles was just able to take out a lot faster than everyone else. Her plan before the race, I was standing on the pontoon, she was speaking about it. She chose the right-hand side so that she was next to Annie Haug and Ash Gentle, and so she was away from the other strong swimmers. So her goal early was to break Ash and Anne straight away, so take out fast so that they couldn't get her feet, which objective one, done, and that's a big objective because she would see Ash Gentle and Anne Haug as the two big favourites uh, and, and the two strongest challenges. So just to pause you there for a second jack because we need to highlight the swim caps that you should keep an eye on and those of you looking at the picture right now will have noticed the silver cap of lucy charles barkley absolutely knew that she was going to be leading out from the front i think jack she's always out first out of the water in pretty much every race that she enters but ashley gentle is in the orange Annie Haug is in the yellow. Of course, that trio there it is a, almost a rematch of what happened at the PTO European Tour back in Ibiza in May. Big names as well with Chelsea Sodaro, Fenella Langridge. We saw Sara Perez Sala on the toes of Lucy Charles Barkley as well. Lottie Wilms, a strong swimmer from the Netherlands wearing purple. This is a very strong field for the swim portion of this race, isn't it, Jack? It is. It's funny how Lucy Charles can make the, the strongest swimmers in the world look like they're not swimming that fast. So Fenella Langridge, Lottie Worms, Al uh, Ali Salthouse, they're all some of the, the strongest swimmers in female PTO racing. Lucy Charles' takeout speed is just on another level. Um, I, I spoke to Ash Gentle before the race and she was quite worried about Lucy Charles' takeout speed because she just said, hey, if Lucy decides to go early, none of us can keep up. So I, I guess I have to work with Arne early in the swim to try. But you can see that literally within 150 metres of the swim, where you expect it to still sort of be together. Nah, Lucy Charles, she's off on her own. S Sarah perez Sellers managed to grab her feet a little bit, but there's already, by the looks of it, uh, about a 20 metre gap to third, which is exactly how Lucy Charles needs to play this race today. And Jack, can you talk about going out super hot in the water when the water temperature is, is knocking on 29 degrees as well? That's just so, it's so hot for a swim. We get so used to water temperatures of around 20 degrees, 22 degrees, and 28. I touched the water. It was, it was boiling like hot. Yeah, it was <laughs> boiling hot. It suits the strong swimmers, right? So tough conditions suit whoever's best at the thing. Tough conditions on the bike suit the strongest bikers. Tough conditions on the run suit the strongest runners. Tough conditions in the swim, just the same as that. They suit the strongest swimmers. So expect to see all of these athletes in the caps who we've sort of identified as some of the strongest swimmers in the, in the field. Expect to see them have, have good swims. Also, expect to see big gaps open up in the second lap of the swim because when it gets hot, you can sort of tolerate it for about 200 to 400 metres and then it starts getting hotter and hotter. They'll get out of the Aussie exit and they'll go, oh, I'm hot. Heart rate will be super high, like 190 beat, beats per minute. And then it's really hard for weaker swimmers to then pick up again on the second lap. But the strong swimmers will flourish there. So just a, a note about the course. On this first lap, you'll see all of the ladies keeping the yellow boys on their right-hand shoulder. Actually, that will change on the second loop where they'll be on the left-hand shoulder. But they need to keep to the right as we see Lucy Charles Barkley out there ahead with Sara Perez Sala and also 
just a, a chasing group. So three in that pack. Ashley Gentle has proved her top class consistency over the 100 kilometer distance, but she's extremely motivated to climb on the top podium step here in Singapore, and she's willing to go hard early to make that happen. I guess um, there's quite a few girls here that are, are pretty good swimmers, and I'd, I'd love to be able to get on their feet. There's someone like Fenella Langridge, Sarah True, um, Sarah Perez Sala. There's, there's quite a lot of them that, um, yeah, if I was able to come out in a group with them, it would set me up really well. I think that the water will be really warm as well, so there's a point in time where, you know, you really have to fight for feet, and I'll be doing that. Then also, um, you know, if it's the pace is really hot and you find yourself in certain situations, you have to make those decisions as well, because I think you can overswim here, um, which you will you know, might come back to bite you at the start of the bike. So it's all always about making those decisions on the go. But to be honest, I think that, yeah, I'll be going as fast as I can in the water to see where I'm at. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully coming out comfortably enough in a group where I can still really ride strong at the start of the bike and hopefully all the way through. I've been good at coming second this year, so, um, you know, Obviously, there's a side of that where I'm super proud of the results. I, I can't complain, but there's also another part of me that's like, oh, I would love to be able to win one of these and definitely realise that this is my last opportunity this year to do so. So, yeah, I'm very motivated, extremely motivated, and I'm just super happy to be here in Singapore. So we have more company in the commentary position right now. Delighted to be joined by five-time world champion Craig Crowey Alexander. How are you, sir? John, I'm very good. How are you? Well, you do, you're not even heavy breathing. I know how far away you just did that hit to open the show was. So, uh, of course, maintaining your fitness over all of these years, clearly. Well, it's all the running I've been doing with you this week. <laughs> Dragging me around. Thank you for that. Yes, I've reached new, new limits and goals. We, uh, we saw Ashley Gentle there going out, willing to go out fast and hard here in Singapore. A lot on the line for her with her final race of the season. It's, it's been a pretty, pretty good stint for her in the PTO races at 100 kilometres. Yeah, well, Ashley's made no secret of the fact that she targets these races specifically. She's probably been the most consistent on the PTO tour for the last two years. And, you know, Ash is heading home after this race. So I think she's going to be emotionally very happy and in a good place to empty the tank today this is her last big race of the year so yeah we're expecting big things from ash but we always do she's so consistent yeah i actually overheard her talking uh, uh, during an interview earlier this week and she said i'm willing to have you scrape me off the tarmac here in singapore because her schedule ends here so it's it's all to play for for ashley gentle who has been dubbed the queen of the 100 kilometer distance always puts in a fantastic performance and these conditions suit her as well don't they these hot humid conditions yeah well most of the athletes try and acclimate or prepare to race in these conditions but ash grew up in brisbane in australia so she's no stranger to the heat and humidity for sure um, these conditions will not be a i mean they're going to be a challenge for everyone but she is very used to racing in these conditions and i think very experienced so um, Across the board, this is one of the big points of difference, I feel, with Milwaukee two weeks ago and also with the European Open, just the heat and humidity here. Um, it's going to be a challenge for the athletes and it's going to be interesting to see how they play it. And what about the, the strength of schedule for some of the athletes that are going you know, back to back to back with races multiple times? It's something fascinating for me, who's probably not a, a triathlon insider, to see the amount of volume and intensity that these athletes can put out frequently and, of course, we know that this 100 kilometer race is balls to the wall, if you like, from the moment the gun goes off and it's intense. And now these, a lot of these folk that are on this weekend will try to do that twice in a couple of weeks. Yeah, well, it's always a challenge how you recover. Obviously, it's a shorter turnaround for the athletes who raced at the US Open two weeks ago with the travel and the recovery, but they train for it. I think they, they prepare for it. Um, I almost feel as if it's as much a mental recovery that's required just to get up mentally and emotionally to be able to push yourself in these races. But yeah, we're looking at some of the best endurance athletes at the world and they're very well versed at short turnarounds. And um, whilst it's a challenge, it's, it's a challenge that they're very familiar with. Jack, we see pictures here of Lucy Charles Barkley closely followed by Sarah Perez-Sala. Did you expect 
Lucy to have someone hanging on to her at this stage of the race? And do you think that that's going to continue to be the case? I mean, I guess if there was anyone who was going to do it, Sarah perez Sala was in a great position to do so. As we know, she was a, an Olympic swimmer. So it often gets... Um, there's a lot of hyperbole around how good a swimmer Lucy Charles Barclay is, and it's probably deserved, to be fair. She's probably the best swimmer swim we've ever seen. So, you know, you don't expect to see many people on her feet, but if there was someone who was going to do it, an ex-Olympic swimmer in Sarah perez Sala is probably the person who it's going to be. And how much does this slightly longer swim over the 100 kilometer distance favor athletes like Lucy Charles Barkley who will lead from the gun and, and obviously try and get as big a gap as possible going through T1 and into T2. I think this distance suits Lucy Charles Barclay perfectly, but I also think this course in Singapore suits Lucy Charles Barclay. The reason why is because it's a hot swim. So the hotter the swim, um, not a wetsuit swim. That means that it favours her as a strong swimmer. But the bike's also really hard. So they're going to get out of this swim. There's going to be a lot of tired, cooked athletes with really high heart rates coming out of this swim because they're going fast, the water's hot, and it's not wetsuit straight onto a very, very hard bike course, which might allow Lucy to build her gap. So her big goal is to build her gap to Annie Haug and Ash Gentle all day. And when you look at the card on the screen there, that's Lucy's comparative stats to the rest of the field today. So there's no weakness there, is there, Crowey? She is the fastest swimmer, but she can back it up on the bike and she's got the legs to go as well. Yeah, well, with these top women, they don't have any weaknesses. Um, some are comparatively stronger and have strengths in different disciplines. And of course, Lucy's a, an Olympic level swimmer. So... I, d I agree with Jack on this. It's a surprise to see Sarah there, I think, even though she went to the Olympic Games. What's interesting about the Aussie exit, I think, is the second lap, the better swimmers, I think, fare better in that second lap. Getting out of the water and getting back in, they tend to hold pace a little better. So we're starting to see some separation already, and I think that's going to only increase on the second lap. So it'll be interesting to see where Ash and Anne are coming out um, at this Aussie exit that's coming up. And you made a, a really good observation when we were out doing a little course recce these Aussie exits aren't easy either are they how challenging is it going to be to hoist yourself out of the water here yeah well typically they have a, a ramp that's a little deeper um, so yeah it's just another layer of challenge for the athletes but they've been down here doing their practice swims they know exactly what they're in for I think they're going to launch and you'll see them almost do like a lateral chin up to get up there I think they might have smoothed it out since we last looked at it. I think I might have made something out of nothing there, gents. But we see Sarah Prosella take the lead with that short sprint. And now Lucy Charles Barkley becomes the chaser. Yeah, I guess that's foreign territory for Lucy. I haven't seen too many triathlon swims where she's not in the lead. So we just had, we just had Rebecca Clark come out of the word third, third there. Rebecca Clark had a really hard starting position, so now she's sort of got, got herself stuck in no man's land a little bit. As yeah. we see Lottie Wilms come through and Fenella Langridge, some of the better swimmers in this field. And there's Ash Gentle right there. So she's about 30 seconds, 35 seconds down at this Aussie exit. Annie Haug right with her, Sarah True as well, Radka Karlafelt. So this is a little power group, Imogen Simmons. I think they'll be trying to keep this pack together I mean there's safety in numbers when you swim in a group you save a lot of energy by sitting on the hip or the feet so these girls at the back of this group will be desperate of course Annie Haug is I'm sure going to feature as a, a major part of this race where she's at right now 44 seconds down is that a good time for her Jack it's actually a perfect position for Chelsea Sodaro, Annie Haug and Ashley Gentle because they're near each other. So that means they can work together and try and minimise the gap to Lucy Charles Barclay, both on the swim in this second lap, but also early in the bike. I actually don't think Lucy will mind having a, a pair of feet to sit on, um, to have some company. I mean, she's so used to just individual time trialling in her races, and that will still be her plan. I don't think this will be um, off-putting at all for her. I think she'll actually appreciate the rest. And it's, it's a, obviously a decent pace swim. And something me and you have been talking about all week, Crowy, is that you need to pace yourself on this course. So Lucy Charles Barclay, she loves to race aggressively. 
but she's going to rein herself in a little bit here, isn't she, today? Because it's just a course where there's going to be so many blow-ups on the run that you can't burn too many matches early. So like you said, she's going to love having Sarah Perez sail there on her feet to work with because she knows this pace is still a lot faster than what anyone behind is going to swim, and I get to conserve some energy. Yeah, I think the heat and humidity and... I mean, one, one thing that we've talked about is the water temperature. Um, this water is a lot hotter. Gents, what a wonderful backdrop we have for the race today here in Singapore. Right there, you see the Art Science Museum, a lotus plant inspired, the welcoming hand of Singapore. And then behind that a little further, Jack Kelly's favorite hangout spots the marina bay sands he's been looking to get up there in that top bar the boats across the the three towers there for a, a little a little night cap you haven't quite made it across there yet though jack have you not quite crowey keeps telling me apparently he's had a couple of very big nights up on top of that boat when he used to race here back in the early 2000s and apparently there's a 100 hundred dollar cocktail that you can buy up there that after the men's race on uh, on tomorrow night Crow's going to take us up there, shout it's me very, both. It's very kind of him, isn't it? Yeah. The Singapore, the Singapore yeah, Sling. Jack, <laughs> Jack, Jack, you, you need to learn to listen, mate. That's the Raffles Hotel. <laughs> the Singapore Sling. We're trying to educate this young man. But anyway, we'll have a commentator's debriefing. Let's get back to the race. I think one thing we haven't talked about is this water temperature. I think very rarely you race in water 27, 28, 29 degrees. And I think the athletes will really be mindful of that. It was certainly a lot of the chat at breakfast. Um, so they'll be pacing. I don't think they'll be going all out as we see Sarah and Lucy take that left-hand turn now and head over towards T2. Well, Crowey, I talked to Ashley Gentle on the pontoon before the swim start, and I was sort of asking her, like, what's your plan today? Uh, I assume you want to try and get onto Lucy's feet if you can. And she said, well, originally I thought that starting next to her, but then talking to Josh Amberger, her partner, last night, they sort of figured that might be the wrong tactical move. And instead, they should probably look to conserve, get into a working group that's where she can feel comfortable in the water, and then just keep playing that card all day. Keep playing that patient card. Let everyone else, you know, go off on the front and, and overexert themselves. It seemed like she learnt from Milwaukee where she rode a little bit too hard and then wasn't able to run to the best of her ability that, hey, for these races, everyone wants to win. There's big money. There's a lot of prestige on the line but maybe everyone's trying too hard too early to win. So sh we, we expect Ashley to sit back, stay within herself, be conservative, and make a really late charge deep into the race on the run. Yeah, and as we see this vision, Lucy seems to be just dropping off Sarah's feet a little bit here. Um, she wouldn't be quite used to, I guess, swimming on the feet in races because we haven't seen it happen too often at all. But yeah. typically, when you're the the lead athlete you're siding and, and the athlete on the feet is right on the feet to the point where they're touching the feet of the athlete in front and we just see that Lucy's just dropped back a body length here so that's interesting but to your point Jack I think talking about Ashley Gentle's tactics it's they are great tactics in this heat and humidity I think there's far less margin for error with pacing mistakes here you burn a match here or there too many and it does come back to bite you later in the race And there's a beautiful scenic of wonderful Singapore, the Mer Lion, the emblem, iconic emblem here in Singapore, the Botanical Gardens, a definite must see for visitors to Singapore. Very much enjoying our time here in this place that's like nowhere else on earth. As we get back to the race, Sarah Perez Sala out in front. She had a bad day in Tallinn in August, early August. She DNF'd, wasn't in shape. The race went away from her. She did what she could, but she really did have an eye on this race here in Singapore. She has said she's had some really good training, but it hasn't translated into race results in 2023. More volume just hasn't really turned itself into better results, Crowey. But it's looking like she's having a good start to the day here. Yeah, she's got a beautifully relaxed swim stroke. Looks very efficient, and she's certainly leading the way. It's very early stages of this race, but she couldn't be in a better position. I think this, she set herself up nicely. I'm still expecting Lucy to charge off the front on the bike. I think that will be the card that she wants to play. 
But Sarah has really got herself into a great position as we just take a look at a stroke. It's so relaxed, very long. And she comes from that swimming background, Olympic swimmer, Athens in 2004, and you can just see the pedigree. I think the thing with Lucy Charles Barclay is she's such a competitor, not only in the swim, but across her, her whole triathlon um, pedigree, that she's not going to let a gap of four to five metres just extend like that. Like, really, she wants to be right on the feet. And the fact she's sort of having to fight for um, Perez Salah's feet does mean that the pace is very hot. Like, we know Lucy's being conservative, most likely, and, and really likes this position. But I think Sarah Perez Sala has actually picked up the pace on this second lap, and Lucy is finding herself have to really fight for the feet. Ultimately, this doesn't just help Sarah Perez Sala and put her in a, a good position. This is such a decisive moment for Lucy Charles' race, and a, a great thing for a race, Crowy. But what does it do to the dynamics for the rest of the field, then? Well, it doesn't really change the dynamic for them. They have to do what they can do. Okay. And when we get a wider shot, we'll see what's happening to that second group. But hopefully it'll be Beck Clark or Lottie Wilms to the front of that group. You want the best swimmers on the front of the group. And if some of the other women are able to tuck in there, it's a good scenario for them as well. So I expect this gap to open up um, on the second lap that, that Sarah and Lucy are opening up here. But... Yeah, I tend to agree with Jack there. When, when you are the second swimmer, you want to be right on the feet. That's where the energy savings are. Um, if you're going to be second in line, you may as well reap the rewards and get those energy savings. So you want to, want to be right on the feet or right up on the hip. But Jack, this would be the first long distance race that Lucy is not leading out the swim into T1. I mean, it's not over yet, but... It'll be interesting to see whether Lucy just lets Sarah perez Seller uh, get into T1 first, like whether there's a little bit of a, hey, I'm the best swimmer in the field here. I'm going to get in front of you. But I think what she will do is sit back and, and let Sarah have that. And she'll be thinking big picture today. She'll be thinking, OK, have a look back over her right shoulder. How far back is my gap to Annie Haug, Ash Gentle, um, Chelsea Sodaro? And she'll just be wanting to play the smart game. OK, now I'm in a great position. I've got a friend and an ally here who can help me work early on the bike. Um, as we take a look at our Misty Pro predictions here, Ashley Gentle first, Annie Haug second. Third is Lucy Child Parkley. I think that looks just about right and is hold what on, most people are on, predicting. Jack, what on. do you think, Crowley? Cro well, is it Crowley? Are you the mystery pro, sir? How did you find out? Uh, well, we've been, I've been mining for that information for about a year now. No, I'm not that popular. I'm not as popular <laughs> as the mystery pro. I, um, I don't mind those predictions, though. I mean, I think on paper, those three are the clear standouts. They're the favourites based on recent form. But as we always say, recent form... It's a great guy, but it only tells part of the picture. This is a different race um, to what we saw back at the European Open in Ibiza. I think different conditions, and that's why we run the races, um, so we can see how it, it will unfold. And I, and I just think that whilst Lucy's not leading the swim, there's no need to hit the panic stations just yet. I think she's, she's on the feet of Sarah. The pace is obviously still fairly robust, and um, she's in a great position. We are just getting word, Crowy, that... Lucy Charles' percentage of maximum heart rate is quite a little bit lower, uh, quite a lot lower than everyone else in the field, which speaks to a point you made and I made earlier about the water temperature being hotter makes the stronger swimmers work a little bit easier. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's going to be all about managing your effort on course, pacing, your core body temperature. As we see those gaps really open up there as we get the long shot, I'm presuming that's Rebecca Clark in third still. And this is, a, this is a great scenario for Sarah and Lucy. I mean, Sarah's kept the gas right on here on this swim. And if those heart rate percentages we're seeing are correct, that means that Lucy's really in what sports scientists would call zone three. So it's just more of a tempo, high aerobic effort, nowhere near her maximum capacity swimming, which means her core body temperature would relatively be lower than the other athletes. Crowey, this is pretty insane what we're seeing here. This is a far bigger gap than I think any of us predicted. We were all predicting... 90 seconds, two minutes. This looks like the gap between Lucy Charles Barclay and Sarah Perez Seller is at least two and two minutes, if not two and a half to three minutes. Maybe even more than that. Way more than anyone expected, I think. Are you surprised? Look, the quality of swimmer that both those women are, um, I think around two minutes would be the mark that most people predicted, most experts. If it's more than that, it, it just it swings the pendulum slightly into their favour. I mean, 20 seconds more or less at this stage is, I don't think it's crucial. I think what's more important is 
at what capacity these athletes are working at and, and what's their body temperature like because there's not too many races on the global circuit where you swim in 28, 29 degree water. So I'm imagining Lucy's well within her capabilities here. Um, both these women have such efficient, beautiful swim strokes. Lucy looks powerful. Sarah looks a little more graceful and efficient. Um, and they've opened a big gap and that would be their plan. Mentally though, Crowe, Lucy Charles Barkley is not used to seeing anyone in front of her when she's in the water. Like, she races a lot. I mean, I know she's had a, a couple of nightmarish years. Men, what do you think that's doing to her? I, I can't imagine she thought that was the plan. Yeah, maybe not, but these athletes are so mentally robust, John. I mean, Lucy would be prepared for any eventuality in any scenario. Um, I think she would get an innate sense that the pace is still quick. So maybe she's secretly happy that someone else is doing the heavy lifting at okay. the start of the race. Yeah. So let's see. Let's see how, I mean, certain pacing patterns will unfold early in this bike. And if it's as we suspect that Lucy's well within herself, she'll, she'll get out and set a nice tempo early. So as we see Sara hit the pontoon here. So in they go into T1, Jack. And for once, Lucy Charles Barkley has a bit of company. She's not going to be solo as they get on the bike. Yeah, but this is amazing for her. I mean, in, in the US Open, we saw a perfect position for Ashley Gentle where she just set her race up perfectly. Today, Lucy Charles Barkley is the one in pole position. She was injured, but she's put in a big dedicated block towards this race that not many other athletes did. They've been busy racing. And we're seeing her play her cards exactly, exactly how she has to. She's going to see Sarah Perez-Sella with her and think, this is perfect. The, the gap is massive. They still can't see them near the rest of the field, near the exit of the swim there. I think what's happened is we had Arn Haug, um, Ashley Gentle, Chelsea Sodaro, and everyone else in the field all working together in a big group. That will slow them down because they're all on each other's hips. We've got Rebecca Clark coming in here in third. And keep in mind, her gap out of the ex Aussie exit out of lap one was only 12 seconds. So she was actually still relatively close to Lucy Charles and Sarah perez Sala here. But it looked like it was more about the minute mark there. So that says that Sarah perez Sala and Lucy Charles went hard. I think interestingly here, Sarah Perez-Seller did not wear a swim ski, yeah. and Lucy, Lucy Charles Barclay did, so that's going to cost her a, a few seconds in triathlon. Again, not super critical, but I just find it interesting that uh, Sarah chose not to wear the swim skin, and I think that's because of the water temperature. Well, they're both out, and they're on to the course as we see more of our athletes coming out of the water, and we'll look to take chase. Rebecca Clark, incidentally, she was she exited third out of the water at the PTO US Open as well after a, what she said was a pretty awful start to her swim. Again, very consistent performance from her through the swim leg. We've got this group that has everyone in it. It's a <laughs> massive swim group. We saw Lottie Wilms lead the charge. Um, Jocelyn McCauley was there. Chelsea Sodaro was there. Um, Ali Salthouse was there. This is a group of really strong swimmers that have just had what looks to me to be one minute 52 minutes put into them by Lucy Charles Barclay and Sarah Perez Sala. Imogen Simmons is the one who, who um, back ends the group there. This is quite an interesting dynamic now, Crowe, where we've got three really clearly defined groups. And that, that third group, that second and third group, they only sort of um, got their gaps to each other in the back end of that second lap. So we've got the front group with Sarah Perez Sala and Lucy Charles Barclay. And then we've got Beck Clark, who's going to fall back to this big group of swimmers. And then the favourites coming out now. Yeah, I actually think this is a great swim for Ashley Gentle. Ellie Salthouse, she's typically towards the front of the field. Fenella Langridge, we know, is a great swimmer. So, again, this is a good little power group. I think this is a, a nice scenario playing out for some of our pre-race favourites. Interestingly, I didn't see any help come no, out with this group. she didn't come out. She fell out of that group, yeah. from what I understand. That was where that, that third group broke up late in that swim. You saw it happen with about 500 metres to go in that second lap where Annie Howe just dropped off the back. So, I mean... Out of everyone in the field, she's probably the one who's had the worst swim for her race. Yeah, this is a great little group. We see Sarah True in that group as well. Um, so I, th I think we'll get pretty clear indication early on on what some of the pacing strategies are of these women. Um, with an eight-lap course and at different sectors, we will be able to closely monitor these sort of pacing patterns and strategies that develop. I don't think Annie will be too disappointed in being 30 seconds down. I think she can bridge up to this group on the bike. We have something very exciting uh, for the PTO Asian Open where we've broken down the bike and the run course into sectors. We will have 
two sectors to be showing you at some point today on the bike course. That's going to give us an idea of the pacing, how fast people are going through certain sectors. We'll be bringing those graphics to you as and when they are appropriate. As we see right now, we have Sara Perez Sala. So just a reminder, it is 80 kilometers and they will be doing eight 10 kilometer loops starting and finishing at Marina Bay. Now, this is the climb, is it not, Jack? It's a I can't remember exactly how long it is over the bridge, but it's about 600 meters of elevation. This bike course, everyone has got to Singapore and gone, oh, wow, <laughs> this is hard. It was sort of talked about as just a flat, easy bike course in the lead up. And then we all got here. Everyone went and did bus tours around the, the bike course, did a bit of riding on it and couldn't believe how hard it was. So the hill they're on right now is it's a big bridge that goes over the, the water they've just swam. On the way they're going up now, so out on the bike course, it's about 600 metres to a K long, and it's about 5% um, until they get to the downhill. The downhill is long, it's fast. They actually come back at the other way, and it's brutally steep. It's up to 10% gradient. So this is the hardest bike course we've ever had in a PTO race, and it's going to be probably the most defining moment of both the women's and the men's races. So expect big blow-ups, expect big gaps, expect fast riding, Crowey. Yeah, and again, I just think pacing and, and management of your body temperature is going to be important. Um, you're right that, I mean, they have to n negotiate this bridge 16 times, eight times each way. Um, it certainly felt a lot longer and steeper coming back towards transition. Um, but there's quite a bit of vertical gain in this ride, so that'll play into the pacing and, and the strategy here as we see Sarah Palasala off the front looking quite comfortable. Um, we'll get a shot of Lucy soon, so we'll see. I mean, I think it was expected that Sarah would have the quicker transition, not wearing a swim skin. Um, but I don't think this is a race-defining move just yet either. Chloe, can you talk about the flow of traffic as well? Because I've seen a few teams talking about how the way that the roads are set up here in Singapore is the same as it is in the UK and Australia, and the flow and how that might favour certain athletes. I know it's a small thing, but I think just in terms of when we're watching the race, it is different to when we go stateside and in Europe. Yeah, well, obviously in different parts of the world, you ride on different sides of the road, the right side or the left side, which is the right side, no pun intended. <laughs> um, so what we're seeing here in Singapore is the athletes are riding on the left-hand side of the road, but within that, they're actually on the right-hand side of the left-hand side of the road. Um, I don't think the athletes, these are seasoned professionals, they're technically very good on the bike. I think they're going to corner well. I don't think it's going to be too much of an issue. Um, you know, we're seeing one of the first technical sections here is our own had a little bit of trouble navigating there. There was some water on those road markings, which make it a little bit slippery. But she seemed to get through that unscathed. But yeah, I don't think the athletes will have too much trouble uh, with the predominantly right-hand turns. So more about that sector map then, Jack. If you can give us a, a few lines on this, because I know that you love your Formula One, and we are now using that blueprint here at the PTO. What are we looking at? I love this. So the sectors are going to tell us a couple of things. They're going to tell us who's riding f the fastest on the course and how is that evolving as the race goes. So when we have a faster sector, that's going to flash purple. Purple means fastest. So we can then tell, hey, are there people who are going to be coming from the back of the race and working through the race, like we saw at the US Open with Lucy Byron, for example, John. She would have been setting purple sectors yeah. all through the back half of the bike. This week, we're going to be able to see that. Yeah, I love that. So we're going to be able to follow what's happening a little more closely at the back of the race. Because, of course, we can't have every single motorcycle available in Singapore to help us cover the PTO race here. We are very much focused on the front runners. But those kind of times will allow us to communi communicate to you guys at home who might be marching towards the front packs. So we've got shots of Annie Haug here, John, and she really does look very isolated. Her race is now... It's interesting because she's going to have to try and work through the field. The bike course suits her because it's a bike course that suits climbers. We've never had, a, a, I don't think from my memory, we've ever had a course in triathlon in a, in a race to this scale, let alone just a PTO race, that has had a bike course that's favoured the, the, the strong climbers, not just the strong cyclists. So someone like Annie Haug, she's a very good climber. She spends a lot of her time in the German mountains, the Spanish mountains. She, she does a lot of climbing. We expect to see her gaining a lot of time on, on everyone up the climbs. and So it's maybe not the worst thing that she's, she's sort of found herself a little bit back in the field and isolated. Uh, if she had done that in Milwaukee, it would have been really tough, Crowey. But 
in, in, in here in Singapore, as we see her overtake Lottie Wilms, not known as maybe the strongest climber in the sport, for example. So that's sort of a perfect example of why this course maybe suits a bit of a different cyclist to what most traditional triathlon courses suit, Crowley. Yeah, there's definitely more vertical on this course. As we see, Anna just negotiate those corners really well. She's technically very, very good on the bike. Got through those sections. And, and as we mentioned before, there's a little bit of water on the road, some of those road markings. But she went around there. She seemed to carry her speed much better through those corners. And it seems like she's bridged that 20 or 30 seconds up to the tail end of that swim group that she came out behind. I think it's worth me saying at this point, it's a non-drafting race as well so the, the riders have to be 20 meters uh, between one another and we do have race ranger in play so you might see some flashing red lights for example that means that the rider will have to pass they have 45 seconds to do so no slotting in and on the screen now the transition times and annie haug is in top position there 53 seconds for her to organize her equipment and get out on the bike so we see Arnie Haug here. This is one of the climbs we talked about. You sort of can't quite tell on the screen how steep it is, although you, you actually can a little bit more than other climbs, which tells you if you can see on a TV screen that it's steep, it means in real life it's even steeper. <laughs> it's horrible. Look at Arnie Haug. She's not even thinking about being in her TT bars. You can see that she's like rocking back and forth. This is a proper climb. This, this The steepest pinch on this climb is actually 11%, which is... If you, if you watch the Tour de France, that's as steep as the mountains, like the steepest mountains on the Queen Mountain stages. It's really hard. We talked about Annie Haag being the, like a really good climber and this course suiting climbers. You can see she's gone past Lottie Wilms. And now look how, how like quickly she's eating into these gaps, Crowy. So these hills really do suit light climbers, strong climbers. Absolutely. And I think we saw her PTO bike ranking flash up before. She's number two on the bike rankings and she is just cutting a sway through this field. We saw her pass Vanilla Langridge there who's one of the better swimmers in the field and I want to say was third or fourth out of the water. So, so far this bike course is very much to Anna Haug's liking and I think it won't be too long till we see her on the front of this second group and then setting sail for the two off the front. I reckon something else to talk about, Crowy, is how hard a course like this is. So. We haven't talked about the temperature in Singapore yet, but this is probably the hottest race venue I've ever been to. It sort of can float anywhere between 28 and 35 degrees. The humidity is out of this world. Like, it's just so unbelievably humid. It's a really tight technical course. It's got such pinchy, punchy climbs. So what happens is when you climb, you sort of cool off a little bit. And then when you get to the top of the climb, it sort of hits you how hot you are, how high your heart rate is. and and it's just sort of doing that, you know, over 80 kilometers. It's going to be an incredibly hard bike course. And there is Lucy Charles Barkley on the TT bars with a Red Bull helmet, nice and aero, and a good turnover on a slightly easier part of the course. Yeah, she looks good. She looks smooth. Uh, I like her position on the bike. As we see her PTO individual discipline rankings come up on the screen there, she's got the third ranking on the bike. Um, she seems to be just holding that gap behind Sarah perez Sala there. I think she's out of the aero position now, so there is definitely much more climbing on this course than I think certainly that I anticipated. A lot of these athletes have been out here doing reconnaissance all week, so that this will not be surprising to them. But as you come back, up in these sorts of conditions when the speeds are at their lowest and you haven't got that convective cooling from the wind. This is when their core body temperature and their heart rate will go up. Um, on the downhills when you're on the flats and they're sitting at 40, 42 kilometers an hour and you get the wind, the breeze blowing over your skin, it's much more manageable. But these sorts of climbs where the effort is the highest and that convective cooling effect from the wind flow is the lowest. This is, these are the danger periods where your body temperature really spikes. There's sort of two things I'm looking at here, Crowy. We see two different climbing styles. This climb that they're on right now is it's one of those ones where you sort of could go either way. You could stay in your TT bars and grind up the hill, or you can get out of your TT bars and sort of do a more traditional climbing style. We saw that Sarah Perez Sala chose to stay in her TT bars up that whole hill. At home, it's about 5% gradient, this hill. So it is still actually very steep. I think what we saw is Lucy Charles, um, she sort of 
uh, ate into that gap there because she did choose to treat it like a climb, not like a traditional time trial portion of the course. And I think what we're going to find is as the course goes on and the girls do the, the women do that climb a few times, they're all going to start to choose to sit out of their TT bars because they're going to find that it's faster than staying in the TT bars. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. I think it just gives you your back and your position a little bit of a break as well and because the speeds are so low it, there's no real penalty for breaking arrow when you're going up those sorts of five six seven eight and ten percent gradients and i think it's just more manageable so i mean there's 16 climbs they've done two now there's 14 to go <laughs> we really can't undersell how hard this bike course is though i'm going to talk about it all day it's the hardest pto bike course by 10 times any other bike course we've seen on the PTO tour so far and we're sort of seeing it already it's just so hilly there's you're going to do this thing where you're going to climb you get a small reprieve up the top but your heart rate's at its absolute max and then you're on a really fast descent that takes you to another climb and it's just that all day the whole 80 kilometers yeah as we're heading back towards transition here we see the beautiful marina bay sands hotel and the art science museum this really is one of the best triathlon venues that I've ever seen. Um, and I think you make a great point, Jack. And one of the best things the athletes can do to sort of control that body temperature, stay hydrated, um, you know, in this sort of heat and humidity. And it seems obvious to say it, but it's so often we see athletes get it wrong. So you caught some nice shots there of Sarah Perez Sala and Lucy Charles Barkley getting ready through T1. They are very much out on the course now and leading this race. But they're still the chasing pack that are heading across the Benjamin Shears Bridge here that takes them back into the financial district in Marina Bay, where they'll be flowing through the transition area. Lots of triathlon history in Milwaukee a couple of weeks ago. Very much a newer experience here in Singapore. And Crowey's a big fan. Just an iconic skyline. And a wonderful place to just spend your time when you're counting down the hours before one of the biggest races of the season here in Singapore. I've seen lots of the athletes have been visiting some of these landmarks. Getting lots of snaps in as they prepare for big points and big prizes i think one of the interesting things that i'm looking for here um, and, and you've talked about it a lot jack in the last couple of days is just this relative gap of lucy to ashley and, and also to Anne, and, and what's happening there i mean those gaps we see Anne make another pass here over ellie salthouse who is coming off a great race two weeks ago in milwaukee so as they come through after lap one i think we'll get a really good gauge on sort of some of the pacing patterns that are starting to develop here it does look to me, Crowey, like Sarah Perez Sala and Lucy Charles Barclay are losing a bit of time to everyone. So we're seeing Beck Clark, who was that sort of no man's land position, come back to the field. Ashley Gentle has eaten time into these two. It looks to me to be about 20 seconds, but we will get a really good idea of that here when they come through T1. And it looks like Annie Hag is just riding through everyone. We just saw a ride through Ali Soldhouse, which is quite surprising that she caught up so much so soon into the bike, considering we saw Ali Soldhouse only two weeks ago at the front of the bike the whole day. Yeah, I think it's one of the interesting dynamics in a smaller field. Um, less athletes to fill gaps, to bridge gaps. Um, you know, a lot of that pacing and the heavy lifting falls to each athlete out here. So we saw it in the swim. Typically in smaller fields, bigger gaps tend to open in the swim and the bike. And, you know, it really suits the, the well-rounded athletes who are consistent across all three disciplines. And Anne has really erased that 20 or 30 second gap to the the chase swim group very, very quickly in, in 10 kilometers. Yeah, Anne Haug, Ashley Gentle, Imogen Simmons, all around the same kind of pace on the bike at the moment. We'll see how it unfolds as we get deeper into the bike. And of course, the electric run, I'm sure we're gonna be promised some fast, furious action when they take to the tarmac a little later. 
And I think we do have to talk about John and Crowey, the fact that Lucy Charles can't let this race come back. So she's had a foot injury. She broke her foot. Her run training was a little minimal. So that's why we're seeing her make the decision to go around and keep this pace hot. She can't afford to let Ani Haug, Ash Gentle, Chelsea Sodaro and the rest of the women come back to this front group because if she does... That makes this race incredibly difficult for her to win with minimal run training. So what we're going to see here is she's noticed, uh, like Lucy Charles has noticed the pace has dropped. I've got to go to the front and take responsibility of this race because, Crowe, if she doesn't take responsibility of this bike and set the pace, it's going to be a really hard day for her. Yeah, she, she is a champion athlete. We've seen that time and again. She doesn't leave things to chance. She really gets on the front foot and races the race that gives her the best chance. And... As you mentioned, her best chance is to have some sort of gap to Ashley and Anne, and preferably a sizable gap when they hit T2. So I think she maybe just took a lap there to, to settle in. She's come around Sarah perez Sala now, and she looks like she's trying to set her own tempo. Can I just commend her resilience as well, gents? Because she has had a hellish couple of years with her hip injury, which was career-threatening. And then to start getting back some form, and then she she did a she had a torsion fracture on her metatarsal from a race, and, but she was she was saying that she was so fit, Jack. She was in such a good position. She didn't want to lose that fitness, so she was in Lanzarote. She put the boot on and was still taking to the bike to obviously work on the aspects that she could uh, put some attention to. But the mental fortitude to keep on going. She really loves to compete. Yeah, but it's Lucy Charles Barclay, John. So. What you've got to understand about Lucy Charles Barclay is that she's probably the mentally toughest person I've ever met. She's just... Clearly. In, a, in, the, in the Like, this is a compliment. She's hard as nails. No one works harder than her. No one loves hard work more than her. If she gets injured, she gets so angry and she just finds any way to go and train because she just lives to train and she lives to hurt herself. And that's why she races the way she does. There's like this... There's this thing where... People's personalities often present this, themselves in the way they race, their racing style. Lucy is aggressive. She's hardworking. She's just got that absolute animal in her. And again, I mean that as the world's biggest compliment. And she just she shows that in races by going to the front, working hard. And she's, she would rather blow up than, you know, lose this race. She'll, she'll go to the front and she'll, she won't die trying. Um, Crowe, we've seen some sort of developments with the bike gaps. Ashley Gentle's pushed up into third, so she's leading the chase group. She's now only a minute and 10 seconds back from Lucy Charles Barclay here in the front. Um, she's got a little gap on, on everyone else. It's only about 10 seconds, and that's Rebecca Clark, Imogen Simmons, Chelsea Sodaro, um, Annie Haug, Ali Soltaus, Sarah True, Radka Kalafelt. They're all working together. We saw on the first lap, Annie Haug and Ashley Gentle rode almost the exact same pace. And that's sort of been enough to see Annie Haug bridge up that gap. But Ash Gentle does have 10 seconds to, to them. So I think what we're going to see here now is that group establish themselves, start working together to chase Lucy. And Lucy's going to go out to the front and work hard. So we're going to see a bit of a battle. That group trying to get Lucy and Lucy trying to stay away from that group, Crowley. Yeah, we're definitely seeing a, a dynamic evolve here. I still think it's so, so early in the race. And in these conditions... Um, Probably best to play it slightly conservatively. It is interesting that the three big pre-race favourites that we have talked about haven't really um, changed that gap coming out of the swim. I'm interested to see Chelsea Sedaro. She's having a good race, as is Sarah True. They're, they were sort of up in that chase swim group, and they've established themselves early on the bike. So that's an interesting dynamic. Obviously, Chelsea was un unable to race in Milwaukee two weeks ago, so it's great to see her up towards the front. And we see the two women... Right off the front of the race here, Sarah perez Seller and Lucy just navigate that slightly technical section where there's a lot of road markings again. Crowe, you were just talking about Chelsea Sodaro, the reigning Ironman world champion, is excited to be in Singapore to race the most elite triathletes in the world. And she confessed earlier this week that despite inconsistency of form, it's races like these that bring out her very best and produce the sweetest results. You know, I love to race against the best, best athletes. I am not in this sport, um, you know, just for kicks. I want to push myself and find out what is possible for my body and my mind. And I think that competing against the best people, it forces me to raise my game. I think it's not necessarily about 
winning every single time. It's about how you deal with the setbacks and can you pick yourself back up when you fall down. And you know, if we look at the trajectory of my career, there have been, been so many highs and lows. In fact, you know, um, many more losses and setbacks than there have actually been victories. But I think that those victories are so much sweeter, right? When you have to deal with the hard times. And I think especially with this event here in Singapore, um, I'm really pleased with my fitness and my preparation coming here, but my main goal is just to execute a really solid day that I can be proud of and will give me a lot of momentum going into the rest of the year. So they're up out the saddle, Jack, in one of the more challenging parts of this bike course. I'm really liking Chelsea Staro's race here, though, John and Craig. Um, I think the thing with Chelsea is she wanted to race the PTO US Open, but she just wasn't quite ready with a, an illness that she got at Challenge Roth. She was still training, though, so she went out and did a five-hour ride right around the time that PTO US Open was on. Well, speaking of Chelsea Staro, her family is here with her. Her husband is with Rachel. Uh, Rachel, over to you. Yeah, thanks so much, John. Well, I've got Steve here. And Steve, actually, if you don't know and haven't watched a lot of the PTO content, he's actually sacrificed his own career to make sure Chelsea has the best possible shot at success. And we know she's a world champion, didn't we, last year in Kona. I got a chance to sit down with her ahead of this one. I said, you're always a bit of a dark horse. We never know, do we? Either write you off or you're going to be right that up there on the podium. Steve, how was she feeling this morning ahead of this? Super excited. She's had a great buildup. She she missed Milwaukee, obviously. Uh, some things happened in in Roth, where we had to deal with with uh, she had E. coli there, so we had to deal with that. But the buildup for this has been great. We're so excited to be here. She's ready to race. Was Milwaukee due to a bit of an illness? What was it completely due to? It was yeah. She in in Roth, she got E. coli, so it was a stomach issue. She had to take some antibiotics. She had to get all that figured out. So we're ready. We're getting ready for this race. Yeah, and it's been a little bit of a, a break for the two of you. Your daughter Sky is at home as well. How nice has it been just to really get race ready without your little one running around? It's been hard. The time change is pretty rough, so I'm so used. To, we're so used to being around her all the time that the 15-hour time change has been. You see her for an hour or so, and then she goes to bed. So it's been a little tough, but uh, the race buildup is definitely easier without a toddler trying to run around at all times of the night. We had a bit of an insight as well into Chelsea this week. She was saying how mentally focused she is. Sometimes she could say she's selfish. You know, a lot of athletes have to be to succeed. When she's down here, when you were there, what is the athlete Chelsea like compared to the wife Chelsea? She's fo most focused person I've ever met in my life. That's what I think that sometimes is her Achilles heel. If you can be too focused, you want to be too perfect. Um, so dialing that back sometimes is a key. But what makes her so good is she's so focused on every nuance of the race um, but Chelsea at home is a much different person fun you know toddler mom does all the fun stuff with her so it's 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 night and day but when she's here it's work she's having a great race so far as well looks like Annie Haug is about to catch her will she go with her will she hold back what pace has she got on the bike at the moment I think for the beginning of this race she wants to ride her watts I, if Annie goes Annie goes faster I and mean, who knows what's going to happen but um you got to be careful. It's so hot and humid here, and this run course is hot. There's, it's not as flat as people think. There's a little hill at the end. Uh, so, you know, she wants to conserve for at least a good part of this race until she's got to light it up with everybody else. Well, Chelsea's come from that running background. Let's see if she has the running legs later on as well. Steve, thanks so much for chatting to us. Good luck to Chelsea. Well, fellas, we, we actually saw a big move by Annie Haug past Chelsea uh, as they were... Uh, climbing and she went past her at some pace as well absolutely i think annie's finding this course to her liking the climbing the technical sections she's holding great speed on the flat she's so aero um, but interestingly the lap splits uh, i want to say ashley gentle and annie Haug. there's only one second between them so similar to what we saw at the european open they are sort of holding holding tight for the time being while slowly closing in on these front two um, I love watching those pieces where they interview the athletes. I mean, these women are, are world class. They're the best endurance athletes in the world and they are focused, they are driven, they are disciplined, and they have great support networks behind them.
you need absolutely every bit of that as we see a shot of Lucy Charles Barkley out there leading the race ahead of Sarah Perez Salah. I caught a really interesting article in the Times newspaper about Lucy Charles Barkley. We are talking about the introduction of the PTO races into her calendar and it really did make her completely consider the, the Olympic dream if you will but the regularity of the PTO and the growth that we're hoping to experience next year I think Jack we've been told maybe six to eight events on the PTO tour they get to face the world's best on a very regular occasion and it was great to hear the commitment from Lucy and how much she's enjoying this 100 kilometer race as well. John they get to race the best athletes they get to do it for huge prize money that's life-changing and like we're seeing today there's all different courses that suit all different athletes. So they're not just gonna be six, seven courses where the same person wins them again and again. It does actually open up opportunity for almost everyone. And what we're seeing here is exactly that. So Ashley Gentle is only a minute behind this league group now. Annie Hag is only a minute 30 behind this league group now. So we're seeing this course suits the lighter, stronger climbers. What we would look at as more traditional runners, John. Well, we're about to bring up something we haven't done before at the PTO, and it's our sector time. So we're now able to compare apples for apples, if you like, as we bring up the, the sector times across the athletes. And through the first sector on the bike, it is... Annie Haug, who is in top spot, but as you were saying, Crowley, I mean, Ashley Gentle just behind Imogen Simmons with the same time as well. So it's very close there between those that are traveling the fastest over that first sector. Yeah, and as we'd expect early in the race, there's probably not going to be a lot of difference. It'll be interesting to see how that develops as the laps pass, who's able to hold pace. I find it interesting, Imogen, who's known as a great biker, she has got herself into the front of this race, and that'll be welcome news, I think, for Ashley Gentle. Um, this is turning into a real little power group on the bike. Um, Anne Haug has still some work to do to get up to this group. Um, I think they're slowly chipping away at the overall lead. Um, the two leaders, the two women we see on the screen now of Lucy and, and Sarah, but yeah, so far, not too many big changes. I'm, I'm just loving the way Anne's attacking this course though, her cornering, her climbing, her just speed on the flats. What we did see in that uh, graphic, Crowley, of the fastest section one sectors, Lucy Charles Barclay and Sarah Procella were nowhere to be seen. Who were there to be seen? Ashley Gentle and Arne Haag were on top. <laughs> it's not often, John, that those two are on the top of any fastest bike sector when we've got cyclists like Arne Reichman, Imogen Simmons, even Lucy Charles in a fit. But it does show that this course is a little different. Now, we are seeing Ashley Gentle sort of in a little bit of an isolation zone. She's sort of a minute behind these two women on the on the screen in Lucy Charles Barclay and Sarah perez Sala, And then we've got a little bit of a gap, 20 seconds to Ani Haag, Chelsea Sodaro. Ani Haag there, as we can see, the purple sector, fastest sector, she's gone purple. So what that means, everyone, is that Ani Haag is now riding the fastest in sector one, and that's including the first lap and the second lap. So we saw on the first lap that Ashley Gentle was there. Now it's Ani Haag there on, on sector one. So Ani Haag's done that faster the second time than she did the first time, John. But like 30 seconds, right? 30 seconds, yep. Golly, she is, and we know that she's super strong on the run split as well. So Annie Haug looking like she's setting up a, a really strong race so far. Yeah, she's definitely fastest on course at the moment. And I think it's a matter of time until she does bridge up, bridge up to Ash. And, and then the fireworks will start. But to be honest, I think these women will have a strategy. They'll have a strategy. They know the, the degree of difficulty that this course brings. They know the heat and humidity that they're racing in. And I think they'll have strategies for their, for their output, their power output, their heart rates, uh, which a lot of the athletes race to. And um, we see it time and again, the great athletes are able, able to stick to their race plan. They're very disciplined and they're able to execute. They rarely race somebody else's race. You can see Imogen Simmons up there as well from Switzerland. She's been training with Anne Reichman, as you alluded to earlier, Jack. Very strong biker as well. They've been over in Phuket getting some appropriate conditioning training for this humidity 
and heat. But she's had about three races in four weeks, so we'll see how she can hold it together throughout the duration of this 100-kilometer race, which is fast and furious. You know, I often think in these... I often think in these hot, humid races, an athlete's ability to just deal with the conditions um, and the way they acclimate before the race is probably the most important factor. As important as top-end fitness and the body's ability to deliver oxygen to the working muscles is their ability physiologically to cope with the, the heat and humidity. One of the things that I took away from uh, the US Open, a couple of the female athletes spoke about how exciting and intense it got on the bike course that they forgot to take on certain nutrition. And it's something they're paying attention to here because it's even more important that they get that absolutely dialed in so that they don't completely blow up on the run. Absolutely, I mean, as we keep saying, there's much less margin for error in these conditions. And when we get these close-up shots of the women, we regularly see them reaching for their hydration. A lot of the hydration systems are integrated into the bike. So often you see we can see Sarah Perez Seller there. She's got three drink bottles on her bike and an internal drink bottle. So she's carrying plenty of fluid, trying to stay hydrated, keep that core body temperature down. It'll be front of mind with all these athletes. We were actually talking to Amelia Watkinson's partner uh, on our way over here. And to your point, the, the amount of bottles, he was talking about an ice bottle on the bike. They were willing to give up a few watts just so that they could keep the body cool and get the hydration in because that's more important sometimes than having the perfect position and just trying to charge down on the bike. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, these athletes are so professional. They're trying to check all of the performance boxes, but sometimes you're willing to give up a little bit in terms of your coefficient of drag and your aerodynamics so that you can carry more fluid because, as we said, that's one of the things that really is non-negotiable in these conditions. So we're just looking at the, the gaps to everyone here, John. I'm loving this race. So it's not often that the bike this early seems to be doing such decisive things. So I sort of expected the bike to be a, like play a big role, but I thought a lot of the women would conserve and go, this is a long day, it's so hot here that the run's our thing. We need to conserve, make sure we don't kill our run legs. But we're actually seeing just gaps everywhere like one lap we'll see Ani Hag she'll be 30 seconds back and then she's bitten 15 seconds into that we're seeing Lucy Charles absolutely destroy herself at the front to try and hold that gap we're seeing Ashley Gentle bite into that gap as well and Ani Hag try to get her we've seen that group of Radka Kalafelt, Ali Salthouse, Sarah True they've got spit, spit out the back as did Fenella Langridge there's just gaps everywhere we're, we're not even 20 kilometers into this bike. There's still over 60 kilometers left, and there's gaps left, right, and center. The athletes coming through for this round already. We're just seeing now Jackie Hearing representing. So here is the transition area. Of course, the financial districts of Marina Bay in the background. I'm not sure if we've explicitly said about the temperature. 30.3 degrees was the air temperature at the start of the race. It's going to be there or thereabouts. But just look at what we're enjoying here in Singapore right now. The botanical gardens, the light show that you can see there from those, the, I, I, I'm going to call them fake trees. That's a, I'm underselling it in a very big way as we sweep across to where the rich and famous spend their money, Jack Kelly included, at the Marina Bay Sands. That is a wonderful shot up there. I've been lucky enough, actually, I'll confess, guys, I've been up there in the past. I've had the obligatory selfie on that infinity pool, and it is something to behold, although I did have to save up quite a lot of my pennies to afford the breakfast there. I can remember it being like $60, which was a bit punchy, but it was, it was one that I remembered. Well worth it. John, I'm not usually a big city kind of person. I really like the mountains and, and nature, but this city... Okay, it's like breathtaking everywhere you look. There's so many places where you just, you're on these amazing views. There's so much greenery. There's so much technology. It's just a city that feels like it's in the future. It is an incredible landscape. And we can see the Marina Bay Sands Hotel there, which Jack Kelly is a regular at this week. 
But in the background, what we did see was the Marina Barrage, which is a very interesting part of the run course. Um, we did a little bit of a reconnaissance run earlier this week, and um, certainly not a flat run, and it'll be a pivotal part of the run course, and I'm loving the drone shots. Well, Crowey, that, that part of the run, we're going to speak about that later, but it's also, it's similar to this, this bike course where what happened during the week was a lot of these women were going out to recon the course, as were the men. And what we were finding when everyone was doing their run recon was that the, the, the hill at the end of the, the run course, it's so much steeper and harder than everyone expected. Like yourself, myself and John went out and did a run on it and we dropped John on the course. Like fair enough, you did put in attack, but that hill is steep enough that you, you were managed to drop John on it and we were running quite easy for the rest of that run. And that's what's happening on the bike here as well. These women got out to this course, this hill particularly here, this is the, this is the hardest one. When they rode it for the first time, and a lot of them did it yesterday, they went back to their hotels and they changed their bike gearing. I know we've talked to many people who were on 28s at the back, so that's quite a, a tough gear. And they went all the way up to like 32s, 34s on the back because this hill is so steep. And now what we're seeing here, Crowey, is that Sarah Perez and Lucy Charles have both decided to go uphill standing, not just sitting. Yeah, I think that was only a matter of time. And I think it was a smart move with the with the gear change and I mean we are covering this hill eight times so there's a little bit of self-preservation involved and, and definitely some strategy and it's part of the reason these women do the course reconnaissance so it's one thing to see the course profile you know in an email it's another thing to actually experience it on the bike so for those that have been across the socials the PTO socials we've had some really exciting news that's been breaking World Triathlon and the PTO have joined forces to recognize the BTO Tour as the official World Champion Tour of long distance triathlon. There'll be between six and eight tour races next year. We will be coming back to Singapore in April, I believe. Age groupers can start registering their interest to take part in 2024 and get a piece of this course, hurt themselves on those climbs as these ladies are doing right now. We're just getting some lap times come through here, John, and it's interesting because Anne was the quickest of the big three that we've been talking about. She covered the lap in slightly under 40 kilometer an hour average, 15 minutes and six seconds, and she had about a 10 second deficit over Ashley, and it was about another 14 seconds. So this gap to the front of the race is slowly coming down for Ashley and for Anne. So it'll be interesting to see what happens I, I do believe these leaders are riding to a strategy. I don't think they're going all in, um, but that strategy may change shortly if we see that they get some company at the front of the race. You don't want to miss our expert analysis from five-time world champ Craig Alexander or the live interviews from around the course. But if you have a second screen handy, a phone, a tablet, enhance your experience by booting up our data dashboard for a look at the world of live data from the athletes and the course here in Singapore so you can share in some of the numbers that the gentlemen are talking about here on the live broadcast and you can see things moving around. You're always useful to have that. Second screen up as we enjoy live pictures of Lucy Charles Barkley out there on the bike course. 58.3 kilometers to T2. A long way to go. Yeah, I think Jack alluded to that earlier. It, it is still such an early stage of the race. And the race dynamics, I, I feel, are always different when you have limited field sizes. So um, it's very interesting watching how this race is unfolding right now. So Ashley Gentle has proved her top class consistency over the 100 kilometer distance, but she's extremely motivated to climb on the top podium step here in Singapore. And she's willing to go hard early to make that happen. I would like to see myself evolve um, in the next you know, five or so years, I guess, over swim, bike and run. I think that it's definitely a balancing act in triathlon, trying to keep each discipline at the top of your potential and at the top of the game. I'm quite fortunate that I have found that the middle distance um, really suits me in the, in the run. I think that it's actually, yeah, a distance that I really enjoy training for, but I don't actually have to do many hours or a lot of kilometers to kind of, you know, get to a, a pretty good spot. 
So I guess it leaves more time and energy for the swim and bike, which are two sports which I think that I have a lot more potential to improve on. Um, but then in saying that too, I, I feel like sometimes like I, I want to do more running. I, I want to get faster because I think I can. And so I think that, you know, I put a lot of trust in my coach and just, you know, trust what he's doing to develop, you know, each discipline. But it excites me because I think that I've been able to show that I can be at the front of races, but I feel like I've got a lot more to give. Fantastic to hear about Ashley talk about her excitement for her own personal evolution and someone that can talk a little bit more about that who is with Ashley on the day to day is of course her partner who joins Rachel now. Yeah, thanks, John. I've got her husband, Josh Amberger, with me. And we were just chatting off camera about how the PTO have found every single hill possible in Singapore for this circuit. It's brutal, isn't it? Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I, I've raced here a few times in Singapore and never ridden a single hill. And now we're faced with the hilliest circuit on the, the hilliest course on the PTO circuit. And last night when we did the course reconnaissance, we actually came back and changed all Ash's gearing. and. Um, drop down two chain ring sizes so yeah it's I think it's it's ov obvious on the broadcast how hard it is yeah obviously the bike is brutal the run as well it's flat for most of it and that barrage tests you doesn't it yeah yeah definitely and um, it's actually good the that section where you, they'll be able to eyeball the other athletes and, and be able to, to get time gaps and see who's looking good and who's suffering well, talking about Ash's race so far, it looked like, tell me if I'm wrong, she was conservative in the swim. At the moment, she's slightly in no man's land in third, but Annie Haug is coming past, possibly like a steam train anytime soon. Again, will she try and go with her, or what would the plan be if that is to happen? You know, Ash is obviously, you know, she's trying to look at the gap to the front, to, to Lucy and, and Sarah, but yeah, she's also looking behind to see where, where Annie is, is in... Um, I mean, they're both at competition, so she's, I mean, she's in a good position. She's a really strong cyclist and has the ability to, to ride by herself the whole way. And um, that's certainly going to be playing into her strengths. You know, she's confident and um, I, th I think she can run pretty well no matter what position she comes off on the bike. Well, she wants this one, doesn't she? She hated coming second last time out. We love seeing her on the top step. Josh, you're racing as well tomorrow, so don't run too far around the course to see Ash. But good luck tomorrow, and of course, good luck to Ash in her race as well. Thanks for chatting to us, Josh. Thank you, Rachel. Cheers. Gents, one thing that I just wanted to tick off from my list is the reduced field size. I've, I've heard some of the athletes talking about that. How does that affect the dynamic of the race? It does a few things, John. So the things it does is it makes the race more dynamic. It means that there's not going to be big working groups together on the swim and bike. So it leads to what we're seeing today, which is honestly chaos on the bike, big gaps, people making up huge gaps, a lot of uh, women riding on their own, like we're seeing here with Ash Gentle. We're taking a look at the percentage of heart rate e effort here, Crowey. And we see quite a difference between Ashley Gentle and Lucy Charles Barclay and Annie Hug. What does that mean? Well, obviously the, the athletes have supplied their maximum heart rates to us and it really is just a gauge of their effort. I think uh, it's very individual. The physiology of all these athletes is very different. It looks like from that graphic that Ash is working a little bit harder, but I want to say that's her threshold heart rate. That's her sustainable output. So um, these women are so experienced, they're not going to be really doing too much to spike their effort particularly in the middle of this bike ride. So whilst it looks a little deceiving, we've got Lucy Charles Barkley at 82% of max heart rate, compared to Ashley Gentle is at 92%. They're all in that range that we would expect. They're working at that, what we call that threshold or that sustainable effort level. At Milwaukee, Crowey, I did talk to Ashley Gentle after the race and she felt that maybe tactically she got a little, little wrong. She felt like she overbiked early in the bike. Are we seeing that again here? Are we seeing her make the same mistake with a percentage of max heart rate of over 90% or do you think that she's in control? Well, that's a great coach for, I mean, sorry, that's a great question for her coach, David Tilbury Davis. He would know exactly what level she can ride at, what percentage of her max heart rate and still get off and run at the level that she wants to. I'm going to say she's experienced enough while she may be spiking her effort level at different points she may have certain parts of this course that she feels are quicker where she can invest more energy and get a return on that investment. Generally speaking, I think she has been around the traps 
long enough and has enough experience to know that there's still a very long way to go in this race. She does like the heat too. And traditionally, Ashley Gentle, like we saw at the PTO US Open in 2022 in Texas, she thrives in the heat. And we did see her put in a minute to Lucy Charles Barclay over the first two and a half laps. So clearly she is working hard based off not only her heart rate, Chloe, and, and the, the physiological metrics that we're seeing, but also by how much time she's putting into these leaders. Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting that Lucy's sitting at around 80 to 82% of her max heart rate. And I think it speaks to what we saw in the swim. She didn't want to lead out. Um, she seemed content to sit on Sarah Parasella's feet there. She let Sarah lead the first lap on the bike, which we typically haven't seen um, Lucy do. She likes to go to the front, take the race by the, by the scruff of the neck, so to speak, and really put her mark on it. That's been her MO in a lot of the races we've seen. I think she's racing a really smart race so far. We are seeing her lead get whittled down slowly, lap by lap. But as we see, the two women at the front of the race go through the aid station here. They're taking the time to make sure they get those fluids on. As I said in the lead-in with Alex, I really feel the athletes who manage themselves the best over the course of this race in these conditions, they're the ones we're going to see have the great performances. We don't often see in this level of racing, Crowe, that athletes make such a decision to completely stop almost to make sure they get the nutrition. Often they'll, they'll make the decision, oh, don't worry about it, to keep speed. There they did the opposite and they said, no, I'm almost coming to a stop. We saw them ride about 10 kilometers an hour there just to make sure they got that bottle. Oh, absolutely, and I think that just speaks to the high premium there that they're putting on not only their pacing, and we're seeing that with some of the heart rate percentages and the lap times, but also their hydration and nutrition. Yeah, it's interesting you guys talk about the, the nutrition and the tactics, particularly with reference to Ashley Gentle, because I picked up some of her interviews and conversations between these two races, and she said that there was some of the best power she's ever put down on a bike in Milwaukee, but there were a couple of tactical and nutrition errors. And going into this one, she really wanted to hold Annie Haug off on the bike. And I'm wondering if she's getting that, I'm sure she's getting the information out on course to see how fast Annie is charging. And she's willing to push to the red zone, but it's, there's a very fine balance and she's very aware of that, obviously, so that she doesn't go over. Well, it's funny, John, because she's clearly made a very decisive move in that third lap. So Ashley Gentle is now only 25 seconds behind Lucy Charles and Sarah perez Seller at the front of the race. Keep in mind, only half a lap earlier, she was almost a minute down. Now, what's most interesting there, Crowe, is that she's actually sort of put that gap back out a little bit to Anne Haug, who's still over a minute, just over a minute behind these two leaders. So Ashley Gentle is actually 30 seconds ahead of Anne Haug now, Crowe. Getting some intel from her coach real time saying that Ashley riding solo initially is actually good because it means that she can command and control her own effort as she seems fit rather than being influenced by the race from the others. Yeah, well, <clears throat> that's a beautiful insight to get because David knows her physiology better than we do. He knows the numbers, he knows her metrics, her performance metrics. So as we see on the screen here, Ashley now has a visual on the two litre. She has bridged across that gap and it's going to be very interesting, the dynamic at the front here. I'm absolutely positive Lucy is not going to let anyone go off the front of this race. But I'm also pretty sure that she's riding to a schedule, I would imagine. Fastest laps are on your screen, and it is Annie Haug with the fastest at 15.06. Ashley Gentle in, sec in second with Chelsea Sodaro in third. And the woman in your screen right now, Lucy Charles Barkley from the United Kingdom a little bit behind with the fifth fast this time. What that, what that display there doesn't tell us, John, is that at the back end of that third lap, Ashley Gentle made a move. So her overall lap time was a little bit slower than Annie Hug, but her, her second half of that lap was actually quite a bit faster. So she made up time. And that's why, despite there it only looking like sort of 10, 15 seconds she made up on Lucy Charles, now we're seeing her really close that gap a little bit more quickly because I think maybe she got a, she could start to see them in her line of sight. And that meant, Crowe, that she thought, oh, I'm going to put in a little bit of effort to get to them, maybe to start working with them or just to get herself to the front of the race a little bit quicker. Yeah, it's interesting the tactics that are evolving here. I think there's no question in Ashley's mind, and A. Haug is, is her competition today. So she's trying to create as much separation. And these are the, the races within the races that we often see um, this could be a way for Ash to bridge across to that front group 
and form sort of these partnerships or these allegiances of convenience that we see happen in races all the time. And it's in Lucy and Ash's interest to distance themselves from Anna, but she is riding so well, as is Chelsea Sedara. She seems to be holding pace quite nicely, lap to lap, and Imogen Simmons as well. So, you know, that chase group, while we're not getting a lot of vision, they're, t they're not going anywhere. They're, they're holding their pace, they're holding their lap times, and they seem to be really rationing their effort level really well. What do you think Ashley Gentle's targeting coming out of T2 to Annie Haug, Jack? What's, what's her aim? Well, I actually see it a little bit differently that I think Ashley Gentle would love to get in a battle with Annie Haug on the run because I think Ashley Gentle sees herself as the best runner in this field. A lot of people saw what happened at the European Open and thought maybe that Annie Haug is actually a minute or two faster than Ashley Gentle. And Ashley Gentle was a part of that and did get outrun by her. But talking to her this week, she believes she can outrun anyone in this field. Now, if she could have a five-minute gap to her, would she love it? Yes. But I still think she backs herself even if she's with her. So there is Ash Gentle coming down the hill now. And can, for those of us that aren't from Brisbane and the heat over there, Crowe, Ashley's spoken about how these kind of conditions are something that she's very well accustomed to from back home. But look, I've got no concept of that. So is it exactly like it is here in Singapore? And, and why is that important to, to have a, a good handle on that kind of thing? I think when athletes operate in certain conditions, they get physiological changes that help them perform better. Um, not wanting to be too technical, but your plasma volume increases, you, your sweat rates change. It helps you perform very well in these conditions. And Brisbane is hot and humid in the summer, um, not unlike Asia. So I do think she will be really well versed in these conditions as we see her bridge across to the lead two now. Um, this is a really interesting move I do believe that Ash wants to distance herself from Annie. If she wasn't um, worried about the way Annie can run, I think she would have been quite content maybe to hold the pace that she was running. She clearly made a move. We just got the lap times before, and I think the roles were reversed. She actually had the quickest lap by 10 seconds. So that seems to be a move, a conscious decision to up her pace, to bridge across. And, and I think that is in response to Anna Haug being there, being close and being such a, a great runner. I mean, we get stuck in sometimes pigeonholing people, Crowe. Anna Haug's a runner, Ashley Gentle's a runner, Lucy Charles Barclay is a swim biker. But the reality is it's not actually like that. And Ashley Gentle, she doesn't just run when she trains. She swims and bikes and she sees herself as a triathlete, uh, a triathlete who's well-rounded and she sometimes talks like she gets a bit frustrated only being seen as a runner we saw at the u.s open that she rode as strong as anyone for the first 60k and we're seeing her make the most decisive move uh, along with Anne hug two people we see as runners on the bike early in the early stages Chloe. well i really think she does race very very well in these conditions that's the first thing and um, we've alluded to many times whilst we do talk about certain exceptional strengths that these athletes have in the different distances they are very, very well-rounded. You don't get ranked in the top 20 in the world by having too many weaknesses. So um, you look at recent past performance and it's always a good form guy, but it only ever tells part of the story. Um, these athletes are well-rounded and I think someone like Ashley is probably relishing the chance to show her bike strength. I know she's been in Europe riding in the mountains and also up in the mountains in Colorado at altitude. So she's probably really relishing this opportunity to show her bike strength. It was such a successful season for her in 2022. She almost replicated the same training pattern, certainly geographically with her time in Europe and then going stateside. Uh, one thing we spoke about this week, Crowe, was the, the kind of the emotional toll, being on the road and something that people may gloss over a little bit, but, it, but it's not easy to pack up your life at one month of the year, go away for nine months, being away from your your support network, I know Ashley has her partner with her, but I, I get the sense, I don't know her very well, but I get the sense she has a very strong network of friends and family back home. She 
She's a hard worker, but she doesn't get involved in much else in that triathlon world. She stays out of the media. But I, I, I do know that she said it is tough. It's tough doing that. Yeah, it was interesting and I think gave us a really good insight in the interview that Rennie did with her after the race in Milwaukee. She got very emotional seeing Paula Finley with her mum. And she has been on the road for four months and it takes a toll. Racing is not only physical. Uh, the mind-body connection is strong. It, it's to go very, very deep. You need to be in a good place mentally. Um, and we talked about a pre-show. Ash is on her way home after four months on the road. I think she will be very, very happy and, and very, very willing to go deep into the tank for this one. Crowley, we're just seeing two things here. We're seeing this move that we've talked about with Ashley Gentle on the second half of lap three that's continued into lap four. We saw that she's had the fastest sector. So purple sector for sector two means the fastest sector. And it aligns perfectly with what we're just seeing, which is Ashley has now made the catch at the front of the race, Crowley. I want to add something quickly here. At the PTO European Open, when we saw the battle of Ashley Gentle, Annie Haug, and Lucy Charles Barclay, Lucy Charles Barclay was two minutes ahead of Ashley and Aon into T2. Now we're seeing that only after, you know, 30K on this ride, Ashley's already caught Lucy Charles Barclay, showing that the conditions, the course, and the current wow. form are Look so different. Look at the way she's going past them here. And in the TT bars too, Crowey, not sitting up climbing. I think what was very telling in that close-up was just how relaxed Ashley looked, how comfortable. There didn't seem to be any stress or distress in her facial expression. She looks super comfortable. She looks great. But, Crowey, we also saw her sit behind the girls. She threw ice water on her back. She had about four or five drinks, and then she didn't just, she didn't just slowly go past them. She made a decisive, powerful move, and she's actually already gapped them. This is a huge move. It's a great move. I mean, she's shown her hand, she's shown her intent pretty much from the start of the bike, I think. She started out very steady. I think she's riding to a race plan, and she just looks super comfortable. She looks beautiful on the bike there. The PTO number one is leading the race here in Singapore, and it was a great move on the climb, and she looks relaxed while she's doing it. So, John, we're seeing Annie Haug at the bottom of that climb now. The gap from where Annie Haug to Lucy Charles Barclay, who was at the top of the climb, Ashley Gentle over the top of the climb now, is about 30 seconds. So, the, one of the ladies that was passed by Ashley Gentle, Lucy Charles Barclay. We have Rachel with Team Charles Barclay. They're going to give us their thoughts on the race so far. Yeah, Team Charles Barclay. The manager, Evan Gallagher, is alongside me now. We've just seen that massive move from Ash to overtake Lucy there, but possibly expected considering she's had to deal with that foot injury, the second injury in a year, coming back to fitness. Where did you feel she was at coming into this? Well, two weeks ago, she wasn't going to be here in Singapore and uh, she was desperate to come out. She wanted to blow the cobwebs out. And uh, so she was happy just to be here. It's hot, humid, similar to Kona. So we weren't, uh, did have high expectations. It was a case of, let's see how we go. But you just never know, do you? I spoke to her in the week and she said, I've got some race fitness and I want to test it out. And we know what happened last year at Samarin as well. On her comeback from her injury, she got the race victory. You never know. You never, never know, especially with Lucy. She gets white wine fever and, um, and yeah, she is ready to go, ready to race. And she'll let it all hang out there and do as best as she can. You just gave me a little insight into Lucy there. Obviously, you know on a personal level, you probably chat to her every single day on the phone. What is she like away from the sport? Look, I think the big thing that I really notice is when we're walking around here yesterday, there wasn't a single fan that came up to her that she didn't stop, have a smile, have a chat, and, and the kids as well. It was, it's wonderful, and I see that something really special about Lucy. She truly loves being out there with the fans. So it's great. She wants to, to be here to race. And once that, that gun goes, she is ready to race. But outside of it, she just wants to have some fun, play with the dogs, eat good food, and uh, just have a bit of a laugh. Yeah, her husband, Rhys, said she has a really strong fan base here in Singapore, and it proved yesterday. You follow her on social media, exactly what Evan said. She was taking pictures with everybody who wanted one. Well, let's see if she can match her third place. Best finish here at a PTO. Still a long way to go. Evan, thanks for your time. Thank you so much. All right, I've got to straighten this up because I feel like there's some Aussie lingo that's been thrown around here. But this, this had me moving in my chair. White wine fever? Mate, I think he actually said white line fever. White, oh, gotcha, right. Like, what, is, what does that mean? And I absolutely love that. It means 
almost her personality transforms from mild-mannered um, athlete off the course to just an absolute beast on the course. She loves to race. Um, Jack alluded to it before. She is just a racer at heart. She's always been that way. She doesn't dark or dodge anyone. She is a racer. White line fever. Um, and and I, I just love it. She is one of the fan favorites. She's got a huge following on social media. She's probably the most well-known triathlete on the planet. And that's why she engages with her fans, but she races like a champion. Yeah. Uh, just a little update for you. Sadly, we've just found out that Penny Slater is out of the race. She is a DNF here in Singapore. And yeah, Jack, uh, you love the socials. Lucy Charles Barkley, one of my favorite triathlon accounts to follow. It's so wonderful seeing people, and it's difficult, opening up their lives to us mere mortals and giving us an inside track on what it's like to be an elite athlete and everything that they go through. Her YouTube channel, which I think is run by her sister, which gives us that very intimate uh, look into their lives, is it's just very valuable for us as we see Ashley Gentle meander through that flow-through transition area. Yeah, John, everyone loves Lucy, like um, Cam Worth famously says. What we've seen here is what we talked about at the start of that bridge. Ashley Gentle took a break and decided she was going to make a move. So she didn't just pass and hold tempo. She made a decisive move and has now got about a 10-second gap on Lucy Charles Barclay, which I think not many people expected to see from Ash Gentle here. She's actually still holding about 35 seconds on Aaron Haag here, who's in fourth, who has gapped Chelsea Sadaro, who's even a, a minute further back. So what we're seeing now here is a very decisive move by Ashley Gentle Crowey and a purposeful move. She, she, when she caught Lucy Charles Barclay, she sat up and she made the decision to make this move. Yeah, I, I gotta say, I'm surprised. I thought she might take solace and ride with that group or that the group Lucy and Sarah might try and go with her. Yeah, it's a great move. I'm loving it. She looked so relaxed and composed going over the Benjamin Shears Bridge the last time. And, mate, I'm just absolutely loving how this race is playing out right now. We might actually get the two so-called runners attacking each other off the front on the bike, and it's absolutely brilliant. So, Crowey, I'm going to let people in on a conversation I had on the pontoon a little deeper with Ashley Gentle. Now, often conversations you have with athletes, it's like, should I talk about it? Should I not talk about it? Sounds like you're going to talk about it, though, Jack. I'm going to talk about it because <laughs> Ashley Gentle said she's going to be conservative in the swim, but on the bike, she felt like it suited her because she thinks she's the best technical cornerer of any of these women in the race. She told me that she is a, she's not afraid to do things around corners that a lot of the other women potentially may be afraid to do. We just saw through that transition section. She was cornering like a and I, I don't know if I should say this, a professional cyclist, not just a professional triathlete. Well, her coach did tell me that they, they expected a very technical course. So when you guys were saying about uh, the technical nature taking people by surprise, I don't think it's taken Ashley Gentle by surprise at all. As we see there, she's holding at that kind of 89, 90% effort range. Yeah, and that's what we'd expect. I mean, there's not much change to those metrics since we saw them the last time. That seems to be the level that these women race at. That's their sustainable um, effort for an 80-kilometer bike ride. Um, Ash has been attacking these corners. She's always been a very technically proficient bike rider. And and they held the same, though. I mean, we saw that in the first couple of laps, and, and both those women excelled in short course racing where... Again, that's just a non-negotiable for great performance, that the right. bike rides are very, very technical, and these women corner brilliantly. There's a nice wide shot of the Benjamin Shears Bridge. John, we did see Annie Haug get as close to 19 seconds behind Ashley Gentle, but we're just seeing at the start of lap five, Annie Haug is now 45 seconds behind Ashley Gentle. got sights of one another here as they look up the hill. Well, so Annie Haug's got sight of Lucy Charles Barclay, but she doesn't actually have sight of Ashley Gentle up sure. that hill. Keep in mind that hill's about 600 metres long at about 4 to 5% gradient. So that does suggest that the gap isn't closing between Annie Haug and Ashley Gentle. As I would expect, as, as these women attack this uphill section on the bike, it, it forces their effort level up. 
Um, I still think Annie's having a beautiful race here. She, she's pacing herself well. She still seems to be taking a lot of the less steep climbs down in the aero position to try and get that aero benefit. Coming, cresting, uh, cresting the bridge and then attacking the downhill. So we're coming up to the technical corners here. I expect to see this gap up to Lucy be halved as they go through this technical section. She's been attacking the corners very similarly to, to how Ashley Gentle has as well. Crowey, I love these small PTO field sizes that just have the world's best triathletes because it leads to racing like this, which is so dynamic. We're seeing now, Chelsea Sodaro is two minutes behind Ashley Gentle in the lead. That wouldn't happen if there was bigger fields where you could sort of get a little bit of a drafting effect off people and it made the ride easier. This course, these conditions, this field, it makes the race so much more exciting as we're seeing. Yeah, well, it falls on each athlete to do a lot of their own work. You don't get that group dynamic working as much. Um, I think just shines a big spotlight on, on your own pacing and your effort level as we see Ashley come up to take one of these corners that you talked to her about. Hits the apex nicely, and, and we talked about the road markings. They are in an interesting position there. There seems to be much less water on the road after that earlier shower, and, yeah, Ash took that corner beautifully, and she set sail again. She took the corner fast, Crowey. If you could, I don't know if you can think back to when we saw Lucy Charles Barclay and Sarah Perez Seller take that corner on the very first lap. Ashley Gentles probably put three seconds into them just around that corner, gets out of her saddle, attacks up that really short, punchy climb. So she's riding with intent. She's not just holding a tempo. She's riding the course. She's attacking this course for sure. And when you corner well, you can get two or three seconds each corner. Um, she's certainly rationing her effort to the course profile and she's finding those areas where there's free time and she's getting all of them hitting all of them very very well and what a course it is gentlemen taking a, a nice view there where we picked up the singapore flyer the observation wheel one of the tallest ferris wheels in the world i know crowy you're a massive fan of heights aren't you and we'd love to get yourself in one of those capsules for half an hour mate you will not see me dead, <laughs> dead in one of those things i, I don't like heights John, we're only halfway through the bike, so we've done 40 kilometres, we've got 40 kilometres left to go. I want to point out a gap here that shows just how different this course is and how it suits different athletes. Ali Salthouse is five minutes behind Ashley Gentle, whereas two weeks ago at the PTO US Open, at this exact point, Ali Salthouse was directly behind Ashley Gentle on her wheel. I've what? got to say, the mystery pro um, has picked Ashley Gentle and He's obviously had some inside intel because she just looks... Or she. Or she. Or she. Oh, sorry. Or I apologise. He or she <laughs> has some inside intel. As we Another see fastest again, lap. Ash again gets the purple sector for fastest lap. And she just looks so composed. Her mouth is closed. She's not a lot of stress showing on her face. Seems to be breathing quite heavy, but she's going up a climb there. And again, she assumes the time trial position. She just looks great. Two seconds faster than Annie Haug's fastest lap. But just going back to your point about Ellie and, and Ashley, but were you saying it's a great effort by Ashley or Ellie's not having a great day, just to be clear? It could be both of those okay. things, right? But it also speaks to the course, the field and the conditions. Of just how different a race this is. Exactly. This course suits a completely different sort of athlete to what we saw two weeks ago at the PTO US Open. And isn't that going to be so exciting when we extend the number of tour races with even more challenging courses differences people can play to their strengths i know we're saying that these are the most well-rounded athletes but percentages folks isn't it it just allows for exciting racing as well john and that's what the pto do better than anyone and i think something to talk about with this is that triathlon it's an exciting sport made more exciting by courses like this so keep in mind we're only 40k into the bike we've got 40 kilometers to go on an 18 kilometer run and there's already been three or four decisive moves, unexpected moves. Uh, like, no, buckle in. We've got, <laughs> we've, got, we've got another two hours left. And it's a great effort here by Ashley Gentle. As Jack just mentioned, counting down under 40 kilometres now before she will hit T2. But a lovely cadence there as she powers through the highway here in Singapore. Yeah, I think one of the things we're looking for as the, the race progresses is signs of fatigue. I mean, her upper body is still very quiet, as they say, not moving. Her cadence is great. She's holding that aero position on the flat. She's climbing well with a good cadence. She just looks fantastic today. 
We see there her race ranking compared to her peers that towed the line here in Singapore. Eighth best swimmer, fifth best biker. But these, you know, fellas, these might move after the results today. And the second best runner in the field overall, PTO number one. But of course, there's someone else in this field who's a pretty good runner, and that is Annie Haug. Yeah, and we see her still trying to close that gap up to the front. Um, I think it's a little closer. They're going to get a visual on each other here. We've just come through one of the dead turns, so all these girls, all yeah, these women, will, gentle. they'll get to eyeball each other. They'll see the gaps forming on the course, so they know exactly where they are in relation to their main competition. And it's just interesting how Ashley was able to bridge that gap up to the lead two effortlessly, and, um, and it's taken a bit longer to get up there. Do you like the looped courses, Crowy? I love them. I think they're exciting to watch and the, the athletes, I really think, enjoy racing them. You get, um, of course, they get some splits out on the, um, particularly coming through transition and at different points, but, you know, it helps to see the way the, the race is unfolding. You get a visual on your competition at different parts of the course and um, I'm just loving what Ashley's doing today. She's, and I want to send a shout out to Marinda Carfrey. Um, one of the greatest female triathletes of all time. I mean, you and I, Jack, had a conversation with her and she was bullish about Ash Gentle winning this race. She thought that um, just the timing of it, the way Ash exclusively focuses on the PTO Tour events, the way she's built her season, um, she's on her way home. Um, all the stars were sort of aligning for a really great performance and, and so far that's what we've seen. So when we saw that turnaround, what we saw Ash Gentle do was she eyeballed Ani Haag, whereas Ani Haag kept her head down, which I found really interesting. It, t it said to me that Ashley Gentle wanted to see how Ann was looking, how she was feeling, what the gap was. The gap was about 36 seconds. I, I had it on my timer. Well, perhaps we can take a look at it, gents, and see what we can extrapolate from that move. And that is the benefit of having the loop course where we can actually dial in to see these athletes as they eye the competition, see what kind of state they're in, I think is what you're alluding to, Jack. But first and foremost, the Marina Bay Sands here in Singapore, a beautiful skyline. We have the theater, there's just so many tourist attractions here. I know that crowe has been eyeing the Apple Store and Louis Vuitton. Have I just thrown you under the bus there, sir? But the shopping is excellent. The food's great. Wonderful stuff in around the financial districts and also down in Little India where I like to go when I visit Singapore, get some really good cultural experiences as well. And of course, the iconic Mer Lion as well. There's still so much of this race yet to unfold, Jack. I'm, I'm really interested to get your take because we've been getting a lot of visual feedback on Ashley and she looks great. But Anna is still in the race. I mean, she's only 40 seconds back and, I mean, she is the best runner in this field in what we've seen on, on recent past performance. And that's all we really have to go on. So whilst Ashley might feel she didn't have her best run um, at the European Open back in Ibiza in May, and I think that's clearly the case, I certainly don't think Anna Haug is panicking in any way, shape or form at the moment. They're only just past the halfway point of the bike ride. She's within a minute of the front of this race. And I think if you'd have given her that opportunity and, and offered that up as a scenario, she would have taken it. Yeah, Crow, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that we still see Ani Haug catch up to Ashley Gentle on the bike. I'm not saying that's not going to happen because I think there's a real possibility it could happen. It will just depend on does Ashley Gentle decide to continue this move and work even, even harder? Does she sit up and ride her pace? Does Ani Haug decide to ride to her tempo and start focusing on the run? That's going to be a, a really interesting dynamic to play out. I think the one thing that is that we are seeing without question is that Ashley Gentle and Annie Hart are both having fantastic days. Some of the other big pre-race favourites like Chelsea Sadara, who's now almost three minutes down on the lead, maybe not having the best day. So Singapore is the stage here for the PTO Asian Open. We're in lap five of our 80 kilometre bike course here. And it is, of course, day one, the women's race, Sarah perez Sala. We had a big old downpour earlier. We all got caught out in the rain, delayed us by about an hour. But I'm pleased to tell you, and you can see that it dried up, although there are still 
It's a little bit of precipitation that uh, is about and a little pooling. Spectators in the house here as a huge amount, thousands of age groupers will be competing over the weekend and they get a chance to look at the very best in the game, showing them how it's done here in Singapore. And that will be the location for the rap party, I hope, gentlemen. We'll certainly be trying to visit the Marina Bay Sands, one of the best hotels in the world, with a just a beautiful pool at the top there, with looks over the botanical gardens. A light show. It looks even better at night, folks, but it's pretty striking during the day as well. And if you're lucky enough to get a hotel room there, you get to see over the port one of the busiest ports in Asia here in Singapore. Lots going on in Singapore, including, of course, top level racing here at the PTO. And we're pleased we're going to be back here in 2024 as well. If you're an age grouper that would like to get involved, registration is now open. You can head to the PTO website for more on that. Crombie, did you say you've raced here in Singapore in the past? And has the place changed much since you were last here? You want me to take you on an ancient history lesson, do you? Oh, it can't back, be that far away. Back in the dark ages, <laughs> yes. Um, you know, there's a very vibrant triathlon community here in Singapore, as we've seen with um, some of the other races that are going on this weekend. So, yeah, I raced here a 70.3 race in 2009, 2010, and what I can tell you hasn't changed is the heat and humidity. <laughs> yeah, that seems to be a fairly constant here at the PTO as we're picking up live pictures of Ashley Gentle. There is definitely a difference the way Ash is taking this technical section through triathlon when we, we focus on some of the other women as they come through. Ash is pedaling through a lot of the corners, keeping her speed, keeping her momentum. Uh, as we see, Anna Haug has bridged that gap up now to Lucy Charles Parkley and Sarah Perez-Seller. And again... We get to another, I guess, important stage of the race, Jack, here. What, what does Anna do here? Does she sit and recover, or does she continue her charge after Ashley? I think it looks, Crowley, like she's made the decision to sit in, even if it's only for a little bit. Uh, we're seeing that these three women aren't riding that much slower than Ashley Gentle. They've all come through transition there to start lap six, 40 seconds behind. Now... I know that we both think that Arnie Hard believes she could run 40 seconds into Ashley Gentle. So maybe she's looking at the gap when they're crossing each other, thinking, OK, we've sort of got that in control. Let me sit in and conserve. And if she does need to make a move because she sees the, the, lap, the gap extending, then she'll make that decision. But I guess I think the thing is, Arne's probably evaluating on the fly on those sections when they cross each other when she gets a bit of an idea of the gap. And there are a couple of sections on the course where she's getting a good visual and she has enough experience not to panic. I think she's racing her race as we see Imogen Simmons come through the transition section there and she's one of the fastest on course on the bike having a great race. Crowey, just how much does it help Annie Haug and Lucy Charles Barclay and Sarah perez Seller being in a group versus Ashley Gentle out in front? Do they get any benefit? Um, we saw through transition there they do get to work together because it's a neutral zone. Technically speaking, there's no draft benefit at 20 metres, but I, where I think it helps is if you've got someone in your group who's technically better than the others and they get on the front of the group, it can keep the pace up through the technical sections better. Um, so we mentioned before that Ashley's attacking some of these corners and she might be taking two or three seconds per corner out of some of the other women. Um, I think where it, where it may help Lucy and Sarah is having Anna on the front of that group because she is definitely... I think technically one of the best bike riders in this race and it does help with the pacing as well and we see situations all the time I mean we saw it in Milwaukee two weeks ago where there was a group that looked solidified for two-thirds of the bike ride and then Lucy Byram came charging through and you know she didn't really disrupt her tempo she just rode through that group and, and Paula Finley was able to sort of snap out of her rhythm and increase her pace and go with it and, and that was a I think that was a move in Milwaukee that really left its fingerprints on, on the finishing results in the end. I mean, I, I'm sure I heard Paula say after the race that that move by Lucy coming through helped her um, get her podium position. So it definitely helps in different sections of the race. These athletes, they have so many performance metrics that they're monitoring, their heart rate, their power, their cadence. They would be looking at all of those things, but then there's also the mental elements of having that pacing help and... and the boost of someone else cornering better. 
Crowley, I think what we're seeing is that these women are riding fast up this hill compared to some of the chase women. So Chelsea Sodaro has now lost another 30 seconds to Annie Hag and Ashley Gentle because of how fast they're cornering and climbing. We're seeing here, Crowley, that Annie Hag has made the decision to go to the front up this climb. I think because she felt that these two in Lucy Charles Barra, Lucy Charles Barclay and Sarah Perez Seller weren't quite climbing as fast as she would have liked and felt like maybe she was going to lose some time to Ashley Gentle. Yeah, it's an interesting observation. And as we see here, Anne just moves sort of steadily off the front of this group. So this is turning into a really mouth-watering proposition as, as we hit the last... 20 kilometres, half an hour of this bike ride and um, an 18 kilometre run to come where I feel two of the best runners in the sport, particularly at this middle distance, potentially will be going head to head here. I think so many triathlon fans, Crowey, get so sick of watching the same flat bike course where, you know, there's nothing exciting about it. It doesn't suit someone who can climb well. It's it's sort of the same thing we've always seen in triathlon for years, whereas now we're finally, thanks to the PTO, seeing an exciting course that we've been crying out for with climbs, with hills, with steep hills, with, with bike courses that suit people that can climb well. And what we just saw up that climb there with Annie Hag putting 50, 60 metres into Lucy Charles Barclay is that, hey, finally we've got a course that suits someone who can climb explosively. Oh, it certainly adds so much to the mix from a race dynamic point of view just to have different courses. A bit more climbing, that technicality. And I think it just speaks to the biking ability of, of Ash Gentle and Annie Haug that when they get on the flatter courses that they're able to hold their own with athletes who typically should be putting out more power on those flat courses. And it's funny, isn't it, Crowey, how sometimes our perception of who's a good cyclist in triathlon can be shaped by the course. What we're seeing now, if, if every triathlon course was like this, we'd probably look at Ashley Gentle and Annie Hag as the two best cyclists in triathlon, whereas because of how the courses are, we actually look at them as just the two best runners who have to try and hold on to the strong cyclists on the bike, whereas this course, it now makes those two women the strongest cyclists in the field. It certainly shines a spotlight on their cycling ability and... As we've always said, when you are in the mix competing to win these races, you don't have weaknesses. Um, but it's just so interesting to see two women who are perceived as, as runners, and, and they are, they're great runners, but they're just really getting off the front and, and making this such an exciting race. Can I talk about the Australian way as well, Crowey? You guys down under, notoriously known for calmness, but I feel like through, and you would have, uh, followed Ashley Gentle's career from a long way back. She's endured a lot, but she's able to keep a real even keel, isn't she? So she doesn't get emotionally attached to the racing in like a negative way. Yeah, I think, you know, we're all different as athletes and as people, um, physiologically, but also mentally and emotionally. I think it really helps that she travels with her life partner and her husband, Josh. They get to share in each other's journey. And I think she's just really in enjoying her career path. I mean, what's not to love about being a pro athlete, yeah. racing in, you know, locations like this for large prize purses and, um, you know, the PTO are taking these races to such huge audiences. And you know, I think really Ash has just really grown into her career and is loving what she's doing. I just, just an observation, because people at home might be seeing it as well. We've got Race Ranger in here now. What, what is, when it's blinking, is... The, should a, a rider be falling back or, or should they be advancing through? What's the deal with that? Well, John, technically, once so she's that ba light... they've backed off now because it's gone to back to blue. Technically, once that light starts blinking, it means you're within 20 metres. Now, by the letter of the law, that does mean that you should maybe look to make the move. But what we're doing with the new technology is if it just starts blinking, maybe it means you're 19.5 metres. As long as you make that decision very, very quickly to stay at 20 minutes and hold off, you're probably not going to get penalised. It's when it stays blinking for too long, yeah. the referee will make a call and say, hey, that's a penalty. Yeah, because you've got to get a chance as well. Sometimes eyes aren't up, are they? You know, you have to give a few seconds, of course, 
and with the conditions on the course, the, the, the terrain on the course, when you come into the start of those climbs, you do bunch back up sure. and there is small periods where the gap does close. So you'll be sitting at 22 metres and it'll close to 18 and you can't really do anything about it. Same with the corners, same with transition. So what you saw was at the bottom of that climb, that's when it happened, then it came back out quickly. It was just such great feedback from Milwaukee about the fairness of the race there. But it's just trying to identify and show examples of when this thing... Yeah, it's working really well. And it's brilliant technology. I think it's used at this point more as an indicator for the athletes and, and the officials have said they're going to use... It's as a tool. Yeah, yeah, it's a tool and they're still going to use their dis discretion whether there's an intentional advantage gained or not. And as Jack mentioned, the uh, hillier courses and the technical courses, there's almost a piano accordion effect of compression and then separation again. And it's something the athletes are mindful of, but a little bit of lack of concentration, you're coming into a corner a little hot, someone's breaking and, and taking that apex, you, you might unintentionally get into that zone. I found it interesting at that steep climb that we saw some different techniques. So all three of these women in Ani Haag, Lucy Charles Barclay and Sarah Perez Sala, they stood up. Ashley Gentle sat the whole way. To me, when you sit on a climb like that, it means you're feeling good. And we're starting to see some separation in this group. Ani Haag is definitely created some separation back to Lucy and then the, in turn there's some separation back to Sarah so we see Ashley coming out of that dead turn so again they get that visual and it looks pretty similar to the last lap to be honest I think there's not a lot of change there so the status quo remains for this lap as we head into about 25 kilometers to go and a really critical part of this race I believe. Earlier on, Crowe, you were admiring some of the bikes, the technology that's available to these athletes in 2023, and of course the testing that goes around it as well. Uh, athletes like Ashley Gentle, especially with the prize money that's on offer with the PTO, able to reinvest so that they can spend more on the science and make these machines, I mean, they're just fantastic, aren't they? Yeah, well, we've seen science and technology take over the whole world, and it's come into sport. These machines really are beautiful. The athletes do check all of the performance boxes. They're doing some testing on the velodrome. They're doing testing in the wind tunnel. They're trying to get comfortable positions that are also aerodynamic, so lowering their coefficients of drag as much as possible. And their positions look great. Something I don't want us to forget as well, John and, and Crowe, is that you can't see on the TV screen the conditions, but it's so hot outside. I've just ducked at my hand outside to get a feel of it. It still just feels so hot and humid. So keep in mind that while we're seeing Ashley Gentle here work hard, Annie Haag work hard, that doesn't come without sort of a compromise in making the back end of this bike harder. So I think what we expect to see here is gaps to continue to extend. Uh, and what we're seeing with these top sort of five athletes in Ashley Gentle, Annie Haag, Lucy Charles Barclay, Sarah Purcell and Imogen Simmons is that they're extending the gap to everyone behind them and it's blowing out. They're sort of getting 20 to 30 seconds on everyone else behind them every lap. And I think a lot of that is, is the conditions as well as the hard course. I think these top five are clearly the best on course at the moment. Um, the time splits show that. There's not a lot of change between this top five. Imogen Simmons having a great race. Interestingly, Sarah chose to, to wear an aero road helmet, not the full aero helmet. So she, that choice, I guess, is based on managing core body temperature. Um, a lot of the aero helmets these days are very well ventilated. So you do not have to give up that aerodynamic advantage at the expense of ventilation. Just an interesting equipment choice there. Sarah Perez Sala also not wearing a tri suit. So she's clearly made decisions to stay cool versus staying aero. I think it's working for her, Chloe. Did she not normally wear that kit though? She does. She, she has worn a, a sleeve tri suit before, but she is someone sort of similar to Holly Lawrence who probably does prefer to wear a, a, like a, um, a more singlet looking tri suit. Yeah. It's mouthwatering this race at the moment. Annie Haugen, Ash Gentle, that gap, that differential is sort of anywhere between 30 to 40 seconds. It's at about 36 seconds now. Um, with an 18 kilometer run in this heat, that is by no means a winning margin. So there is a lot of this race left. Um, and, and Anne is just so experienced. Um, she would know exactly what effort she can dial up on the bike and give or take five or 10 seconds know how she's gonna run, what her run pace is gonna be. So this is, this is mouth-watering as we, as we get down to 25 kilometres to go and 
we're getting to the business end. And how great is it, Crowey, that two weeks ago we saw Ashley Gentle involved in a heated battle and rivalry with Taylor Nib at the front of her race. And now two weeks later, the exact same thing with her other biggest rival in Annie Haug. And I just love that about Ashley Gentle, that she, uh, Taylor Nib focused on the PTO US Open um, and then Annie Hugs focused on the, the, the Asian Open, but Ashley Gentle's out the front of both of them battling with both of those ladies. We'll so see here's Imogen Simmons here. Yeah. Still riding very well and riding solo. Um, holding pace, not losing any time to the women in front. And this is a great race for Imogen. Of course, she has spent a lot of training time in Thailand. So she'd be very, very used to these conditions and, and just pacing herself really, really well. Crowley, we've just heard an announcement that Lottie Wilms is the next DNF on course. Yeah, and I don't expect it to be the last in these conditions. It, it's not unusual to get a high percentage of DNFs. As we've been saying the last couple of days previewing this race, the margin for error is much, much finer when you bring in such heat and humidity. These are brutal conditions. And the more experienced the athlete and, and the more well-versed they are in these conditions, the more confidence you have in, in the strategies they're adopting here, which, I mean, you said at Ashley's race, it wasn't, uh, sorry, Ashley's move off the front, it wasn't impulsive. Um, and, and just the way that Anne has paced herself on the bike too, I think it's very methodical, um, shows a lot of experience and, and both these women have, have raced in these conditions and, and probably even a little worse. So Imogen Simmons, c some good form coming into this. She's had two wins through the summer and challenge races. Uh, and I loved researching her, actually. Do you know she speaks five languages? Grew up in Hong Kong as well. Re I think she represented them as a national swimmer. But as you were saying, Crowey sp spends time in, in Thailand, trains with Anna Reichman. I think she races under the uh, Swiss flag as well. So a, a true international look for Imogen Simmons, who is still very much part of this race in position number five. And speaking of Imogen Simmons in position number five, John, I'm, I'm honestly shocked at how big the gap from fifth to everyone else is. And I expect it to only get bigger. I mean, 25K to, to go, 24K to go. We're 56K into the bike course. 25 kilometers to go is still a long time. And that gap from fifth to everyone else is just, it's just so much bigger than everyone expected. Yeah, I want to say that Joss McCauley, who's sitting at about 4.20 back, and, and Radka Kalafelt probably haven't lost too much time because they had a two to two and a half minute deficit, possibly even more out of the swim. So some of the women from fifth to fifth to tenth seem to be holding pace. But you are right, there have been plenty who have just completely fallen off a, a pacing cliff, as they say, and have dropped right off the radar. So it looks like these five women on the front have got their pacing, got their strategy spot on as we head into the the penultimate lap now. Crowley, can I ask you a question? Do you think that the women are losing time because they're pacing the race and choosing to hold certain powers um, and certain percentages of effort to conserve for the run? Or do you think that they are having bad days? Or is it just that Ashley Gentle, Anne Hag and the other three up front are just riding fast and aggressively and the, 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 the women can't keep up? I think it could be a combination of all of those things. I think some of them just can't keep pace in this heat and humidity. Um, Jocelyn McCauley is a noted bike rider and I think she had a two to three minute deficit from memory out of the swim so she hasn't lost too much time to these leaders so she seems to be holding strong as does Radka Kalafelt but there is absolutely no question some of the women have just dropped completely off the radar so they've either got their pacing wrong or they're just really not acclimatized to these conditions. I just love the rivalries that Ashley Gentle's a part of, like I spoke about, her rivalry with Taylor Nib and her rivalry with Arnie Haag. Those three women are the best PTO athletes on the planet right now. And I'm just fascinated by this, that Arnie Haag is 40 seconds behind Ashley Gentle and Lucy Charles Barclay and Sarah Perisella have actually dropped back and they're now about 10 to 15 seconds behind Arnie Haag. So what we are now seeing is probably, in my opinion, two of the best three PTO athletes on the world engaged in to this point, probably my favourite battle of the year based on what we're seeing. And I'm just so excited to watch this play out. It is absolutely shaping up as, as a shootout on the run. And we've got two great runners. Both women are great in these conditions. We're going to learn a lot, I think, in the first 
I want to say five to eight minutes of the run course. I think we'll, I think we're gonna we're gonna get a lot of intel in who's who's packed their their best running legs for Singapore. Crowley, I have a question I've actually been holding off all week that I haven't asked you during the week because I wanted to do it live on, on, oh boy. on broadcast. Oh, boy, brace yourself. <laughs> it, it's nothing controversial. It's just that we know Ani Haag is training for the Ironman World Championships versus we know Ashley Gentle is targeting the two PTO eight races at the end of the year in the PTO US Open and the PTO Asian Open. Do you think that being fresher for Ani Haag, having raced less and focusing on um, races at the end of the year, suits her for the back half of this ride and the run? Or do you think it suits Ashley Gentle because she's focusing on this distance, even though she raced only two weeks ago at the US Open? Thank you for the question without notice. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, mate, it is a great question because I think freshness can be king, particularly in hot races. Um, not even having that residual racing fatigue in your legs from two weeks ago as you mentioned Ashley has made no secret of the fact that she is targeting this distance and, and the races on the PTO Open but has come off a, a very tough battle two weeks ago with Taylor Nib. so and you correctly mentioned that Annie Haug is preparing for the Ironman World Championships which I want to say are eight or nine weeks away so I think the way her and her coach schedule a season it's it's not impossible that she has peaked for this race as well in this distance and time will tell the first five minutes of this run will be awesome we'd like to hear from you guys at home as well if you jump on the live blog at protriathletes.org forward slash live there is a poll there. there's a question hanging in the air right now what lead off the bike does gentle need to hold off Haug. So a few options for you there. We'd be keen to know what you think. Over two minutes, 44% of people thinking over two minutes is needed. Right now, we're going to have a look at the fastest sectors, Jack. I'm interested to see this as much as anyone else. So we'll wait for it to prop on, up, up on screen who actually has taken over. And there we go. Ani Haug has actually taken over as the fastest on sector one from Ashley Gentle. So we saw a little period where Ashley Gentle was um, getting a gap on Ani Haug. She took it from about 19 seconds out to 40 seconds. But now Ani Haug has actually drawn it back. Something we are seeing, Lucy Charles Barclay has completely fallen off uh, the top five. So having maybe a bit of a, a, a tough day. I know that you've been very excited about these these sectors coming in, Jack. It's a, a really nice addition, isn't it, to the coverage just to see, uh, get a real true idea of who's doing what throughout the field. Yeah, well, we're seeing Ashley Gentle has the fastest sector on sector two compared to Annie Haug. Now, I think that's because sector two is a little bit punchier on the climb and a little more technical versus sector one where you can probably if anything, slightly favours someone who's a bit stronger in the time trial position and a little bit of a gentler climb. So we are seeing how the two different sectors really do suit two different kinds of athletes with slightly different top fives and that swap between Ashley Gentle being fast on sector two and Ani Haug being fast on sector one. Absolutely. I think the specs of each sector certainly favour the strengths of different athletes and that's what's reflected in those sector times there. That poll question, John, what a, that's a tough one. <laughs> Not only that, Crowey, but I wish that someone could uh, send that, that, that question onto Ashley Gentley out on course because if, mm. she was, if she heard that, that would light a fire under her belly because she well, sees herself as the strongest runner. Maybe we should get Rachel to ask Josh what kind, of, what kind of time gaps Ash was hoping for coming out of T2. I mean, that would be very insightful. And I agree, I think. Let's get him back. <laughs> Find Josh. I wonder if he'd be offended because I know Ashley yeah. would be offended. Gotcha. And, I understand and, what you're saying. And Josh, no one bats for Ashley stronger than Josh. I would be fascinated to hear that mm. question. I think he'd say that he doesn't. She doesn't need any gap. Yep. I think he actually was saying something to that effect uh, during the interview. I might, I might be wrong. Feels like a little while ago, but nevertheless, we may found, we may find out, and they'll be putting it to bed. Still looking strong out the saddle now. Yeah, absolutely. She looks just composed, experienced. Non-committal all week, though. She uh, gives a, a very interesting perspective on 
racing and you just don't know who's going to turn up on on what day and you need a little bit of luck in races as well and i think when you factor in the conditions here in singapore it, it does roll the dice uh, for a couple of the athletes out there yeah i think we've seen enough of any Helg's body of work to know that when she turns up to race she's very well prepared she's one of the best athletes at a lot of different distances had a stellar short course career is amazing in these middle distance races that that performance that she put in um, at the european open back in may was just out of this world her run split was competitive with with the men times on that course and when she races she's in in a position to to really challenge for the top step of the podium if those of you at home want to compare your times with the very best in the sports here in singapore then sign up for the race next year in 2024. You two can get to race on the very same course that the top pros do. What a privilege that would be. Let's see if you can get close to the numbers that we're seeing from those like Annie Hauk. I think something to, to sort of, that would be fascinating if we could get inside was the head of Alan Hug right now. Chloe, do you think that she, because she's fresher, because she didn't race two weeks ago, that she does believe she's in the perfect position right now? Or do you think that she would be wanting to get closer to Ashley? Like, where's her head at as we watch her right now? Well, that would be a great question to ask her coach, Dan Lorang. I think, Athletes know that in these conditions, fresh is best. Um, but also we've talked extensively about how Ashley has extensively prepared specifically for this distance. Um, so I don't think, I mean, both these women are just world-class professionals and I don't think anything of what they're seeing here is shocking to either of them. I think this, this is a battle that they've probably been hoping and hoping for. And you mentioned Dan Larang, who's the coach of Ani Haug. One of his sort of core philosophies that his athletes approach, so he's the, also the coach of Jan Fredino, who won the PTO US Open, is they don't just race, 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 race. They train to win races. So when they when, when Dan Larang coaches athletes show up to races, they're there to win the races, not to participate in the race. We saw that with Jan Fredino. He's had a bit of a quieter race season, but he showed up to the PTO US Open, and he was ready to not only race, but win that race. Maybe that's exactly the same with what we're seeing with Annie Hard right now and what we saw earlier in the year at the PTO European Open with Annie Hard. Yeah, no, I agree. I just think when you are the best in the world or one of the best in the world, and in some cases, one of the best in history, you don't make up the numbers. You, you race to win. You don't use races as stepping stones for other races. Um, we talk about the money that's on the line, but these athletes are competitors. They have pride. They don't want to take a a loss to anyone else um, I mean if you said a minute ago it would be great to get inside the head of Anne Howard it would be great to get inside the head of Ash Gentle and I'm sure if we did they are both quite confident right now one thing that I heard Rennie talking about uh, might have been with, with you guys on your podcast actually was athletes coming down from long course racing to tackle 100 kilometers and she said that was a it was more of a challenge doing it that way than it was going up from short course and of course Annie Howe's last race was, okay, back in June, but it was Challenge Roth, a long course race. Yeah, I actually think it was long enough ago that she will have fully recovered from that race and will have done specific training for this. And actually, the distances all help each other, the training for them, if you don't, don't do it all at the same time. And I think that's what's kind of interesting and revolutionary about what Christian Blumenfeld is doing. He's doing all of the distances within a three-week period. Yeah. Um, I think... There's been enough period between Challenge Roth that anyhow will bring her best running legs to this race. And on that, John, I think it's interesting that sometimes these punchier, harder courses do tend to suit maybe the short course athletes who have come up. And what I mean by that is, athletes who have previously been world-class short course athletes. Ashley Gentle, Annie Haug, they've both got WTS wins. So they're both um, 
they're both athletes who are at the very top level of short course racing. And so these very punchy, explosive swims, technical bikes, punchy bikes, they do tend to suit those athletes versus the athletes who got into the sport started in full distance Ironman racing and then have tried to make the move down to the PTO distance. So the PTO has changed the landscape of triathlon since its inception. Not only are the very best triathletes gathering to pit themselves against their elite peers for ultimate bragging rights, the financial rewards are a game changer. long course and short course athletes that have hit that top, that top 10 earners there on that PTO list. Ashley Gentle at the very top of that. She is targeting the races. It's a lot of money. The game has changed. The game has changed. Uh, and you know what? It's nothing that these athletes don't deserve. 100%. They are, the, they are the best endurance athletes on the planet and they work super hard and deserve every cent of that. Interesting to see Ash Gentle on top of, on top of the money list, I think. She's been the most consistent um, and she does target these races and it looks like she's trying to add to her tally today. Yeah, she, if she wins, if she comes top spot, she take, that's over half a million US dollars, which is, uh, that, that's, a, that's a good amount of money. It's a good chunk of change, Jack. Sure, like I'm sitting here, as you were saying, that I was shaking my head and laughing. That's never happened in triathlon before. Like, I just can't explain to you as a lifelong triathlon fan how crazy that is like if you go back to crowey's era that this wasn't happening this is five hundred thousand dollars in two years yeah it's, no, it's we mind-blowing we were given a towel and a t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> i don't think you're joking either for some of the races as no, well i am joking <laughs> Look, i'm very surprised you haven't asked us to put our necks on the line and and pick a winner me asking you to put what at this stage yeah i can't do that uh, jack got torn apart for doing that last time in, in Milwaukee. I wouldn't want to put you on the line like that, Crowley. We have also oh. got news just in that Ali Salthouse has DNF'd. Oh, Arnie Hag right here, mechanical. Crowley, so something's oh. happening with her rear cassette. It looks like something's stuck between her rear cassette and her disc wheel. What are you seeing there? It looks like it could be the, the little sticker that put over the valve cover something has come off and wrapped around it's wrapped around her wheel between oh, her oh, rear she's cassette picked a, she's picked up a little bit of debris on course i think this is an absolute oh, disaster so i'm counting down that's 25 seconds lost already as soon as she does get it out she will be able to start riding again but that's now 30 seconds come on in let's go oh, this is so frustrating it's i that, think oh there, you, oh, there we well go done. come on 42 43 oh, no, there's still 44 more. What is that? What has That's around, oh uh, man, around the wheel. That has embedded around the hub. It's on both sides, on both Crowley. Sides. What has gone on there? Oh, this is awful for Anne. I think is, as an athlete, this is your worst nightmare. That's Something now over a minute and 15 seconds, Crowley, too. And you can see it, it's wrapped around her, the, the tube of her bike as well. Yeah, it looks to me like she's picked up a bit of debris on course and it's just wrapped straight in around the drive chain, around the hubs. It has gone up over the wheel as well. 
This is absolute disaster, though. Like we're sitting here watching it. This is it's a real this shame. is disaster. This is now. This is going to be at least two minutes. Oh, thank goodness! Come on in. Let's go. Oh, come on! It's just a bit of tape, is it, Crowy? What is it? I have no idea what that. Oh, she's dropped an Allen oh, key. Oh, right. Come on in. Let's go. Let's get back in the fight. Something just to point out there, Crow, is she was so aware of not littering the streets yeah. of Singapore that she hasn't dropped on the road despite no doubt being frustrated. Chucked it down her shirt. Yeah, she's a professional. I mean, she kept her composure there in such a frustrating situation. And what we did see on the other side of the screen, I don't know if you caught Ashley Gentle going the other way, so Ash Gentle is well aware of what has just happened to Annie Haug there. Do you know how unlucky that is? This, the streets of Singapore are arguably the cleanest streets I've ever witnessed in my time traveling around the world. It is, it's spotless out here. Oh, I just feel so bad for Anne Haug. That is awful. She was having a great day, great legs. You just do not like to see that. It's funny what they say, Crowy. Sometimes someone's misfortune. <laughs> and I mean, I hate to say it because I feel equally as bad for Annie Haug there, but that could be the most decisive moment of this race for Ashley Gentle too. I, I don't think we expected that of all the possible eventualities and scenarios. I did not see that happening. I mean, I, your heart just goes out to Anne Haug. That is just awful. But you know what? She's a pro and she'll have her head in the game. She'll just get straight back on. She'll get straight back onto her pacing. We see that she's lost three. She's now three minutes down, so she lost about two minutes, 40 seconds there, and oh boy. I had it timed as two minutes, 10 seconds she lost, so that makes sense given she was about 44 seconds down. So yeah, it was about probably two minutes and 14 seconds, something like that. And interestingly, Lucy Charles Barkley, Imogen Simmons, Sarah Perez Suller, they're only a minute behind Ash Gentle, so they have quietly been going about their business. Imogen Simmons is having a great race. It's so good to see. Let's see what happens in the next 10 minutes with Annie Howe. So, Craig, this is where I think picking your brains is so fascinating, why it's so great to have you here. You're a three-time Ironman world champion, two-time Ironman 70.3 world champion. The mind of someone at the level of Annie Haug. So she seemed to deal with that calmly. She was still thinking cognitively by putting, the, putting it down her shirt. Where is her head at right now? What is she thinking? What is her plan? Take us inside the mind. I think she's just, it's business as usual, Jack. She's, she's back on task. Um, there's some things that are just out of your control. And no doubt in the debrief, there'll be, we can still see a little bit of plastic hanging off the back of her bike there. Um, there's some things that happen in races oh, that no. Just, oh, no. Oh, no. What is that? It's, it's unravelling. I mean, she's, they're on the line. They've got 11 unraveling. kilometres to transition. Oh, what is going on? Oh, no. Unravelling is exactly the word. She doesn't know where it is. She can feel it. Oh, oh it's in there again. It's happened again. Wait, no, this has to be a replay, doesn't it? It can't have happened again. We've that, got... Yeah, it has. Yeah, this has to be the replay. So we're seeing, oh, we're seeing right. what happened. We all freaked out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we, uh, the truck lords never warned us about that. Heart, skip, heart has <laughs> skipped a beat. Oh, that would have been... So it wasn't something she picked up on the road is what we've seen on that replay. It's a piece of plastic that's wrapped around her bike I, I'm not sure whether it was something that was keeping something on her seat post there, but it's it's come off her bike and it's it's come loose and then it's wrapped down around her rear cassette and got stuck on both sides of her rear cassette and her disc brake. So, which makes sense. If it's come off her bike, she had to pick it up. Otherwise, it's littering. So, um, but back to your question, I, I think she is such a seasoned pro, mentally tough. No doubt in the debrief, there may be some emotion, but in the moment, I think she'll just get back on task. She knows, she knows the job ahead of us. She needs to close out this bike as best as she can and then do what she does best. Does any panic set in? Look, I think the more experienced you are, the more you learn to deal with those situations. Potentially, she may have been panicking before she realized what was going on. Um, I think once she got, saw what was going on, what the situation was and that she could fix it, she just got down to business and fixed it. Um, I don't think she didn't look panicked. I think she just, as I said, she just got back 
on the bike as quickly as possible. I don't think she has panicked, to be honest with you. I think maybe in the race debrief, it'll be something, it'll be a topic of conversation for sure. But right now, she's just trying to close this bike out. But, Craig, what about Ashley Gentle? She saw that happening. She'll be, at some point, getting some information. Does that at all alter her, uh, the, the, the way she's going about her bike at the moment, perhaps? Well, the first thing I want to say is these women all have a great camaraderie. So nobody on course would have been happy to see oh, and how stationary with a mechanical like that. Again, Ash is a total pro. She will just she knows the job that she has to do. I don't think it changes her tactics at all. She's paced this bike beautifully. She knows what she has to do in the run. I don't think anything changes for Ash Gentle. Under 10 kilometers now to transition Jack, where they will park up the bikes and take to a foot race. I think something that that incident would have caused is when Ash Gentle sees her gap, it will both motivate her and make her calm. It means that she can more comfortably settle into her pace and her rhythm and not feel like she has to run faster than what she maybe is potentially capable of holding early in the run. We saw at the US Open, Ashley Gentle, um, she told us after the race that she felt she just went out a little too hard and maybe burnt some bridges for the back end of the run. So when she sees the gap to Annie Haug, who, make no mistakes, Annie Haug in Ashley Gentle's mind is her main competition. So seeing that gap having extended, it will really calm Ashley Gentle and allow her to settle into her own rhythm and her own pace. She will see Lucy Charles Barclay and Imogen Simmons and Sarah Perez Sala Craig, but do you think she'll be worried about them and their gap or will she really be focusing on the gap of three minutes to Annie Haug? I 100% she'll be just focused on the three minutes to Annie Haug. I mean, she has the utmost respect for these other women, but when we're looking at the nuts and bolts of their recent form and their past history, their running abilities. Um, and I agree with what you say. I mean, it won't be lost on Ash what happened. And it probably gives her a, a little sense of calm in that I think one of the things when you hop off the bike and start running, you get that little spike in heart rate, you feel a little uncomfortable, you've been on the bike for two hours, and it, it will bring a sense of calm. Um, she won't panic, and, and she's typically not one to panic. John talked about her composure and her calmness before, but knowing that potentially her main rival, and, and actually not potentially, her main rival when it got to this 18K run has just lost a couple of minutes. I think it'll enable her to just to run a little bit easier and it will, it will bring some calm the first three or four minutes, that uncomfortable three or four minutes when you first dismount and head out on the run course. I know we'll talk about it as the race goes, but I really want to know what that was that got stuck on Annie Haug's uh, rear wheel. Whether it was, was, it looked to me like maybe it was a little bit of, um, yeah, like tape, sort of spare rim tape or something like that. Uh, maybe she had it there in case she had a mechanical. Very interesting. Let's definitely try and um, maybe get, get a word on that so we can fill everyone in. Crowy, there is a bit of a, another battle taking place here as well, and that's the battle uh, where Chelsea Sadaru, Jocelyn McCauley, Radka Kalafelt, Rebecca Clark, they're all about five minutes down. So the battle for the podium is also going to be just as interesting as this battle out in front. Just so many things happening today on this bike course, and this is why we were so excited about this bike course once we all figured out how hard it was going to be yesterday. It's turned into a war of attrition out there, and, and you're right, Jocelyn McCauley, Radka Kalafelt, they, they are not losing much time to these leaders. From the last split we got at four and a half minutes, we're now getting a split of about four minutes, 50 seconds. So they're holding pace well. So there are definitely races going on within the race. And and also Lucy Charles Barkley, Imogen Simmons, Sarah Perez Sala. I mean, the three of those athletes, they're together. They're about to hit the run course together. So there's another little battle race within the race that we can keep our eye on. looking focused and composed as she brings the bike home in a just over seven kilometers. Ashley Gentle leads the race here at the PTO Asian Open. Still looking good, John. Little bit more upper body movement than we saw last time, but we're coming to the very end of this bike ride now. I think she still looks good. I think the cadence is still good. She's on a, a slight uphill section here. You know, this heat and humidity, it, it wears you down. But as gentle, we've seen she's been very, very disciplined with her nutrition intake. Um, she's coming over the, 
the Benjamin Shears Bridge for, I want to say, the last time here. And, and we drove over it yesterday in a taxi. It is, it's a pinch. It is, yeah. And it's a long bridge as well. Longest here in Singapore. But it's with that visual there, Crowe, the skyline that she sees, she knows she's coming in to transition now. It's a, a very good cue. Once she knows she's over that bridge, it's not far to go. It's gonna, only going to get easier before she starts uh, getting ready to run this one out. And here we're seeing Imogen Simmons make a little move late in the bike. 40 seconds back of Ash Gentle now. What a great move by Imogen Simmons. She has paced this bike beautifully. The thing about PTO races, Craig, is that they always throw up a surprise. There's never been a PTO race where there hasn't been someone who's sort of, to, to everyone else, almost come out of left field. Is Imogen Simmons that person? Gentle taking on a gel before she gets into transition, but the our producers are telling us them we see them coming into T2 now, and I think we'll see all the athletes start to get their nutrition on board. We just saw Ash Gentle take a gel, um, and to your point, Jack, yes, that's the great thing about racing. That's why we don't run the races on paper. Recent form is it's a good guide. But there's always people who level up. There's people who don't race up their expectation. And that's the fun part of racing. We are seeing that Annie Haug has put about 10 seconds back into that gap as well, Ashley Gentle. Crowe, is Ashley Gentle sort of, now that Imogen Simmons has put a bit of time back into her, Annie Haug has put a little bit of time back into her, has she made a decision to sort of go back into her power, her tempo? Is her mind now on the run in this last six kilometres? Oh, absolutely. I think her mind's been on the run for a little while now making sure she's getting the nutrition on board, staying hydrated, keeping the cadence up. She's just cresting that bridge now. She still looks great. Doesn't seem to be any sort of stress or strain on her face. Maybe she has come off the throttle just a little, Jack. Um, but yeah, her mind will be firmly focused on, you know, the next five minutes of her race and, and getting out on that run course, getting into a nice rhythm. To me, it looks the same. It looks like taking in that nutrition. She, she really cooled off, put some water on her back. It looks like she settled down a little bit. Keep in mind, it's 6 p.m. here local time, and it's still 30 degrees and 86% humidity. Jack, did you just call me Craig before? <laughs> Craig, Crowey. Sometimes, sometimes I get a bit formal. That's what my mum calls me. Sorry, sir. Crowey, to me, Annie Haag doesn't look like she is necessarily putting in a huge attack here. She still does look like she's staying relatively, um, maybe within her, within her tempo. And I think she's probably also thinking about the run now rather than trying to panic and, and bridge this gap. Is that how you're seeing this? Oh, absolutely. She's playing the long game here. She knows she's not going to erase that deficit in the last 5K of the bike. Um, and her best chance to get back on the podium and, and get back in the contest is... Um, again, just playing the long game and, and, and doing it deep in that run. So there's no panic from Annie Howick here. She's a total professional. That was terribly unfortunate what happened, but she's got her head back in the game, and I think she's just thinking run course, lay down the best run split that I can. Yeah, you can see through that corner... Ashley Gentle definitely isn't attacking those corners like she was in the first four or five laps. She's getting her shoe here ready for transition about to arm. She's just sort of setting up her shoe so that she can easily transition out, loosen them off a little bit to make it a little bit easier. Her mind is definitely on this 18K run. Anna Haug still looks great. We see her getting some nutrition on board there. Her position on the bike coming up sort of, still not at the crest. She was on a slight false flat uphill there. She still looks great too. So she's still in this fight. Now we see the dismount line. Ashley Gentle will be the first into T2 as she leaps off the bike. Let's just keep eyes on the efficiency of this stop. You learn a lot the first few steps off the bike. She looks good. She looks fluent. Fluid, should I say. Imogen Simmons is the one who's fluent in five <laughs> languages. Multiple languages. Ashley Gentle actually looks fluid. That's actually a good joke from you, Craig. Oh, that's unfair. Oh, he's had me in stitches all week. <laughs> no offence, Jack, in case you were wondering. 
Opted okay. for s enough time to put the socks on. Yeah, she looks like she's done this 10,000 times before. Hurry slowly, as they say in transition. <laughs> do all the things that you need to do. Grab the nutrition. Grab the sunnies. Get the socks on. She looks great, Ash. Great leg turnover straight out of the gate. Looks composed too, Crowley, as we see Imogen Simmons here wow. in second place. How many people had Imogen second, Simmons coming in second into transition two today? I'm not sure. I don't think many. So what, what a bike ride from Imogen. Yeah, that's a fantastic bike ride. She paced that beautifully. She goes for the socks as well. Decent layer of sweat on these athletes, isn't there, given the humidity and the effort. Yeah, I want to say, as we see Lucy Charles Barkley come into, into T2, the temperature may have dropped slightly, but the humidity is still off the charts. So we know of these three that Ashley Gentle was the one who grew up in the hottest, most humid conditions. And if we um, take our minds back to the PTO US Open in 2022, one of the hottest races we've ever seen, Ashley Gentle was by far the athlete who dealt with those conditions yeah. the best. So. I think that's something to really keep an eye on out of out of these front few women who handles this heat and humidity the best. Yeah, and I think Imogen Simmons has spent a lot of time in Thailand training and in Asia, so I think she will handle these conditions well. I was interested to see Lucy Charles Barkley go for the visor there that had the cooling mechanism on the top, which a lot of the athletes opt for. As we're getting some vision of Ash here. So do give us a, your thoughts on the surface here because it was raining pretty hard earlier and you guys w were talking about the barriers and maybe negotiating the course but is there anything that, that these athletes need to consider or is or am I overcooking it? No I, I think when when it rained earlier it was definitely a consideration on these pavers they get slippery and, and the shoes that these athletes wear they're not as grippy they're built for speed and performance um, but I think it's, it's really dried off. We haven't had rain for three three or four hours here, so I don't think it's going to be as much it of an issue. It was biblical, by the way, before the broadcast. It, you probably can't get a sense of that, but, yeah, it, we, were, we were going for shelter. Annie Hag here into T2, John and Crowey. So she's actually only 2 minutes 30 behind Ashley Gentle. Keep in mind, wow. after that incident, she was 3 minutes 10 seconds back. So she's made up 40 seconds since that incident. Yeah. And she looks great. She looked great running off the bike there. Sorry, running the bike in. Be interesting to see. It's always good to look at the techniques as they head out on the course. Those who can get into hip extension early, get that leg turnover going. Anne looks great running out. She, Anne Hard there, has looked the best out of yep. anyone we've seen into T2, both in and out. Crowley, I want to say that Ashley Gentle looks amazing here. Like, I'd pay someone a million dollars if I could look like Ashley Gentle when I was running. But maybe maybe doesn't look 10 out of 10 like i think that bike has taken something out of her she she still looks fantastic and and she looks like she's running really efficiently and fast but maybe not to ashley gentle's absolute peak versus we saw Ash, uh, Arnie Haug look amazing at a t2 so this early run battle is going to be absolutely amazing yeah we're going to learn a lot in the first few kilometers here we'll, we'll see the pacing i think ash looks good her leg turnover is good i think she has expended some energy on the bike but she's still looking composed. Annie Haug looked great. So I can't wait until we start getting some splits in off the course to, just to see what's, what's actually transpiring out here. So just a reminder for those of you at home, it is an 18 kilometer run, three loops of six. It travels out around the Marina Bay, passing the very popular nature park, the gardens by the bay. And when we ran that, we all got as close as we could to the doors of that because we've got a little cooling effect. I'm sure that the athletes will notice that as they take the laps out. There are a few, well, there are three aid stations around this course as well, which I'm sure these athletes will be taking advantage of before they come back through transition. And of course, the finish line for big PTO points and prizes. This early part of the run course is another part of the course where the athletes will, will get a visual on each other. So Ash will see Imogen Simmons She'll also see Sarah Perez Seller and Lucy Charles Barkley. And of course, she'll see Annie Haug. So this first little loop, as we see Lucy Charles Barkley here looking good. Um, we can see Imogen Simmons up in the distance there, probably 10 to 12 seconds ahead. Sometimes these long shots are a little deceptive, but Lucy looks good. Her leg turnover looks good. So interested to see what kind of a run Lucy can lay down here. 
We have seen a comeback from these extended layoffs and, and perform well in races, notably the, the 2019 70.3 World Championships, which was possibly one of her best ever performances. Um, and she did the same thing at the ITU World Long Course Championships last year in summer. And so <clears throat> she will definitely believe that she can get one of these podium spots up for grabs today. What I'm seeing here on screen, I actually think Ashley Gentle is looking better and better and better. I thought she was looked a little less smooth when she came out of T2, but I think she's actually, every time I'm seeing her, looking better and better and she better. She looks great. Yeah. She, she looks great. As we see Chelsea Sidaro come in into T2, and, and Chelsea's noted as one of the better runners in the field as well, and she still looks good. So, um, Lots of activity, lots of support there as well, which is great to see for the athletes. Real encouragement as they come out of transition and go on to their run. Thousands of athletes will be competing here, and it's just wonderful for them to see how the very best do it. Sometimes the head-on shots are deceptive. I like to look at their facial expression, the athletes, and often the side shot, you get more of an indication of how they're moving, how their posture is, their arm carriage, that kind of thing, hip extension. And I want to say Ash's turnover looks good here. She's been super encouraged recently by the performances of the Matildas, echoed by Lucy Charles Barkley. And both of those women were talking about a golden era or era depending on where you're listening in the world, for women's sports and how it's just rising to the fore. And in, in our sports of triathlon, you know, these are two of the women that we love to march out to the media and say, just look at these, the ultimate endurance athletes uh, and, and what they're capable of. Uh, these women are both world-class athletes. And, you know, it was interesting watching the Women's World Cup for soccer, which was being hosted jointly by Australia and New Zealand. When the Matildas played, talking about the popularity popularity of women's sport, their last two matches were the two most watched television sporting events in history in Australia. In Australia, that's wonderful to hear. And not by a little bit, by a lot. So to compare that, our men's AFL grand final, 3.5 million viewers. The Matildas, 7 million. That's unreal. It really is. And John, that's, that's something that I've always loved about triathlon. Women's triathlon has always been so high level, like equally as good and popular as the men's. And right now, my favorite battles in triathlon are Ashley Gentle versus Taylor Nib, Ashley Gentle versus Annie Haug. I just think women's triathlon is so oh. amazing right now. Oh no, Ashley Gentle not happy there through the aid station, shrugged her shoulders as we eye the transition times. And it was Ashley Gentle with the fastest transition out of those that you see on the screen right now, Lucy Charles Barkley. She was a couple seconds down, a very efficient transition from her. Amelia Watkinson at the same time as LCB. Look at LCB making time up on Imogen Simmons here. This is a great little battle within the battle. Um, yeah, interestingly, Ash wasn't able to get one of those sponges or some fluid at that last aid station. And uh, let's keep an eye on that because there yeah, are... How key is that? I want to say not super key at this point. Um, it's only going to be about one to two kilometers until the next aid station, but you really want to manage your core body temperature and your pace very carefully. I mean, this is the part of the, the race where your heart rate goes up the most. Um, you're the most fatigued. You, you, your blood volume is the lowest. Your body's still trying to cool itself. So getting that, that water over the head, the sponge, it helps. It gives you like 15 or 20 seconds of reprieve each time. Crowley, as we see the percentage of max heart rate here of Ashley Gentle, Lucy Charles Barclay and Annie Haug, I think the most notable thing here that we're seeing is that Lucy Charles and Annie Haug's looks about the same as it was on the bike. Ashley Gentle's has actually come down, it's lower. Now to me, that speaks to how efficient Ashley Gentle is as a runner and how strong she is as a runner. So relatively, her heart rate is lower on the run compared to the bike. Is that how you see it as well? I think that's a great pickup because typically we see the highest heart rates in the run. So it could speak to the way Ashley paced her race and her, her pacing strategy to put in that extra effort on the bike, which we talked about, or it could just talk about her supreme fitness in the run, meaning she's very, very efficient at these higher heart rates and higher 
zones of exercise. We are seeing that Ashley Gentle is the fastest runner on course as well right now. So she's actually pushed that gap out a little bit on Annie Haug. So she's now two minutes, 48 seconds up on Annie Haug, but into T2 off the bike, she was actually um, only 2.30 ahead of Annie Haug. So she's put 18 seconds into Annie Haug in the first two kilometers, which I think none of us expected, but she clearly is feeling great on this run with the percentage of max heart rate coming down, yet she's actually the fastest mover on course. Yeah, I think we're seeing just how comfortable, and I use the term relatively because no one's super comfortable out there, but how comfortable Ash Gentle is racing in these conditions as we see Lucy Giles Barkley pulling up on the shoulder of Imogen Simmons here and loving the race of both of these women today. They've just been consistent across the board. Um, early stages of the run here as we see the athletes running past one of the landmarks in Singapore. So, Crowe into T2, Imogen Simmons had caught back up and was only 30 seconds behind Ash Gentle. Lucy Charles Barclay was one minute down on Ash Gentle. They're now both one minute 30 seconds down on Ashley Gentle. So, there the ladies run past the gardens at the bay. I think I remember it's around this point where they get a nice gust of air condition coming out of the doors there. Yeah, that'll be a nice little moment of reprieve as we see Els Visser come into, into T2. Well, it's, I think you mentioned it, Jack. Ashley's face, she just looked composed at the start of that run. She wasn't really mouth breathing. I mean, she just looked comfortable and composed and she settled into her work very nicely here. I'm, I'm really excited to see these athletes get out to the run turn and the marina barrage go up over that elevated walkway it's i think the most fun part of this run course today we're going to get incredible views back to the singapore skyline but also it's going to be a very pivotal part of this run yeah so crowy right now um ashley gentle annie Haug, lucy but charles barclay they're on the portion of the run course that takes them out to a climb which is at the very end of the run course the climb actually acts as a u-turn on the race course so instead of a cone they go up a climb they wrap around it and then they come back down the climb and it's extremely steep and another thing to note is that it's super hot up on the climb so when you go up on the climb you you don't get any wind there so it's a really hot brutal part of the run course and they're running out towards that now yeah, absolutely. It's it's kind of like a dead zone out there. You you come off the water a little bit. There is no breeze at all to speak of. Um, there wasn't much to start today either. I think they had like six kilometres uh, an hour at, at one point, I think when race started, but it doesn't seem to have changed much at all. Yeah, so it's, it's an important part of the course. And then these athletes have done extensive course reconnaissance out here. You're obviously running up over that elevated walkway, so your heart rate goes up, maybe not as much cooling there. So definitely a part of the course just to watch the pacing so Ashley Gentle who we don't have on camera right now but she has extended the gap to these two in Lucy Charles Barclay and Image and Simmons by a further eight seconds and she's ironically eight seconds as well she's extended to Alan Hagen is now out to two minutes 54 on her so it does appear like Ashley Gentle is having one of the runs of her life she's she's got something to prove a little bit well not to us uh, for sure she is the, the queen of the pto but she hasn't won a pto tour race this year and as much as she's been racing so brilliantly as we get out to this point has she passed the climb at that point fellas i think she has no i she? think she's up on the climb she's, she's on the actually climb? on the high point of the marina barrage now she's about to make the little descent and she goes round hopefully she's got a bit of time to, to look back at the city skyline and see one of the the great views she's coming down now so she she will actually see and Imogen and Lucy weren't that far away from this point when we last saw them so she will see them as she's coming off this elevated walkway and she just looks fantastic huh? yeah and just to finish the point like this is a great opportunity now to get that win in 2023 as we see the transition zone under the shadow of the skyline All athletes have gone through transition. They're all out on the run course, as we see Ashley Gentle. Looking super strong on the run. This could be the opportunity for her before she closes out her season to get that win on, UFC, on the PTO here. 
after the US Open, another second. What did you see there, Crowey? I think we just saw, as Ash was coming off the turnaround, we saw Annie Halg run into the Marina Barrage. So there's some separation there. Both these women know exactly what the distance is. Um, I just think Ash looks comfortable. She looks composed. I mean, again, I use the word comfortable, relatively speaking. It's a thousand percent humidity out there, so it's it's not comfortable. But as we see Lucy Charles Barclay up the top of the, the Marina Barrage elevated walkway, she's having a good run. Um, so she's just, again, showing her versatility and, and consistency across all the disciplines. And, and um, toughness, if we remember, she's coming off of that fracture in her foot as well. Yeah, well, she's a, t she's a tough athlete. All these women are tough. We're talking about the best endurance athletes in the world, and they are no strangers to pushing themselves and overcoming adversity. As we see Ash now, she's, yeah, the cadence, the turnover, she looks good. She just looks, looks comfortable. I keep using that word. Maybe I shouldn't. Crowley, I think compared to the PTO US Open two weeks ago, I actually think... And I, I don't know how this is possible, but I actually think Ashley Gentle looks better on the run today than she did then. And I'm, I think maybe it speaks to how well she deals with these conditions and maybe the lessons she learnt on the bike. So in the last 20 kilometres in the bike in the US Open, she really overbiked and blew herself up a little bit. Whereas what we saw in the last 20 kilometres is she was happy to let Annie Haug and Imogen Simmons bite back into that gap and get a bit of time back on her. But she prepared for the run. run. She settled into her tempo. She took on nutrition. She cooled herself down. And I think she's reaping the rewards of that early on the bike now. As we see Annie Haug here running right at the far end of the run course, and I want to say she still looks good. She's still ticking over a nice cadence. Um, to your point, Jackie, yeah, I think I think that's what the great athletes do. Every race is is a, a learning opportunity where you fine tune your craft. Um, you take the good things, you take the lessons, and then you implement them moving forward. So. I do think there was a little bit of a change in strategy for her. Uh, maybe she wanted to get the hard work on the bike in a little bit earlier and focus just more so on getting the, the heart rate down a little, getting some nutrition on board, keep the body cool as she came into, into T2 this week. So Annie Haug in fourth. She lost 19 seconds to Gentle in the first just under three and a half K, but she gained... About 12 seconds on Lucy Charles Barkley in the same amount of time. And we're just getting word that Sarah Prosella has a penalty. I'm not sure about what, what the penalty was for, but typically 30 seconds, is it, Crowey, typically for a, for a penalty? But we'll find out what the infringement was and, and get back to you on that. Absolutely. We need to clarify this. Obviously, different penalties for different infringements. So we'll, we'll get some word there and get back to you on that one as we see Lucy Charles Barkley coming back by the gardens, by the bay. So Ashley Gentle has taken an extra 10 seconds off Lucy Charles. She's now 1 minute 50 um, in the lead on Lucy Charles Barkley. Annie Hargs back out to three minutes. Keep in mind, at the, at the worst, she got 3 minutes 15 seconds down behind Ashley Gentle. She then got that back up to 2.30, but is now back to three minutes. We're also getting word off the course that Ellie Salthouse has DNF'd. So very, un very unfortunate for Ellie coming off a great race for her in Milwaukee two weeks ago. So we're going to take a look at the run sectors here. On the bike, we had two sectors. On the run, we've got three sectors. Now, th I think there's some interesting things about all three of these sectors. Two of the sectors are largely flat and one of them is quite technical, one of them is just flat and fast flowing running, one of them has the climb and the descent in it. So on these three sectors we're going to get reg regular check-ins on who's the fastest on course in all three sectors. The most crucial of them is the one with the climb, then probably the, the fast flowy one, then the technical one. Everyone's going to run quite similarly through the technical section, the big gaps will be made in the other two sectors. So Ashley Gentle leads the PTO Asian Open. Lucy Charles Barkley in second. Imogen Simmons in third. We see Ashley here just coming back towards the end of the first lap of the run. It's the Helix Bridge 
in the background as well there. The grandstand, of course, the famous F1 race, night race here in Singapore. The triathletes have been racing all around the footprints of that Grand Prix course. They take centre stage this weekend. But there are, there's livery up, suggesting that the F1 will be in town soon. Ash Gentle still looking good here, John. She's completed one third of the run course now, coming up to in about five or 600 metres the end of the first lap. And again, at the end of each lap, all the athletes, they get a visual on, on where they are, how they're tracking compared to their nearest competitors. The splits we're getting is that Ash has nearly two minutes on, on Lucy Charles Barkley, a minute 49, and Imogen Simmons having a great race, um, two minutes back. So she's about 10, she's lost about 10 seconds to Charles Barkley there. And Annie Haug still holding strong at about three minutes. So I believe the infringement from Sarah perez Sala was uh, equipment not put back in the bucket. So I think that she will serve a 30 second penalty for that. She is in fifth place as it stands. 3.35 behind Ashley Gentle, who is currently running alongside the Marina Bay in and amongst the ref restaurants, bars, and shops, lots of support out on the race course for the athletes. Wonderful to see. How much does this help when things start to hurt? Immensely. Um, I think every athlete gets a lift when they run through the sections where the crowd are. Um, you know, Ashley's she's got her mind on the job here. She knows she's covered a one lap of three, two laps to go, but it is it is a it momentarily takes your mind off the pain. So what we've seen, John, on the hillier section, so the uphill and downhill section, Ashley Gentle did take about 10 seconds into Han Hug. So she ran the, the uphill and the downhill quite a bit faster. But then on the faster, flowy running section that you, you get after you come down that hill, Han Hug's just held the gap. And it's held there for about a K and a half. So we did see, see Ashley um, build that gap a little bit up the hill. But on the flats, we're seeing them run pretty similarly. Also getting some information that Chelsea Sodaro is running very well. In fact, a little bit quicker than Haug at this point. She's currently in sixth, about 5.44 back. But chances for her to come top five if she continues to have a good run. She's, she's quite a way back to third, so she's about three and a half minutes back to third, John, but she is running just about 10 seconds um, every five kilometres faster than even Annie Haug at the moment, only Ash Gentle moving faster than her. So if she does keep that up, she actually will definitely run up to contend for third and fourth. That's a battle to watch towards the end of the run. She's won Kona in the, the hottest conditions on the planet, maybe aside from Singapore. So something to watch, watch is that I think Chelsea Sedara will be strong late in the run and that's really going to show itself and something to focus on. But for now, the battle between Ashley Gentle, Lucy Charles Barclay and Ani Haug is, is where it's at. We're seeing a little bit of the strain of this effort show on, on Ash's face right now. I don't think she looks as as comfortable as she did heading out as she goes for some more nutrition. Again, Crowey, I found when we ran the course together last night, I found this part of the course really hot. It's quite still there, and I felt that through this, this long flat section here into the corner that we're about to come up to, I felt really hot and humid, and, and it was, I felt like it was actually a deceptively tough part of this run course. Yeah, absolutely. The, the heat and humidity... You just you can cut the humidity with a knife here, and this is a particularly hot part of the course. We do see a little bit of tree coverage, but you know, I think the ease with which Ash looks and, and all the top women, it it doesn't tell the tale of actually how tough these conditions are. I, I think these women are performing at an exceptionally high level, given the the heat and humidity, which normally absolutely wreaks havoc with endurance events, endurance sports performance. It's it's enemy number one and two, humidity and heat. 
Honestly, I just love how the PTO events in the last fortnight have like highlighted and showcased just how good the women are at the pointy end at this distance right now. Like Ashley Gentle is just, she might be the number one specialist at this distance. She just is so consistent. She doesn't have bad races at this distance. She won two races last year. She's come second in, in the two that we've had this year. She's in the lead of this one. She's just an absolutely like exceptional athlete at this distance. She's an exceptional athlete at a lot of distances, but particularly this distance. Coach Dan Lorang, who coaches uh, Lucy Charles Barkley and Annie Haug, is saying that he's happy to see Lucy running well, uh, but suggesting that Haug might be a little bit tired or frustrated after the bike incident. So just a little behind the curtain conversation that's going on. Ashley Gentle's percentage of max heart rate has gone up a little bit, about 4 or 5% than what it was from the start of the run. Lucy Charles Barclay has stayed exactly the same, which probably suggests to me that she's running at the exact same intensity and feeling pretty similar as we see her make the, the cross with Ashley Gentle there to get a gap. And um, she, that, that gap's about two minutes, so quite a, quite a big gap there. Annie Harg's percentage of max heart rate has been the lowest of all these three women all day and it's sat at about 80 to 84 percent and it's right there which again probably suggests that she's running nice and controlled and just running her tempo as we see her make the pass with with ash gentle there crowey yeah hands turnover was was great there so you're right ashley gentle's percentage of max heart rate has gone up more than four or five percent i want to say it was 80 percent when we last looked at it it's now 90 percent so her effort level's gone up a little and he still looks great she still looks good um, the leg turnover, that, that's the, the normal arm carriage we see from her. Elbows not really tucked in down the side. It's, a, it's an efficient and effective run, run style. And, uh, I, she's getting a, a bit of a side up ahead, I think. Is that Imogen Simmons we can see coming into the frame? Yeah, Imogen Simmons is just there, Crowey. She's about, that gap there is about 150 metres. So about 25 seconds roughly is that gap. And she's also in only about a minute's time. As you, if you look across that grass field, you'll be able to see Lucy Charles Barclay running through the trees on the far end of the screen. So when Lucy Charles turns around, her and Annie Hag are going to run straight past each other, and Anna Hag's going to get a real clear up. Or oh, Craig, we've just seen Annie Hag make a really decisive decision to stop and pull it, collect that bottle there. A smart decision. Um, she pulled up pretty hard, though. It was a quick, decisive decision, wasn't it? Yeah, I think that's the, the actual aid station that it's special needs for the athletes. Right. They can put their own um, nutrition in there. and. But she looked like she only went for a bottle of water in the end. Yeah, well, we can see something tucked in down the back of her race suit there. It's possibly her, her gels, I would suggest, her race nutrition. Um, you know, sometimes you give up a second or two to, to make that stop at the aid station, which you'll get that return on investment a little bit later where you save a few minutes and, and possibly save yourself a sit under a tree somewhere. So as we see in this picture here, Lucy Charles Barclay at the far left, Imogen Simmons Justice in, the, appeared, in yeah. the middle, Annie Haag on the far right. The gap between Annie Haag on the far right and Lucy Charles Barclay on the far left is about 160, 170 metres there on that part of the course. Imogen Simmons splits them both in the middle, about 80 metres behind Lucy, about 80 metres in front of Aunt Haag. You're good at that, Jack, looking hard. Did you pace that out when we were running yesterday? So I've actually, <laughs> this is a very funny thing in triathlon. Secret training is a big part of it. I made a constant, so I've been around the PTO races two weeks ago and this week, I've decided I'm gonna do one next year. Um, so I'm starting training again. I've actually ran this run course five times since we've been here and I've made a real conscious decision to sort of, so that I can talk about it a little bit better. So yeah. There you go. So anyone who wants to race next year, we side by side to give uh, Jack a run for his money. The big man moves well. And I think what's interesting about the race as it's unfolding, what we're seeing right now is, I think a lot of the experts would agree that Ashley Gentle, Annie Haug, and Lucy Charles Barkley were, were three of the, the big favorites as we see Chelsea Sedaro cross Annie Haug there. And, but just like in Milwaukee two weeks ago, not the way we expected it to pan out. Exactly, we talked about this so, Myself, Marinda Carfra and Craig Alexander, we had a conversation during the week and we spoke about how the US Open, it played out exactly how we expected in terms of results and completely differently in terms of dynamics and mechanics of the race. 
and everyone was picking Ashley Gentle, Lucy Charles Barclay, Annie Hag were going to be the three to watch. And when we see Arn Hag makes it, make this pass on Image and Simmons here, we're going to have Ashley Gentle in the lead, Lucy Charles Barclay in second, and Annie Hag in third. But they've got there in such a different way than any of us expected. We just saw Annie Hag run past the Olympic rings there. Of course, she's been to the Olympic Games. That, that might give her a little bit of inspiration as she's coming up rapidly onto the shoulder of Image and Simmons here. Still with great leg turnover. You can hear specific shouts as well for, for Annie from the crowd. Great to see the support that these athletes are getting. There was such great feedback from Milwaukee. And it looks like we're going to hear it all over again from the athletes when they finish up here in Singapore. And of course, tomorrow, the men will be the ones to take to the course. And they'll be getting some feedback from their female compatriots to see just what it was like, what to expect. I'm sure they're listening and watching right now. As we see Anne about to make the pass on Imogen, and this is such an incredible race venue, John. It's very special, isn't it? The whole area is very special, but to, to race here around these streets. We see Imogen give Anne a little pat on the back there. She makes the pass. Great camaraderie between these women. They've known each other and raced each other for a long time. But yeah, Singapore just do big events so well. This is an incredible venue. I guess Anne will now set her sights on Lucy Charles Barclay. She's always the chaser, isn't she, when she comes through eating up the pavement. And she's got the Louis Vuitton building on her left. Some real striking architecture out here. Perhaps gift herself some new luggage to go home with. I, I noticed in the uh, commentary during Milwaukee, Marinda was talking about treating yourself 10% luxury tax. You can take 10% uh, of your prize That's winnings right. and some great shopping malls here, I noticed. Singapore really is like, it's luxury, isn't it? <laughs> yes. That's the word that after being here for the first time, luxury. It's high end, it's clean. It really is wonderful. That's the iconic art science museum that you see there. Those 10 fingers actually channel rainwater for recycling. Wonderful thing. So we're now seeing the gap between Ashley Gentle and Annie Haag, John, get back to what it was prior, um, directly after Annie Haag had that sort of mechanical or um, bike incident that we saw. It is holding a little bit more steadily now, so keep in mind, Ashley Gentle got 30 seconds on Arg very quickly out of T2, and then it's just held there for about the last three kilometres. So now the uh, we're about to see Annie Haag make the pass on Lucy Charles Barclay, and then the battle begins. Do we see that gap hold? Do we see Ashley Gentle falter, or do we see Annie Haag pick things up? This is a wonderful image of the the course around Marina Bay. They will be running alongside the the water on the left of screen, all the way up into that top left-hand corner where they come back down, and it's all in the shadow of. The wonderful Marina Bay Sands, Annie Haug has closed in on Lucy Charles Barkley and she makes her pass. She just looks so good, John. Like I know I said it about Ash Gentle, I'd probably pay a million dollars if I had it to look like her when I ran. The same thing goes for uh, Annie Haug there as we see her make the pass on Lucy Charles Barkley. Lucy Charles Barkley not running slow for everyone watching as well. She's actually still running really well. Um, she's running not too much different to everyone else in the race. It's just that Annie Haug and Ashley Gentle are running so much faster. Wow, look at Ash. She just looks relaxed, composed, in the zone. Got to see she's got a gel there, carrying a gel in her in her left hand. That's the thing, Chloe. She's been right on top of her nutrition, cooling and hydration all day as we see her taking on her second gel for the run already. tight, windy course around these parts, gents. Yeah, she's just heading out to the far end of the run course, about to go up that elevated walkway again, my favourite part of the course. Very challenging. The heart rates will go up, and then they come back, and we'll be, I'll be interested to see if they 
her and Annie will get eyes on one another at that part. As Lucy Charles Barkley just sees Annie Haug running away from her at the moment. Lucy's having a great race. I think she's having a great race. We've talked often about how often sometimes the athletes get categorized because of a, a particular strength that they may have, but she's such a well-rounded athlete. She was talking about the strength of her run in the last race where she in fact uh, endured that fracture. I mean, adrenaline is just such a, <laughs> such a great uh, band-aid for the injury. So she's very confident about her run coming into this one. It was just such a shame that she had to nurse that injury and we haven't been able to see her to her best and doesn't seem to be troubling her at the moment too much. Of course, we don't know. That is pure speculation. No, she still looks good. She looks very similar to how she looked a lap ago. Uh, and that's always a good indication. The wear and tear on the run technique, the biomechanics, um, as we see Ash making her way up. And there's a little bit of breeze up there. That would be nice respite, welcome relief for the athletes. A little bit of breeze. The breeze has picked up here, and that's perfect timing for the athletes out on this run course. So that's Ashley Gentle now at the very top of that climb. We caught her about three quarters up that climb there. We missed the first three quarters of that climb. It's very steep at the bottom, which, which is something that we didn't catch. But you could see that she was sort of laboring a little bit with how steep it was. She's now along a plateau at the top. So there's a flat section where you go around the U-turn. So this is, this is sort of acting as a giant cone to take you on the U-turn back the other way on the run course and just here on this left hand side of it is where the descent starts and you go down that descent which is about 200 meters long all the way and, and start going back towards transition. Such a contrast up there as well families mm. just laid back enjoying themselves couldn't be more relaxed and then the top athletes in the world absolutely charging through the course. I was just thinking the same thing but what a great spot to watch the race with the family as yeah. we see and making her way towards the marina barrage so her and ashley will cross paths very very soon yeah just eager to see as it gets quite tight round there whether they indeed will get good eyes on one another And there's the pass. Yeah, and I think it's, I mean, Ash is, she's just in total control of this race right now. She looks like she's still turning those legs over very well. Um, doesn't seem to be too much stress and strain on her face as all well as we see Imogen Simmons head out the other way. Um, be interesting to see Annie Haug's tactics now because I think with, what, well over half distance of the run course now covered, yeah, lap two. Does With she push 10K on? Covered. Um, of course, she wants to create some separation to the women behind her, but at some point, um, she's going to run out of real estate. Uh, she, she will run hard. She will run out. And, uh, and this is a decision that potentially she'll make on the third lap. So Annie Haug has pulled five seconds back on Ashley Gentle. We're about to get an update on screen that after 10K, Annie Haug is three minutes down on Ashley Gentle. When they crossed paths then, it was just a battle of the Titans. Two absolute Terminators who looked so good running past each other. But I think Ashley Gentle would have got confidence from that. I think that pass, Ashley Gentle saw that Annie Haug still hadn't even got to the climb yet. And Ashley had done the entire climb, climbed it, descended it, and was back on the flat. I think that pass, confidence for Ash Gentle, and Annie Haag would have known, hey, I'm still quite a way back here. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is a big time gap with seven and a half, eight kilometres left to run it. Yeah, it absolutely would have been a boost to Ash Gentle's confidence. She just looks like she's in total control. Another move we are seeing as we look up at the graphic on the left-hand side of the screen here is that Chelsea Sodaro is the mover of everyone else, the, all the other contenders. She's up to fifth now. Remember we talked on the bike that it was a big gap between the top five on the bike and anyone else, and Chelsea Sodaro wasn't in that, but she has now moved herself up into the top five and is running fast enough that she can catch Imogen Simmons if it stays exactly as it is. Well, Chelsea has amazing run pedigree, being an ex-collegiate runner. But there's still some 
still some separation there. Imogen Simmons, two minutes 40 to the good of Chelsea at the, at the moment. I can't say enough how good Ashley looks. She just looks comfortable, like she's out on a training run. So we're about to get some sector times for you as we watch Ashley Gentle running back on her second lap here of the 18 kilometer course. Annie Haug chasing after her. We actually just saw Annie Haug and Chelsea cross in almost identical position to where Ashley Gentle and Anne crossed. Yeah, so the gap from Ashley Gentle to Anne Haug, three minutes, and then Anne Haug to Chelsea Zadaro, six minutes. So that is interesting. As we look here, Ashley Gentle, purple, fastest sector in sector one, 6.04. No surprise to any of us here that that fastest sector belongs to Ashley Gentle as we look at her still looking as good as ever. And again, fastest sector in sector two, too. Like I said on the bike, Crowey, I think Ashley Gentle was a little bit offended that people thought she needed a gap to Annie Haug to win this race. And, and she was sort of speaking behind the scenes that I believe I can beat her head to head in the run if it comes down to it. Now, maybe she hadn't said that publicly, but I know she was thinking that and faster sector in sector three as well. So she's proving that. Yeah, well, the great athletes believe in themselves. They believe that they can win the race however they need to. And I will say it is, it's a completely different dynamic when you're well out in front, everything's going your way. Um, you know, Anne had to, to deal with that mechanical on the bike, which would have put her back on her heels a little bit, as we see Ashley Gentle being mindful of littering, drops her gel wrapper right into the uh, two points, as you as you say, Jack. She <laughs> she took the two. Yeah, um, it wasn't quite far enough to be three, was it? Just give her the two. And, uh, yeah, she still, she just looks, the word I keep coming back to is comfortable. She looks comfortable. So just getting confirmation, by the way, Crowey, I know it's a long time ago now, but that what we saw got getting caught in Annie Haug's wheel on the bike. It was something that we've got a picture in T2. It was wrapped around her seat post. We think maybe a spare latex tube or some spare tape for her, for the inside of her bike rim. So definitely something that came from her own bike. And so that was very good to see her put it back down in her, in her top as well instead of drop it on the ground because that would have been a penalty. So a great decision by Annie Haug. Yeah, to just talk about the professionalism and the composure under pressure to make the, the smart choice, the right decisions, and a little bit of strain showing on Ash's face there, I think. I mean, whether you're in first or last in these conditions, the end just cannot come quick enough when you're this deep into the run course. So, and still moving beautifully as well. Great leg turnover, which has become her signature on the run. Back through the streets and around the supporters. Ashley Gentle leading the PTO Asian Open as it stands. 6.6 .6 kilometers to the finish line. This is her final race of the season. She's very used to the top spot, but she hasn't tasted it for the PTO in 2023. Could today be the day for Ashley Gentle? Today will definitely be the day. Um, I'm going to call it early. She just looks too good, too comfortable. As you boys give me a bit of side eye in the com box here. Commentators curse, Crowy. No, it's <laughs> Ash is too good. She's in control. She's seen it all before here in these conditions. Um, she's smart enough, experienced enough, and good enough that she can come off the throttle a little bit if she's starting to feel uncomfortable. She just looks amazing, doesn't she, Craig? Like. Yeah, almost unbelievably um, uh, good considering how hard she raced two weeks ago at the US Open. And like we talked about, Annie Haag was the fresh one coming into this race. Chelsea Sadara was the fresh one coming into this race. Lucy Charles Barclay was the fresh one coming into this race. Ashley Gentle was the only one of those who did the US Open two weeks ago. And she's the one who's, who's you know, I don't like to use strong language too much, but she's dominating this race. And she's got a big gig tomorrow as well. I don't know if you know, but she's going to be in commentary for the men's race. So uh, it, it just keeps on coming for Ashley Gentle. Excited to see what she brings to the broadcast tomorrow. That would be great to have her 
in the broadcast booth, commentary booth, along with myself, John Gooden. We've got Crowey, we've got Jack in the house as well. It needs a woman's touch in here, yeah, though, I'm afraid to say, gents. Absolutely, it does, and Ash will be amazing at commentary as well. Well, the expertise that she obviously will have of this course specifically will, uh, will help us out. Yeah, it'll be amazing to get her first-hand insights as, as we're watching the men's race tomorrow, having raced today. The sun is coming down over the Marina Bay peeping through the buildings over transition and the finish line. So we see Ash heading out the start of lap three, six kilometers to go. We see she'll do this section on the, the forecourt of the Marina Bay Sands Hotel. Again, she'll get a good opportunity to sight the other women. Coming up to the, uh, the aid station very shortly. She just looks great. Super relaxed, leg turnover, maybe dropped off a little bit, but I don't think there's been too much of a change in her, her biomechanics of her, or her technique at all. Um, We've seen so many athletes come apart on these PTO races in heat like this, but the leading ladies looking strong at the moment. And it is a showdown between Annie Haug and Ashley Gentle. Very familiar with one another. They are rekindling their relationship once again out there on the course. Fantastic rivalry. People might have been wondering all day, what is the white thing on Annie Haug's back? We haven't seen it on Ashley Gentle's back or anyone else's back. That's actually the GP, GPS tracker we used during the bike. Annie Haug didn't have a pocket on the back of her, of her bike suit, so it had to go on the, um, on the outside of her, of her sports bra. So um, that's what that is, if anyone else was wondering. And it's a great innovation. One of the other really innovative things the PTO are doing to give us live metrics in real time. Um, we've seen the, the sectors today on the bike and the run, which have been awesome, and also the heart rate data I, I just think it's, it's really insightful it gives people at home an idea to see just how hard these athletes are working when they're conserving a little bit it's, it's really insightful into the tactics yeah and that little white device is what gives us all of that crowy not only the GPS but it also is what transmits the heart rate and the fastest sector data that's gentle on screen again just showing a little bit of strain on her face as you would expect after three hours and 20 minutes of racing now on the on the race clock and making the the transition into the final lap of the run so Annie Howe runs through transition she will go out onto the course for her third and final lap the banks of the Marina Bay she will go up towards Marina Bay Sands up towards the Botanical Gardens and right to the end where the barrage is up the climb and back down I've got to say what, what things is... are looking strong now but it hasn't been uh, everything hasn't gone to plan for Annie Haug today it always looks this is the story we saw here some issues with the bike she slowed down she had to fix them but she seems to be making up for it on the run fellas but the run could have been a little bit difficult would have been different if she hadn't have had this mechanical issue that she had to sort out i was just going to say that john we saw annie haug and lucy child uh, annie haug and ashley gentle cross each other's paths in the live if this bike incident hadn't, hadn't have happened how different that would have been it robbed us of a, of a showdown, a great showdown that we'd all been anticipating and hoping to see. And, and we will see again, no doubt, on the PTO Tour next year. But would have been great to see today. But I was just going to say, what a superstar Anne Haug is. Just to, to deal with that, get back on task. And looks great in this run, as she always does. 
on the start of lap three, Crowey, the gap between Ashley Gentle and Anna Haug, 10 seconds in terms of how fast they both ran the, the first uh, two laps. So 10 seconds would have been, you know, Ani Haag was down 40 seconds, 50 seconds. She caught up 30 seconds. We might be in one of the greatest battles we've ever seen right now. So interesting again to be in the mind of Ani Haag, knowing that she's running about the same pace as Ashley Gentle here. Is she feeling bitter at all? Is she is she thinking about that instance, instance still? Is she just all process driven and thinking about what she has to do to stay in second or maybe even continue to catch up to Ashley Gentle a little bit? I think she's just in the moment right now, doing the things that she needs to do, trying to keep cool, stay on top of nutrition and hydration. But there'll be a, a moment after the race. No doubt she'll have a debrief with coach Dan Larang. And, um, yeah, it's, it's frustrating for us as fans, but we, we will get the opportunity to see these women go head-to-head -head again. Um, I'm just loving the quality of racing. I mean, these are brutal conditions. We saw Chelsea Sedaro run past a minute ago, and... I was out in Kona last year and, and I saw Chelsea run out in, in brutal conditions and, and look super comfortable. I think it just speaks to how hard these conditions are here in Singapore. Um, and, and these top women are just making it look effortless. They look great. We just saw Ani Haug cross paths with Imogen Simmons there. Funnily enough, if we could get some eyes on it, Imogen Simmons is catching back up to Lucy Charles Barclay and making a push for that podium. The day looked to be done for Imogen Simmons. Her, her, her podium position looked to be done, but it's back. So if things, if you thought things were getting a little bit stale up in front, Ashley Gentle had this in the bag, like Corey said. If you were thinking that and you thought everything was just how we were going to see it, no. This is what these conditions and this course can do. This, this run course, it means that the run isn't over after 10K or after 12K. And with four kilometres to go, still to go, there is still passes to be made late because blow-ups are going to happen. And we may be seeing that with Lucy Charles Barclay in third. Amy Howe came into this one saying the conditions will be more challenging than the course. It is a nice course, but she predicted the heat and humidity would be a really big challenge for the athletes. Wasn't able to predict anything not underestimating anyone on the course either and that kind of just goes to show Imogen Simmons perhaps not someone that was in the narrative coming into this race but is on the podium at the moment she's just made that pass John yeah and Imogen Simmons has just paced herself beautifully all day um, swim bike and run I think we saw her methodically make her way through the field I'm just gonna say this battle's not done yet we have seen Lucy fight back but I'm loving, I'm loving Imogen's work today. I think she's really experienced in these conditions, having resided in Thailand for a long time and trained there quite extensively. She knows her body's capabilities in, in this heat and humidity and was quite content to let Lucy go early in this run, knowing that she may still have a sting in the tail of her run. So um, let's just watch this little gap and, and what happens, how this battle for the final spot on the podium develops here. She's had a real strength of schedule as well, gents. You know, in June, uh, she, she was out at the beginning of July, the beginning of August. So that's a lot of races within a short amount of time. So she's holding that form really nicely. Second in uh, Tallinn, 70.3 at the beginning of the month. That was a great, uh, a great race for her there. And she's looking good again in Singapore. Something that we, we sort of maybe didn't notice but I, I thought I just caught an, a glimpse of is as we were talking about this battle between Imogen Simmons and Lucy Charles Barclay and how it's so hot out on course that it's not over till it's over I thought I caught a glimpse of Ashley Gentle reaching down her top and grabbing some ice and taking it on which when you have the desire to eat ice tells you that it's still extremely hot out on course we see here Annie Haug has just taken the fastest sector of sector three back off Ashley Gentle and has closed the gap by 10 seconds. So Annie Haug is making a late push here, potentially dealing with the heat a little bit better later in this race, Crowey. Potentially Ash Gentle's just eased off a little bit to ensure she doesn't blow up knowing her gap's big enough. I think either of those scenarios could be true. I think maybe we're seeing a little bit of the effort on the bike from Ash Gentle coming back now, um, but she has such a buffer here, and that's, that's a luxury in a race of this magnitude that she can make some decisions about her pacing. And she's not far from the, the final turnaround on the final lap. So she, again, she'll get a 
a really great sighting of where Anne is. And I, I'm absolutely positive she would be expecting Anne to charge late, late into this run, given her pedigree across all the distances, but in particular Ironman, where she's known for really coming on strong. Well, keep in mind, the purple sector, faster sector, it means the fastest sector of the entire run. It doesn't mean each lap. It's not the fastest sector on that lap. It's the fastest sector on that sector of the whole run. So Ani Haag is running faster now than she was at the start of the race, faster now than Ashley Genta was at the start of the run. That says that Ani Haag is still making a move and hasn't given up. And it says that Ani Haag is just in incredible shape. In this sort of heat and humidity, you're making this sort of a push on lap three speaks to the pedigree of Annie Haug as an athlete and as a runner. What about Lucy Charles Barkley's race here, Crowey? She's still in it for third? Oh, absolutely. Um, we've seen Lucy Charles Barkley on many occasions get passed in the run and then make repasses really, really late in the race. So. Certainly she doesn't seem to have the leg turnover that she had a, even a lap ago. So I want to say she's come off the pace. I don't think it's a question of Imogen increasing her pace. I, I, I think Imogen's just held her pace really, really well. I want to say Lucy's come off her pace a little bit. Her, her leg turnover looks a, a little lower than it did a lap ago. Um, starting to roll the shoulders a little bit more, although she always has that a little bit in her run technique. but. Imogen Simmons's leg turnover looks great. She looks like she's making a big push right now for that final podium position. Having a conversation with Reese Charles Barclay before the race about Lucy Charles coming into this race. So he said that he was having to convince Lucy Charles Barclay to just be happy to be here and you've done well to be here. And Lucy, in typical Lucy fashion, said, no, I want to be competitive. So Lucy Charles Barkley in a real battle with herself here, having not quite had the build-up she needs, maybe not quite the training volume and intensity she needs, but in true Lucy Charles Barkley fashion, like she's been saying to her partner Reese all week, she's not just happy to be here. She still wants to compete. She would be absolutely digging in here and hurting herself because when you don't quite have the build you need and you do start to struggle late in the run, it starts to really hurt, Chloe. Absolutely, and I think we are who we are for better or worse. She is a competitor. Um, she won't be having a battle with herself. She'll probably be having a battle with Reese later on in the <laughs> hotel room. <but. laughs> yes, and it'll be Reese saying, you did well, Lucy, you did well, and she'll be, no, that's not good enough. You can literally picture it. As we're getting some more performance metrics up on the screen here, Imogen Simmons, 90% of heart rate max. So she's working hard deep into the run. And I want to say that's the highest heart rate we've seen percentage of max for Lucy Charles Barkley on this run. I want to, from memory, she was in the mid 80s, 82 to 84 earlier. Now she's at 87, which is what we would expect. Because Craig, it's the kind of heat out there. And I think it's the humidity. I don't come from a humid place, whereas you've done as much training in, in humidity as anyone. To me, it feels like once you get hot, you can't not be hot. It's sort of like it doesn't get better. It just gets worse and worse and worse. So does that explain why we're seeing with the percentage of max heart rates that everyone's is getting higher and everyone's is staying higher? Absolutely. I just think it's a slippery slope in these conditions. Once, and we talked about earlier a little bit about, you know, managing yourself well in these conditions, you can make some pacing errors in the cooler climate and it doesn't come back to bite you later. It's Once you're core body temperature goes up here as we see Chelsea Sidaro coming right up on that looks like Lucy Charles Barclay so Chelsea with a storming run through the field here um, and looking just incredible this is sort of the first footage we've had of, of Chelsea she looks as good as anyone on course let's see let's see what happens to these sectors on on lap three because uh, Chelsea looks like she's moving great so in terms of overall run times, Craig, Chelsea Sodaro is running exactly the same as Ashley Gentle and Annie Haug. So she is running the exact same pace and she has been the entire day. She's now about 120 metres behind Lucy Charles Barclay. So that converts to be about 20 to 21 seconds right now. She looks to be maybe even running better than Ashley Gentle and Arne Haug now late in this race. And we might even see her have the fastest run of the day here, which is amazing considering she couldn't even get to the start line for the US Open two weeks ago. The current Ironman world champion, loving racing the best, thrives on the competition, could have raced anywhere, has already qualified for the world championships, chose to race the top fields. And here she is on a blistering run. John. 
I think one of the narratives that's sort of been building the momentum throughout the year is that people have been doubting Chelsea Sadaru. There's been a lot of talk behind the scenes of, is she going to race? What kind of form she's in? What's going on behind the scenes? Why isn't she getting to these races? Chelsea Sadaru is proving everyone, every hater that she's had this year, that she's still here. She's the Ironman world champion. She's now going to move up into the top four in a PTO race, maybe fifth, fourth. Chelsea Sadaru has proven everyone wrong here. Interesting tactics here. We see Lucy taking the bend wide. I mean, I think you want to be, and I guess this is the track running pedigree of Chelsea Sedaro. She knows to take the tight line, the inside line on in, in every curve. Every metre, every second counts at this level of racing. So just seeing a little bit of a mistake, I want to say, from Lucy. Chelsea just ride on it mentally, still deep into this race. Craig, does that speak of the different mentality between being someone who is running as fast as anyone on course and who is hunting versus someone who's really struggling and is falling back and, and, and maybe hurting a little bit in the run, that you're not making the same cognitive decisions as each other? Absolutely, I think it does. I think it just shows that Chelsea is still got the pedal to the metal. She's, she's wanting to get every athlete in front that she can must be a, a big relief to be putting down a performance like this as you mentioned there's been a little bit of inconsistency for her this year and it's it's hard when you win a major title um, with so many more demands on your time and, and also she's got a young family and, and that's not an excuse Chelsea does not need me to make excuses for her but it's it's a challenge and it's great to see her performing well but I think it does speak to her mindset deep in this run as you alluded to she is still on the hunt such an amazing part of the course. So this is the climb again. We're seeing Annie Hag on the plateau of that climb. That's the first time we've got a shot of just how picturesque this part of the course is. You literally, from the top of there, you, as you run around the 180 degree bend, you get a full 360 degree view of the entire city of Singapore. And it seriously is one of the most spectacular sort of monuments or places that you run that I've ever seen on any race course ever. It's one of the world's great skylines. And, and we ran out there yesterday morning over this Marina Barrage, not nearly as quickly as these women are, but the, looking back at the Singapore skyline at Marina Bay, it's just, it's breathtaking. And we are excited to, of, of course, confirm that we are coming back here early next year, so we will be seeing this course again, which I'm personally stoked about, Crowe and John. Well, I think the proof's in the pudding, gents, right? It's well supported. It seems to work really well for the athletes it seems to be very challenging we will find out exactly how challenging it is uh, when we start getting the interviews over the finish line so we're seeing ashley gentle here come up on al's visa who was the last positioned athlete on the course that does speak about just how good a day ashley gentle is having al's visa she's She's a very complete triathlete who's had some great results of her own. She's a 70.3 champion, challenge champion, but she also has one of the most interesting stories in triathlon. She's gone through adversity, Craig, which maybe you could tell us a bit about. She's a doctor, so she's, a, she's an intellect and a high achiever in all aspects of her life. John, do you know much about the backstory of Al's Visa? Not a great deal. I think uh, if you give me a second, I can tap into uh, my notes, but I know that it was... Did she not write a book about... The, uh, the sh was it the shipwreck? Was she going out on a diving expedition and then she got stranded? And it was a long time in the water and she literally had to, and this is before she had any interest in triathlon or athletics. Yeah. And there is Chelsea Sodaro. Sorry, Jack, as you took your eyes off the screen for a second. Chelsea Sodaro is stretching out up the hill. She's taken Imogen Simmons. And she's on that little climb. But yes, it, it's definitely worth people doing some research into Elsvis's story. Yeah, well, I wanted to tell you about it because a lot of people don't know about it. So she got caught in a shipwreck in Indonesia and she had to swim for eight hours in the ocean to get back to land to safety. Now, put yourself in the mind no, of you. someone like that. <laughs> it's she, mental. She it's was stuck out in the middle of the terrifying. ocean on a ship in a foreign country and swam eight hours to cling on to survival and I mean this is probably a poor analogy but she's doing a sort of similar thing to here today clinging on to survival in a race sense but as tough as as they come as mentally hard as they come as are all of the women in this race today you've got to you've got to keep in mind just how good these women are as athletes just how mentally tough they are just how tough this course is 
And honestly, I think they're all making it look easy because the conditions are brutal, the course is brutal, the competition is brutal. I'm, I'm absolutely loving the competitor in Chelsea. We saw her take a couple of visual checks. She's still charging through this run. She's trying to get visuals on, on where the competitors are around her. She's, she's not easing off the throttle, not even for a minute. She says she sees herself as an underdog and a bit scrappy, and she's certainly getting ready to kind of, uh, like, probably roll the sleeves up and, and get down to a real battle here as she closes out her race. Above all, she wanted to be really proud of her executing a, a really good race, and, I mean, she's, she's done that, looking very strong as she brings it home. And we see Ash Gentle here coming right around the forecourt of the Marina Bay Sands for the last time. She's coming up to the finish. She'll head down this waterfront and then take a left turn up to the finish line very shortly as she comes around the lily pond. Still looking good. She still looks good. She still looks in control. I think the lapped courses, the athletes really love them because you don't have to rely on getting information out on course. You can get your own visual checks and it's always comforting as an athlete just to get that. And just a, just a reminder on Chelsea's story of 2023, a lot of disappointment, gents. It's just she's had a couple of uh, DNFs at the PTO in Ibiza, at Roth as well. So, but, but she talks about her strength of character and she's had that kind of up and down career, but she's always there to the bitter end and she's never far away from an outstanding performance. Yeah, I mean, she's the Ironman world champion reigning yeah. at present. Um, and she's been in sport for a long time. And when you're in sport, it's one of the great lessons. It teaches you to deal with adversity. It teaches you to be resilient. You, as a professional athlete, by definition, you lose more than you win. So these women are as mentally as tough as any other athletes from any other sports. And it's great to see Chelsea getting a performance that she can be proud of, although she should be proud of all her performances. Funnily, we were talking about the three big favourites before the races, Ashley Gentle, Annie Haag and Lucy Charles Barclay. But Chelsea Sodaro has shown that we should no longer sort of question her like we have been all year, and she now must go back into that conversation. She's running in third right now. She doesn't look like being caught by anyone. Just an amazing way to prove everyone wrong. Having a look here at Ashley Gentle running through a really crowded part of the course, giving a smile, giving a fist pump. That's ah, great. Yeah. She, okay. She's wanted this win all year with two seconds, John, so. Fantastic. Uh, just for those uh, that are listening, uh, Crowey has departed. The commentary booth is going to go down to the finish line, get involved with the presentation team down there. Uh, so great job, Crowey, as we look to bring this race home. All smiles from Ashley Gentle as she's counting down the steps, as she gets down the blue chute, she takes the high fives off of the crowd here in Singapore. Ashley Gentle is back on top. She wins the PTO Tour Singapore. What a fantastic performance by Ashley Gentle to close out her 2023 campaign. That's Josh Amberger, her husband there, John. So just a such a special moment as she falls to the ground two seconds this year this is the win she's been chasing she dedicated her, her her calendar year this year to the three pto races and what resilience to finally win one as the last one of the year she can go home so content and so happy that's great stuff the queen of the 100 kilometer distance so consistent so deadly out there on the race course as well coming home in first place. It has eluded her no more in 2023, and she will watch her fellow competitors come over the line here in Singapore. Brutal conditions, but she gets the job done. All smiles now. And Chelsea Sodaro has just clocked the fastest second sector jack. Chelsea Sodaro, faster sector two here on the run. It's also looking like if she maintains this pace, she will actually have the fastest run split of anyone for the day, including Ashley Gentle and Annie Haag. So it is important for Chelsea, both as, a, as an athlete in her, in her own right, for her confidence going into her races later in this year, but also so that the world can be sort of 
she, she's trying to prove to people the kind of athlete she still is. So very important for her to keep pushing. And Annie Haug, keep in mind that time matters for PTO rankings. So she won't let up until the finish line. That's why we're seeing her run so fast. PTO rankings matter and getting every second out of yourself matters. What a race by Annie Haug. Such disappointment for her on the bike with that mechanical issue. But that mental fortitude that she has shown today to get right back to work. Well, it's fantastic, and she runs it home now. Annie Howe will take the second spot on the podium here in Singapore, right over the line with a big smile on her face. Brilliant, excellent work by Annie Howe. She gave a little shrug of the shoulders there, John, which to me, I interpreted that as what could have been. She only finished two minutes and 15 seconds down on Ashley Gentle, so what could have been if that bike incident didn't happen? And a, a great run from Annie Haag. She ran 107.02 there. Ashley Gentle ran 107.26, so Annie Haag actually ended up running 20 seconds faster than Ashley Gentle. Now, sure, Ashley Gentle may have sort of eased off knowing she had the win, but a uh, story of what could have been there for Annie Haag today. And, potentially a battle we we all were deprived on because of that that one mechanical issue on to Chelsea Sadara here John and she just looks amazing to me the best she's looked all year in my opinion and it's great to see her back yeah she started the year she took second place in Oceanside and then lots of disappointments and she wasn't able to join us in Milwaukee but she certainly made the start line here in Singapore of course and she has powered her way through the pack and she will soon be making a few left turns to then bring it home down the blue carpet and it's been a, a standout performance here for Chelsea Sadara. People forget though, people forget. So Chelsea Sadara won the Ironman World Championship. She came second in Ocean's Hut. She actually was having the race of her season at Challenge Roth as well. It was only in the last 10 kilometers her, her race fell apart. She was actually looking like she was gonna come second there with 30 being 30K into a 40K marathon. So. Chelsea Sedaro's season hasn't quite been all doom and gloom like people think, and her form has been there. It's just, it just hasn't quite been able to show itself because of a few unfortunate things. Some unfortunate injury before um, Ibiza earlier in the year, and then E. coli um, at Challenge Rock, which led to some gut soreness and some yeah. sickness. So things had gone a little bit differently for Chelsea this year. It could have been different, but she has finally turned it around and proven, pr proved to everyone here today that, hey, don't forget about me. I'm still one of the best in the world. 100%. She was third at the PTO Canada in 2022. She is the current Ironman world champion, and she will get back that spot on the podium here, the PTO Singapore in 2023. She always rises to the challenge. She loves racing the big field. She's gone up against the very best today and she will run across the line in third place. Congratulations, Chelsea Sodaro. She probably proved a lot to herself today, John. Look at Yo that. Y'all must have forgot, right? Tears straight away to me, which shows pressure. It shows relief. I think, I think she needed a performance like this for herself to, to sort of proved to herself that she was still who she was, the Ironman world champion, one of the best in the world. I, I sensed relief there when she crossed the line. I kind of leaning into her words, she talks about how her career is very up and down and lots more downs than there are ups. And, and Crowley was talking about it as well. You lose more races than you win. But when you have that title of current Ironman world champion, there's a lot of eyeballs, a lot of people passing judgment as well. But she gets it, she gets it done today to come away with third. And I think we have another one crossing the line as well. And what a performance by Imogen Simmons. For me, the performance of her career, John, not just a, a great performance. I think that's the best performance of Imogen Simmons' career. She was 23rd at the PTO US Open last year. And she comes across in fourth position here in Singapore. A lot of connection to the Asia region for Imogen Simmons, who grew up in Hong Kong. Trains out in Thailand as well. So this will be a, a sweet result for her when she goes back to Switzerland. 
So Chelsea Sadaro did get the fastest run split of the day, John, at 106.49. That's 13 seconds quicker than Annie Haug and 37 seconds quicker than Ashley Gentle. As we see Lucy Charles Barclay here, thank the crowd. She's, she looks like she's hurt, hurting to me, John. It looks like she went extremely deep today. The zip's still down on the suit, which to me shows just how hard it was for her. Top five, though, Jack, for Lucy Charles Barkley. Injuries again over the last couple of years. And just when she's finding fitness, has some setbacks. But she attacked it today. She gave it everything that she had by the looks of things. Be interesting to hear from her a little bit later for her post-race analysis. I love the mindset of Lucy Charles Barclay. She's, like I've said, she's one of the toughest athletes you'll ever meet and just relentlessly hard on herself and a, and a massive work ethic. So, I mean, she'll be disappointed in that result today, but everyone else can see that that was a, a truly sort of inspiring performance considering how little training she's been able to do in the lead up. Yeah, and her team's saying that she should be happy just to get to the start line. So to finish top five, there's obviously PTO points. There's decent money as well, of course, all the way through. So it's a, a good day out for Lucy Charles Barkley. A lot, and a lot of, lot of knowledge as well, Jack. As we go into 2024 and revisiting some of these places, if we're back here, then it's it's money in the bank in terms of your experience. Exactly right, John. Also, not the last race of Lucy Charles Barkley season, so probably gives her a little confidence booster going into those races, and and just a sort of. A you know, sometimes you need that first race under your belt. Amelia Watkinson, as we can see here, crossing the line in fifth position. Again, someone who deals extremely well in the heat. The hotter, the better for Amelia Watkinson. Such a consistent athlete as she always has been. And top five in a PTO race. I assume not many people had her, had her there at the start of the day. So to run through the field like that, yeah, that's a, that's a great result. John, we have also had confirmation that Ashley Gentle will retain her PTO number one ranking based off to on today. So at the end of this week, as, as all other results come in from around the world, Ashley Gentle will sit atop the PTO rankings. Congratulations to her. It's been a, a fantastic season. And she got what she wanted, Jack, right? She was yearning for that, that number one spot on the podium. I mean, coming, I mean, it's just an outstanding achievement to get on a podium in one of these PTO races. And to be so consistent is just quite brilliant. But she gets the win here. Sorry, John, I also did say I think Amelia Watkinson finished fifth there. Of course, she finished sixth. Sixth, Lucy Charles Barclay finished fifth. Uh, misspoke there, but still a career performance all the same. Yeah, Ashley Gentle, John, hasn't her PTO record just been amazing? Two wins last year, two seconds this year, a win this year. Just such a consistent athlete. No one else in PTO history has any record anywhere near that. Not, not Christian Blumenfeld, not Jan Frodeno, not Gustav Eden, not Annie Haug. Just on another level in terms of consistency across PTO races. A little Britishism for you. We call that good darts. I mean, she's hitting the same spot every time and they are spots on the podium. Second place, but nothing sweeter than the top spot. First place, the spot for the queen. And like, we do talk about it quite a lot, but how can you not? That's another $100,000 in her back pocket. You know, her season's done now. What a better way to end it. That's a, that's a great holiday for her and Josh. They always take a big end of season holiday and imagine how sweet that holiday would be after that performance. And her total prize earnings from the PTO now has jumped over half a million US, which is uh, which is outstanding. And, and you, you obviously know more about what that means in, in the landscape of triathlon over the last few decades yeah it's honestly just hard to wrap your head around and keep in mind 500,000 US dollars to an Australian is it's actually pretty close to a million dollars it's about 800 800,000 750,000 something like that so I mean I, I can't wrap my head around that how life-changing that is for an athlete like Ashley Gentle 10 years ago she didn't have that opportunity John so oh I just love where the sport's going right now and yeah like and it's so going to secure a, a lot of investment for Ashley Gentle in her own career. Because as we know, she, she, she goes on tour. She packs up her bags from Australia. She heads to Europe for one part of the season. Of course, it will be determined by the calendar that we will probably be seeing, I think, in October. I, I believe we're going to start hearing some news about the, the schedule for the PTO. 
But everything that's been working for us so far has meant a camp in Andorra, I believe it is, and then going out uh, stateside to Boulder. Yep. And she will tackle whatever races she feels appropriate, but that kind of money allows her to do so. Exactly right, John. So two altitude camps that she couldn't have done five years ago. She spent a lot of time overseas. She dedicated to these races. I don't know if I'm jumping the gun here, but I've, I'm highly confident Ashley Gentle is dedicating her season next year to the PTO races as well. And this money, all the money she's made from her two seconds this year and her first, her first now to top it off, make no mistake, an athlete of that caliber, she reinvests almost all of that back into making sure she can do it again next year. And and elevate her performance to the next level and make sure she stays ahead of Annie Haug and make sure she closes that gap to Taylor Nib. She wants to be the best athlete in the world. She, she'd be so stoked with this, but yeah, her eyes next year will be on, okay, how do I beat Taylor Nib every time I race her? How do I beat Annie Haug every time I race her? And, and the money trickles down as well, Jack, $10,000 to uh, Amelia Watkinson as well. But right now we have all of our ladies in position for the ceremony, so we hand it over for the ceremonial gifts and the presentation for the PTO Asian Open. PTO Asian Open. Presenting medals today will be Ms. Ong Ling Lee, Singapore Tourism Board Executive Director of Sports and Wellness. Presenting gifts and flowers today will be Mr. Con Ying Tong, Sports Singapore Chairperson. And also Chris Kerbert, Executive Chairman, PTO. In third place, and the winner of the bronze medal, representing USA, Chelsea Sudaro. PTO Asian Open representing Australia Ashley Gentle
Well, great visuals there of the podium. Great support as well. Of course, deserve it. And here is the leaderboard and the results for the PTO Asian Open. Ashley Gentle in first. Annie Haug in second. Chelsea Sodaro in third. A great race from Imogen Simmons. Lucy Charles Barkley in fifth. Amelia Watkinson sixth. Sarah Perez Sala came in seventh. We had Carl Feltz in eighth. Sarah True came in ninth. And Jocelyn McCauley rounds out the 10 top finishers here in Singapore. Congratulations to all of those. Last word from you, Jack, in commentary. This course is amazing, John. Look at those splits. There's a big difference between first and 10th. It was chaos out there. The bike course was one of the best bike courses I've ever seen. The run was hot. There was late catches. Chelsea Sadara running up to third at the very last minute. Just one of those crazy races that the course and conditions, it was all a perfect storm to create one of the best races I've ever watched. Great stuff. We're going to send it down towards the finish line. Alex is with Craig Alexander. Indeed, John. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, we've been speaking a lot today about what a stunning setting Singapore is for a sporting event. We've obviously got the sevens here every year. We've also got the F1, but I think it's fair to say we can now add the PTO and triathlon to a very happy new home. You wandered over a little bit earlier on and in a beautifully understated way just said, that felt pretty good today. Give us a reflection as you've had a moment to, to think about it. I think it was a race befitting of the huge world-class events that Singapore hosts. We had some drama, we had mechanicals, we had incredible performances by world-class athletes and it's just, I think, wet all of our appetites a little more for more of this style of racing next year. Yeah, We wondered a lot about how the race was going to pan out and obviously we spoke about Mystery Pro and we spoke about the strengths and weaknesses of the, of the relative athletes, but did you foresee Ashley Gentle taking control of it in quite the way that she did? Look, I don't want to take credit for that. I, I thought Ashley was one of the big favourites she's very vocal about how she prepares exclusively for these types of races over this ultimate 100k distance we've seen how consistent she's been i'm not as surprised to see her on the top step of the podium but the way the race played out was certainly a little surprising yeah in terms of learning then we're actually gonna get ashley gentleman we're gonna get anna how again in fact i think if i'm right in saying if i could just ask you to stand aside craig that'd be great we'll bring annie in first of all uh, ashley will join us in just a moment or two you've got trinkets and flowers and you've got yeah a silver medal, and I'm going to come to you first of all. As you ran down the finish line, it was, it was a bit of a shrug, and I guess that tells the story of a day in which things didn't quite go your way. Are you a frustrated person who wants to kick the bike, or have you just got to sort of shrug and say, do you know what, these things happen? Yeah, I mean, it's high-performance sports. Things happen, and you have to deal with it and make the battle out of it, and I think Ashley was unbeatable today, so I made the best out of the day, and yeah, it's what I always do. You're here and try your best you can, and things you can't influence you have to deal with it was building towards the finale that i think we've been talking about all week but when you found the tape on the bike i mean just take us through what you were thinking how you were frustrated you were getting and i suppose the the process that you had to, to go through to get yourself back in the race yeah first i didn't know what happened i thought my uh, tire popped and then i first had to figure out what the problem is i just saw my spare tire all over the place and um, yeah then i had to unwind everything and yeah, it was a bit like confusing, but yeah. you first of the chalk, then then yeah, you need to go back and finish the race. Yeah. Well, you showed great professionalism and composure. What actually was that? Was it rim tape that got tangled in amongst the disc brake and and your cassette? No, it was my spare tire. I had it. It on was the, a spare tire. It was my complete ah. spare tire, which ripped around. Yeah. How unbelievably frustrating. How proud are you, though, of the way that you did get yourself back into, into the race? You got yourself into second. I mean, it, it must have taken a heck of an effort to refocus, calm yourself down, and, and find your yeah, rhythm again. I, mean, that's, I think it's experience. I've yeah. been triathlon for 20 years now, and yet you always aim for the perfect race, and it will never happen. So um, the only thing I can do is get out, give it my best, and everything I, I don't have in my hands, deal with it, and keep going. I mean, that's yeah. what we do. Let's bring in the winner, Queen Bee, back on top step. Business as usual, how good did that feel? Yeah, it felt pretty amazing. Um, yeah, I kind of can't believe it. It was a pretty uh, great day for me. So yeah, I'm, I'm proud of my effort. I kept writing down what you were saying in commentary because the, the words comfortable and dominant and totally in control, you sort of, quite rightly, it just kept coming through. But is that how it felt out there today? Did you feel this is where I need to be at all times? 
Yeah, I guess it was one of those days where I did feel quite good. Um, the first half of the bike, I actually felt really comfortable, but I was kind of chipping away at that lead. So yeah, I kind of got to, to Lucy and Sarah and I, I just attacked and at some point I'm like, what am I, do what am I doing? But um, you know, I think it was, I just had to go full gas and um, try and just get as much time as I could because I knew that someone like Annie is coming from behind and she's such a phenomenal athlete and um, you know, really sad to see her with the mechanical today. Um, super unfortunate for her, but you know, I, I, I just tried to, to give it my all and yeah, I'm, I'm super proud of my effort. Good on you. Yeah, I've got a question. I mean, the race played out as a fan, it was it was great to watch. I think the tactics on the bike, was that something that was pre-planned or, I mean, you seem to be more proactive today and just made a, a decision to, rather than wait for moves, make some moves. Was that a pre-planned thing or were you just playing what you saw as it played out? Uh, it definitely wasn't planned. I think no one really knew how hard this bike course was until about 6 p.m. last night when we were able to do, um, you know, a bus tour of it because we were on like major highways, so it's not rideable. So um, we actually all found out the, the bike course basically last night and the ins and outs of it. So um, yeah, I guess that it, it, it quite suited me. Like I, I felt really strong with the bike and I've been really um, trying to, to make those improvements so I'm a more complete athlete across swim, bike and run and I think that really showed today so I'm, I'm really proud of that. Well I think you've always been a complete athlete. Uh, it looked like, notwithstanding the pain, it looked like a fun course, a lot of climbing, some technical sections, of course you both have a, a short course background and it showed out with the technical skills but I do have another question after seeing your interview after Milwaukee two weeks ago and how emotional you were when you saw Paula Finley with her mum. You must be excited to be heading home after a long overseas stint. Yeah, definitely. It definitely fueled the fire today. Um, you know, I really committed to being overseas for about four and a half months now. Um, I put my head down, I focused. It was just all about swim, bike and run. And sometimes I think that's just what you need to do to get the best out of yourself. And um, when I go overseas, I make sure that I do go all in and try and do all the things right. But of course, um, there's my life in Australia that I kind of miss out on too, but it makes, it, it brings me motivation to know that I'm going home to that and then I can um, be a bit more of a normal, <laughs> normal person once I get home and yeah, celebrate with my family and friends who support me so much from Australia. You've got a lot of celebrating. You've also got one more big job tomorrow because you're in the commentary box with us. So you need an early night, not early. too much celebrating. <laughs> One last point, very quick question. This is turning into quite a rivalry. Back on the start line next year? Definitely. Back, I, I mean, it's a stupid question, back on the start line next year? Oh, yeah. We are absolutely loving watching this unfold. Commiserations today, many congratulations, Ashley. Amazing run as well from Chelsea Sodaro, who's standing by, ready to talk to Rachel. Let's hear from her. Yeah, Chelsea, congratulations, third place there. We were chatting beforehand. You were very cagey about your form. It proved you're in shape, right, after that run? To be totally honest with you, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, I got quite sick uh, during my last race about two months ago, and it took me a while to figure things out. So I've had three or four really solid weeks of training, and I was optimistic. But you never really know until you're out there. And obviously, we saw these women are just unbelievable athletes. So you have to bring your A game every time. How does it feel as well to go past the likes of Lucy Charles Barkley and the Imo Simmons, who are having great races out there? You know, I've had um, quite an up and down season and I've started to get legacy questions, um, people telling me things like, well, you'll always have that Kona win. And I think that this confirms that I'm very much still here, still in my prime and I'm really getting after it. So I'm happy to have a really positive race experience as we head into the championship season. Never in doubt. Finally, the love heart crossing the finish line. Who is that for? Uh, I think I've had to reinvent myself a little bit this season um, kind of recommit to being excellent and so I came out here almost a week early to make sure I knew the course I was acclimated and so that was for my daughter Sky at home um, she's starting to understand what I do she's two now so she'll be really happy that I'm bringing her some hardware very proud Sky will be at home well done mom we'll say hi as well to Sky and back to Alex and you guys thanks Chelsea well done thank you so much
good news is that we're going to do it all over again tomorrow. It's the same time and the same place for wherever you've been watching today's coverage. And we've got the big guns out in the men's race of the PTO Asian Open. Uh, and that is coming up tomorrow. We'll have a word on that in just a moment. But just to, I suppose, wrap up today, and it's lovely to hear from Ashley, and the big smile is back after the emotions of Milwaukee, as you were saying. But they came to challenge her number one status, Annie Haug in particular, and she has answered those questions. I mean, imperious today. Incredible performance by Ashley. Also, Anne as well. Um, I think she handled her mechanical like a, a true professional. But yeah, Ashley was just across the board. She was imperious. I love this venue. I love the race. I think it was every bit as good as build. I'm loving the, the rivalry that's developing by a lot of the top women in our sport. And very, very happy to see Chelsea Sodaro back on the podium. And a quick word on the men for tomorrow as well, because obviously we're going to pop a coin in. We're going to go again. We're going to ride the roller coaster once more. What are you anticipating? Can't wait. More fireworks. I mean, it's inevitable when you get the best athletes in the world, throw in the heat, humidity, a technical, hard course. Um, I'm expecting fireworks. I'm expecting the big names to do what they do, but I think there could be a, a sting in the tail and a few surprises, as we often see with these conditions. Yeah, we are coming to expect the unexpected here on the PTO. Today, though, it's, well, ifs, buts, and maybes for Anne Haug. It is Ashley Gentle who reigns supreme. She is the PTO world number one. She gets to celebrate, and I can tell you, the party is kicking off here in Singapore. See you tomorrow. Yeah.